Our season begins in the midst of a skirmish on the planet of Gamor. It was a wide open gateway to Camino, one where the lines of the Separatists had vanished from. The Republic had to set up their game as of late. The Separatist battle droids were in great quantity, but the tactical droids were trying to play catch up with the strategy used by the Sith. There were records showing their strategic plays, but it had changed greatly to pander towards victory against the Sith rather than the Republic. Gamor was a wide open territory, and if the Republic didn't plant itself here, they'd be left open for a strike at the heart of their military, Camino. It's not like simply having a listening post on Rishi would save them, they needed to have a fleet ready for anything that came their way. On the surface of Gamor, there were Republic forces standing their ground for the very first time, and leading the charge were Generals Mace Windu and Captain Rex. They weren't really any troops assigned to any generals, it was whoever was around would just go and fight with them. Rex had served with a couple of other Jedi before, but not in long term battles, rather just skirmishes. The battle hadn't really heated up yet, but it was about to. Mace and Rex were on the front lines, cutting down and blasting through legions of Sith troopers. Through the field of chaos and dying men, a shuttle landed. Smoke covered the air until a line of Sith acolytes fled from the vessel and charged the battlefield. Windu saw this and he immediately rounded up the troops to remove them from the front lines. He wanted to get them to a line of trenches so they could defend themselves. It was a hard executed plan, but it worked perfectly. The clones swiftly retreated and ducked into the trench line and opened fire. Windu, on the other hand, didn't retreat. The force of acolytes closed in, preparing for their encounter with the Jedi Master. They didn't realize that this wasn't just any Jedi Master, rather the Grand Master of the Jedi Order, one of the best surviving duelists in the Order. Windu sped forward and slid his lightsaber at the acolytes. They were quick to fight back. The standoff was intense, but Windu wasn't playing nice. He was the leader and the general, and he had the beat his best, because he had his men relying on him. If he faltered even a little bit, he could cost his entire defense of Gamor, which would open Kamino up for an attack, which he could not allow. As the Sith troopers sped around the duelists, the clones got their work. The five duelists were like a rock in the middle of a rapid river. They were handling with each other while a massive battle ensued around them. The clones had a number of AV-7 anti-vehicle cannons at the ready, and they began to open fire, which targeted the back of the Sith lines, which was perfect, because the support vessels were ripped apart. Some of them were troop transports, while the others were heavy walkers. The clones under Captain Rex were actively trying to assist Master Windu, but it was becoming increasingly difficult for them to do. The numbers of Sith troopers outnumbered them, and while the clones could be arguably better troopers, they were still outnumbered against other human troopers. Rex then saw another shuttle land behind the lines. He assumed it was another Sith Lord, but he couldn't be certain. With most of the troop transports and support vehicles out of commission, seemingly, he ordered the heavy cannons to fire on that ship's position. Above them, a wing of Sith bombers were derailed by a squadron of V-19s. The space battle was going well too. Captain Rex was informed by Admiral Yularen that they were making a push against the Sith forces, and they'd likely be able to send some reinforcements to the ground to assist them. Rex thanked the Admiral. In the middle of the battlefield, Mace Windu cut down the first two acolytes. He moved like a whirlwind of power and precision. He could see that most of the Sith forces had become stagnant in their assault. He was able to calm down in regards to the lives of his men. The battle was still at a rage, but the clones had a severe advantage, and a large part of that was due to Windu's orders to get them to the trenches. The clones didn't move from their position, still laying down covering fire to reduce the number of Sith troopers on the front lines. One of the men in his division called out to Rex and told him that there were more troops coming, but they weren't firing. They were walking in a straight line, and in front of them was a hooded man. He walked with purpose and seemingly with power. Windu had no notice of this as he was still working on the Acolytes. It's not that they were by any means a match for him, but he was ensuring that he was able to keep them away from the clones while they did their job, and also defeat them of course. Windu quickly pulled his blade across one of their chests and spun the weapon around in his hand and thrusted it behind him into the last Acolyte. He turned over and blocked a few stray shots from Sith troopers before seeing the empty battlefield around him. Windu turned his head and he saw the Sith and his army moving behind him. His weapon was raised to his face and he looked at the approaching enemies. He spun the weapon in his hand only to see the Sith Lord lower his hood and with the drop of his hood onto his shoulders all the men ran forward past him. They slept backwards into the trenches behind him. The moment Rex saw him move, he told the cannons to open fire, and they did. The Sith troopers were cannon fodder, and they were blasted away, bodies strewn through the air, never given a chance to survive. Windu looked up from the trenches as he stood next to Rex, who pointed out that the Sith Lord was still standing. That is, until one of the blasts from the heavy cannons was redirected, speeding past the number of Sith troopers and diving into the trench, blasting dozens of clones from the position, most of them being killed in the blast. Windu ordered the cannons to stop firing, but before they could, another couple blasts littered the trenches, sending clones to different directions. The clones were still in a fire fight, and Windu could see through the smoke the Sith Lord still standing there silently, not moving his body. 
Windu told Rex and the men to cover him. He grabbed the hold of the couple rocks inside of the wall of the trench and launched himself upwards into the air. He disappeared into the skies before landing down in front of the Sith Lord, creating a crater in the ground. Windu pointed his blade forward and told the Sith Lord that it ended here. He was going to kill him and make short work of his remaining forces. A sinister grin grew from the Sith's face, as he told Windu that that didn't sound very Jedi-like. Windu didn't budge. His mission was to protect the people of the galaxy, not play a game of who had the sickest burn with the Sith Lord. The Sith Exar Kun dropped his hands and a double-bladed lightsaber ignited. He grinned and lunged forward, and Mace Windu got into an intense standoff. This man, he was a vile creature, one who once stood as a Jedi but very quickly became known as a Sith. His anger and ferocity drove Mace back. Windu immediately could tell the difference between this Sith Lord and the acolytes he was fighting with earlier. Windu quickly moved into a defensive variation of his form and began to draw as much as he could from Exar so that he could be able to defend himself from the Sith Lord. The duel lit up the battlefield and it caught the attention of those around them. But with the Sith troopers in their retreat and their fleet falling apart, it looked as if Exar's plan had failed and he would have to retreat. He prided himself way too much on his strength, as a Sith and as a warrior. He couldn't just let that slip away from him. He had to do something bold to try and claim victory over this planet. First, he'd have to kill this Jedi Master in front of him. That obviously was not getting him anywhere. Windu was persistent and he showed no signs of slowing down his attack. Exar was caught off guard. Rarely was a Jedi so effective in the realm of combat. Exar flipped his blades around and used the force to throw Windu back. It didn't do much, but Windu's boots slid across the ground. Behind him, Exar could see the clones rising to defend their general. He brought his weapon back and flipped it forward, trying to cut through the clones who were rising. But it was deflected back by Windu, who threw his blade to block the strike. This was a poor choice. It left Maze entirely vulnerable, and he was blasted across the upper chest, right below his shoulder, and fell back. Exar pulled the lightsaber with the force and prepared for a strike but a grouping of landing vessels pulled in front of him. The Sith fleet had been defeated. If he had any hopes of surviving, they needed to leave now, or they'd be stuck at Gamor. Exar raged, cutting down one of his men before getting inside the vessel and joining his troops on the retreat. May stood up, pulling his lightsaber with the force and placing it gently on his belt. He placed his other hand on his shoulder as Captain Rex came up to him and asked if he was alright. Mace nodded his head, suggesting that the troops fan out to see if there were any survivors. If they were, they could be interrogated. A hologram came in from Admiral Yularen, who told General Windu that the battle was completed. They secured the planet. This was good news, but they had to ensure it stayed secured. Mace took a deep breath. He hadn't actually caught his breath, and now he could. not The Acolytes weren't a problem, it was the Sith Lords. They were incredibly powerful, and they were stronger than most surviving Jedi. Mace knew he couldn't create an outpost on this planet in the hopes that a Jedi Master and a Knight could defend it from a Sith Lord. He told Rex that he wanted to have a meeting in the briefing area, and so they shortly made their way there. When they arrived, Mace told Rex that this war would have its difficulties, and the Republic, or what remained of it, needed to use its resources adequately. Rex was confused. He saw this battle as an absolute win, which it was, and Mace was getting there, but the reality of this war is that it would have to be fought differently. The Jedi couldn't pretend that they could reasonably stand up to the might of these Sith Lords. Ima Gundi couldn't on Python, and while what Anakin did was a feat, he was the chosen one. Not every Jedi had that luxury. Anakin would continue to develop throughout the war, unlike most of his peers, and Windu knew that for a Jedi, it was imperative that they prepare in other ways. Rex was curious as to where he was going with this, as Windu suggested that as a means to protect the clone troopers and the Jedi, it would be more effective to establish space stations rather than outposts on the ground, aside from listening posts. Rex asked what this would do for the Republic and why they should do it. Mace brought up a hollow map and showed Rex what happened on Tython, and then what happened here on Gamor. The deaths of the Jedi on Tython were both accomplished by one force. Vermi and Ima Gundi never stood a chance with a grouping of 600 clones, which in reality isn't a lot. Mace noted that until the Jedi could legitimately stand up against the Sith Lords, then it would be better to prevent needless clone deaths by focusing on Star Tech and preparing military sound naval structures. Rex pulled up some plans from the Stark Hyperspace War, which showed these space stations called Golan Platforms, and he asked General Windu if this is what he was referring to. Windu nodded his head. He hadn't ever seen these before, but it would be a great service to the Republic war effort. If they could build these to fight back against the Sith, then perhaps it would allow them to keep the Sith off the ground and defend their star systems. Though of course the only concern is how the Separatists would handle this, especially under the command of Admiral Trench. Just outside the atmosphere on Gamor, Exar and his troops made it back to the one remaining vessel of their fleet and they departed into hyperspace. Exar was livid. This was supposed to be an easy victory. He came here to show his abilities in the Force and prove that he was worthy enough to become the lead of the Sith Empire. While they had some moderation in their ranks at this point, he was striving for a role of superiority, and if he could claim that, then surely the Sith Empire would thrive. He took his fleet out to Gamor and completely got embarrassed. This also had Exar looking to understand who the Amethyst lightsaber-wielding Jedi was. He was powerful, and he had to hunt him down and execute him. 
Exar moved to the front of the bridge and opened up a number of holograms so that he could curate a plan to fit all of his needs. He was going to make sure the Jedi were destroyed under his hands. On these holograms, he had information collecting. He was silent for several months up until this point, collecting information so he could rise to the ranks and be seen as their leader. He already did have a list on what issues each Sith Lord had, and how they'd be manipulated, their weaknesses, and just about anything else to help him. He was going to get to the Starforge before anyone else did, and he was going to take control of it. The Sith belonged to him, and he didn't care who tried to get in his way. They would die doing so. As he stood on his bridge analyzing everything, a report came back from the Jedi Temple that the Jedi he faced was Master of the Order, Mace Windu. To Exar, as a former Jedi, he knew exactly what this meant. The Sith had been rummaging through the surviving archives of the Jedi Temple ever since they took Coruscant, now he could tell who it was that he was dealing with. Since they had confirmed Yoda's death in the fall of Coruscant, he could assume that Mace Windu likely became the Grand Master of the Jedi Order. The fact that he was on the front lines put an even larger target on his head. If the Sith could kill him, then they could set a rupture to the Jedi Order and likely the remaining Republic forces. Exar had his deckhand send out a collection of messages to the other Sith around the galaxy so that they could be prepared to acknowledge Windu and hunt him down. The objective was to kill him on sight, no matter the casualties it might inflict onto the Sith. Mace Windu had to die. Was it ego? Or was it strategy? On Act 2, the Jedi were becoming more at home than ever before. The Garden Island was finally gathering some sense of home for the Jedi. There was a bit of structure, not much, but enough. The Garden Island was the home of all the younglings and Padawans who lost their teachers. While Anakin hadn't been off the planet since the Battle of Tython, he and Windu shared a much more united bond. It still required a lot of work and a lot more trust to be built for the Foundation, but it was much sturdier than ever before. Skywalker wasn't just regulated to the Garden Island. He was able to spend time on the Temple Island, where all the command was. There typically weren't a lot of high-ranking Jedi present on planet due to the obligations elsewhere in the galaxy. Those who were typically on the Temple Island were either strategists or archivists. While Jack Ostinum was the archivist, the other ones referred to were simply archivists for their own extended knowledge on history and artifacts of the Jedi. The reason all the archivists were here was because they needed to decipher the old maps to find the Starforge, yet that was becoming much more difficult to do, being that the Jedi of the past wanted that monstrous machine to remain a mystery. Despite the fact that there were known ways to discover the Starforge, there were less common ways to find it. The evidence and clues were hidden across the galaxy, meant to be kept away from people looking to destroy everything that the galaxy collectively held near and dear. If anyone found this weapon and learned how to awaken it, it could very easily destroy everything. The Jedi believed that hiding their evidence would be helpful, and in the end, it resulted in them essentially cutting themselves off from the chance to stop the Sith from gaining control over the weapon. The reality is, based off of scout reports, that the Sith fleet was already large enough as it was. If they got possession of the Star Forge, they could construct more military vessels and weapons of mass destruction much larger than the galaxy had ever seen. Skywalker on this gorgeous cloudy day made his way from the Garden Island to the Temple Island as he was looking for Jocasta Noom. He was also looking to hear back from Master Windu's mission. While Anakin had been left to be stuck on Ahch 2, he didn't mind it. He wasn't by any means grounded as he was before. Rather, there wasn't anywhere for him to go, which was fine by him. It had been a little over a month or so since the Battle of Tython, but aside from the recent Battle of Gamor, the war had been mostly battles between the Separatists and the Sith Empire. The Separatists were still taking the main brunt of the war effort, and the Republic was taking advantage of it. This, of course, was aside from what was now being labeled as the Axis of Three, the planets in the deep core that held off the Sith Empire, Corellia, Biss, and Kuat. Their formation was strong and their resilience was stronger. They had a bulk of Republic forces, and they were effectively ensuring they didn't risk unnecessary losses. They pushed troops back and forth between the three planets to protect each other, and it worked beautifully. Anakin continued climbing the great number of stairs in the Temple Island, making his way to the command center on the top of the island. He thought about the last month and what it held for him. Anakin was never interested in being a teacher, but he was also able to naturally fall into such a position. What he did was basically help the younglings with their struggles and with what hurt them. There was a lot of trauma across the Jedi Order, or what could be described as what remained of it. Anakin and his friend Natabre often spent a lot of time together working with the same group of 60 or 70 younglings and Padawans. The Jedi were scarce and they had to operate at such a direction. Two teachers weren't typically old enough to be teachers and a handful of traumatized children. It was hard, but it was the two of them and they had each other. Anakin was still working through his own losses, being Obi-Wan and Padme, most specifically. Natabra, on the other hand, was still going through the losses of her master, too. It was an arduous thing to go through, and no one wanted to go through it, but the Order was strong because of its unity. The bond that Anakin and Natabra had was shared across the Order. While both Anakin and Natabra were both close friends, many other Jedi had this collective bond with their peers that assisted them in uplifting themselves and each other. 
Anakin got to the top of the steps and looked down into the command center. Mace Windu was standing on a hologram with Captain Rex right next to him. He was telling the Republic his plans for the Republic military campaign, and Rex was showing off his thoughts on the use of Golan platforms for the strategy. Republic strategists believed this was a sound idea, and expressed that they would try and locate places to pull such resources from. Republic strategists had been struggling to make ends meet with the pirates in the Outer Rim, with the Zagarians, Black Suns, Pikes, and Huts all present, they needed to make peace with them for the betterment of the Republic war effort. Anakin wasn't fond of it at all, but he understood why it had to be done. It just made him very unhappy. As Anakin arrived, he got to hear the tail end of Mace's report. Aside from the potential new strategy, he mentioned his victory over the Sith Lord, Exar Kun, and the fact that it seemed like Sith Lords were becoming less and less patient. Master Plo Koon, who was also off-world, noted that scouts had picked up on a number of Sith Lords appearing, or at the very least their capital ships appearing, at multiple battles on the front lines against the Separatists. The Jedi were still very unaware that the attack made by Sion on Tython was completely separated from the collection of the Sith Empire. To the Jedi, it seemed like throughout the war, they'd encountered three Sith Lords, the Battle of Tython, the Battle of Gamor, and a small skirmish in an asteroid belt between two other battles. It wasn't a large battle by any means, but Sacy Tin and a wing of fighters were able to reroute a Sith pilot, who they were unsure of, of which one they fought off. Regardless of that, Mace Windu ended his leg of the conversation, and the other Jedi strategists broke off from the conversation as well. Anakin came up to Chikasta Nu and handed her a tablet with a number of reports on it. She grabbed the tablet and pointed to a number of Jedi who were standing at the edges of the Outer Command Center. She asked Anakin what the numbers were, and he said it was up to 43 per week. She sighed and looked down over the hills, down to the seas and across from them where the Garden Island was. She looked at the tablet and saw a number of names of the students who were a part of these scuffles. Anakin, while being a fine instructor, also had to break up a lot of fights. Jocasta had never seen anything like it, and frankly, no one had. Not even Yoda, either. Typically, there were maybe a couple dozen scuffles or incidents inside the temple a year, but this was a number that was gradually increasing per week. The previous week, it was 39. A month or so before, during the Battle of Tython, it was only three incidents. Jocasta told Anakin that it was time to start moving the troublesome children from the pack and getting them off the island. Anakin looked back over and asked what she meant. Jocasta immediately picked out a pattern in the students. Most of those who were involved in scuffles were older. There were some incidents with younger students, but it was rare, and most of the time the younger students were being picked on. Jocasta walked to the edge and looked across. A frown covered her face. Anakin could sense a great feeling of defeat, as she said that this order had fallen so far. It only took months for centuries, generations of Jedi to lose their touch on the galaxy and their code. All of it gone so quickly, and what was left? Despair? Trauma? Children who refused to learn their code only to choose violence as their only alternative. She looked at Anakin and thanked him for the tablet, and told him to get his friend Atabre and bring her back here in four hours. She told Anakin that it was time for a change within the ranks of the Garden Island. Anakin nodded his head. Before he left, he asked how the quest for the Star Forge was going. With a simple response, it left a cold feeling through Anakin's chest. It was that it was going as well as taking care of the younglings was going. Anakin nodded his head, bowed, and left. He eventually returned to the Garden Island, and he had some time to kill, and he wasn't set for instruction today. Neither was Ndabre. Anakin walked towards the edge of the island, and over to some rocks that were all too familiar to him. He found Ndabre with a small mat under her as she sat with her legs crossed and her eyes closed. Her hair was gently sitting on her shoulders, and lifting with the oh-so-delicate touch of the wind blowing by. She may have been fighting demons in her head, but she so desperately desired to rid them from her. Anakin stopped when he noticed her deep in meditation, and before he could even begin to twist his body around, Natabre said his name and asked what was wrong. Anakin stammered. He didn't think he got her attention, but he said that he didn't want to bug her while she was meditating. She shook her head and opened her eyes gently. Her amber eyes caught the seas that lay in front of her, before she turned and looked at Anakin. He was motionless for a moment, before returning to the present and telling her that he was simply here to tell her that she was requested to go to the Temple Island in the next couple hours. He'd be going as well. He would come back and get her if she wanted. Natabre nodded her head and looked back at the seas. She asked Anakin what was on his mind. Why was her tension shifting through him? Anakin shrugged his shoulders and didn't really say anything. She asked if it was over the war intensifying. Anakin nodded his head and told her that there was more than that, but that was essentially the main point. He had a worry for the Order. How would it survive? He felt terrible for Jocasta Nu and his conversation with her, and he wished that he could just do more. Natabre told him that he was pressuring himself too much. He needed to stay focused. There was only so much he could control. Anakin sighed. He knew. He just wished he could be more of a help. Windu was out on the front lines. Plo and Stacey were out on the front lines, and he wasn't able to help. Natabre asked him if he had been meditating lately or if he was keeping himself locked away. 
Anakin said it was 50-50. Sometimes he would meditate, but other times he just kind of didn't. Not in an unhealthy way, just in a forgetful way. Natabre told him that he just needed to trust the Force, to let it be with him. She was always here for him, and he knew that, and she was proud that he knew that, but he still needed to trust himself, and he needed to trust that he was making a difference. Even the smallest changes could have the greatest effects. Anakin leaned back against a rock and placed his hands on his thighs and thanked her. He twisted the conversation to her and asked how she was coming along with her troubles. She smiled faintly and said that she was embracing it more, but it was still difficult. A main point that she made is that she was moving away from the loss itself, but she was trying to focus on the cosmic force. As she and every Jedi understood, once a Jedi died, they moved into the cosmic force. Without understanding the concept of force ghosts yet, all that was known about the afterlife was the cosmic force. Anakin told her that he was proud of her for her hard work. She thanked him and asked what they were going to the temple island for, and he shrugged. He had no clue. They would find out when they would get there. She nodded her head and asked if he would like to join her in the meditation. Anakin smiled and made his way over to her side and got down on the ground and began his part of the meditation. Each of them were able to get what they needed from this meditation. The hours would pass by and the two of them would arrive at the temple island to find themselves amongst a group of other Jedi Knights. This was definitely odd, but Jocasta knew sauntered down a couple of steps and expressed that the Jedi all present had been selected. They were all being paired up in the groups they were already in. It was all duos. Jocasta had been watching the pairs of Jedi to see which ones were most mature and best with handling the younglings and Padawans. It was this select group right here and she assigned each of these Jedi Knights their own Padawan. From the crowd that was also gathered here came a select group of troublemaker younglings and Padawans. On another note, all these particular Jedi were approved by the remaining High Council for the ability to leave the planet for missions. Of course, Anakin and Natabre were a part of that after their heroics on Tython with the late Master Vizre. Both Anakin and Natabre were surprised to say the least, but they accepted it with open arms and prepared for what would likely be a challenge. Jocasta said that she selected these knights because they'd be able to handle whatever was thrown at them, and the Jedi were gifted an assortment of Jedi. Anakin and Natabri were the last of the group, and they were given some of the biggest troublemakers from the Garden Island. Of course, they were simply going off of what was on the list that all the Jedi Knights had compiled over the days, weeks, and months since their arrival. Anakin would be given Ahsoka Tano, who had her struggles with the fall of the Order, but her already rebellious nature made her hard for a Jedi to teach. She often got in the scuffles because, aside from her rebellious nature, she was very strong for her age. Ahsoka was given over to Anakin, and on the other hand, Natabri was given a girl, around the same age as Ahsoka, named Zala Isisia. The irony is, while the tablet gives off statistics about the biggest troublemakers around, they don't tell the full story. Natabri was genuinely surprised to see Zala here, but she was always on the list because she was an individual always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unlike her peer, she had a habit of trying to stop scuffles and being seen as an aggressor. She wasn't appreciative of it, but it didn't stop her from trying to stop riled up Jedi. On the bright side, all of the actual bullies and troubled kids were taken in by Jedi Knights. It just seemed, at least from Jocasta's point of view, that she was one of the worst. In all fairness, Jocasta had tried to stay on the Garden Island, but she was always needed for her information regarding the Star Forge for so long that she never was on the Garden Island. Zala was quiet. She always had a silence about her, and it was present. While she was the one who fought back against troubled kids, it never meant she won. It just meant she looked like an aggressor. It's always those who respond who get the worst. Neither Ahsoka or Zala said anything to the new teachers. It was just a moment of silence. Before the stiffness in the air could be broken by either Natabre or Anakin, they were summoned to the command table. On it was Plo Koon, Depa Balaba, Mace Windu, and in person, Obo Rancisis. They all expressed that Anakin and Natabre were being moved off of Octoom. The heroics on Tython were recognized, and they were being paired up with the Legion of Clone Troopers. They'd be picked up by a Republic shuttle in the morning. They both would be operating as generals. As per the new rules that were established, Jedi must be in pairs, and if they were both knights, they acted as one general. If it was two masters, it was the same thing. The point of Ephesus was to ensure the best outcome for the struggling Republic. The Jedi Council sent their thanks and ended the call. Most of the council wasn't on that call, which was weird. Before Anakin, Natabre, Ahsoka, and Zala left, Opa Rancisis told the new Jedi instructors that they were to be on a lookout for any potential assets to find the Star Forge. Anakin and Natabre were inquisitive about what they could find that would lead to the weapon. Opa informed them that it was a massive structure, and it was known by many peoples. There were chances that people across the galaxy knew of its existence and had clues to finding it. He enforced the message that whoever gets a hold of the Star Forge wins the war. He told them to trust the Force, and wished that the Force be with them on their newest endeavor. Our season continues on Coruscant with two allies of the Sith. With a city of three trillion controlled or at least kept silent in the lower levels, the Sith called this wreckage of the upper level 
home. Lord Revan and Lord Bane walk side by side, concocting a plan to seize control over the Sith armies so they could bring an end to the reign of the Jedi and establish peace in the galaxy. The two of them are tasked by Axe Kun's flagship to locate and find a Jedi who wielded an amethyst blade. They found that it was Master of the Order, Mace Windu, and sent the information back to Exar, and with that, the rest of the Sith. Exar was attempting to call the shots, and without a true leader to take complete control over the entire faction, he was basically the one. The two shadows walked through the halls of the Ripped Apart Temple. There weren't any lights on. All that was revealed was revealed because of the chasm that ripped through half the temple. They were in the Jedi Archives, kinda, and Bane stopped before they left. Revan asked why Bane was stopping, and he suggested that there had to be some more of these Jedi that they could try and find and understand. Revan suggested that besides the Grand Master being killed during the first confrontation, alongside a number of other notable names from this current order, there was nothing to gain from the Archives. Were there? Bane shrugged his shoulders. Maybe there was. They couldn't know until they looked. Revan followed Bane into a hole in the wall, as Bane ignited his crimson lightsaber and examined the room around him. What was Bane looking for? Revan followed quietly until Bane stopped at a broken shelf that belonged to the Archives. He turned his head to Revan and said that there had to be a Jedi that the Order and the Council kept a close eye on. Revan knew there was, but why did that matter? And as he asked the question, he answered it in his own mind. He was that Jedi once upon a time. Bane smiled when he saw the idea click in his head. Bane opened it up and a shattered hologram popped up before his eyes. Bane started searching through as Revan placed himself next to the Sith Lord. The names went on and on, all filled out by various people. Oh fascinating, who was Master Dooku? He seemed to have some sort of issues with the Jedi before leaving some ten years beforehand. He was also a generational talent with the blade. Bane pointed over and told Revan to see if he could find out about this Dooku. The Sith had acolytes fill out information on all the Jedi bodies recovered from the attack. It was important for having a general idea of what had happened to the Jedi forces after their initial assault. They knew how many Jedi died during the attack, and Bane mentioned that he never heard of this Dooku individual. Bane continued a little further, and he saw the name Anakin Skywalker. How peculiar. This one was placed into the archives by Grandmaster Yoda nearly ten years beforehand. What did Yoda have against Skywalker? Revan looked over and told Bane that Dooku was Countess Sereno, but he had since been reported as missing. Revan suggested that he had either died at the Battle of Coruscant or he was hiding because he didn't want to come into contact with the Sith. Revan trusted his instinct and suggested that they not concern themselves with Dooku, especially due to his elder age. Revan then scrolled through the archives to find all the information he could regarding this Anakin Skywalker individual. Revan stumbled back when he found the information regarding the boy. Bane saw Revan stagger back and quickly moved over to his side as they looked on in shock and awe. How was it possible to have so many midichlorians? Bane pulled the hologram off the wall and placed it into his handheld device and accessorized it some more. It didn't seem possible, or even plausible, but it was the truth. He was a 19 year old boy, actually probably 20 at this point, who had a 27,000 midichlorian count? Is it even possible to be that receptive to the force? Revan shook his head. This couldn't be true. It couldn't happen like this, and it certainly didn't seem like the Jedi trusted him. He could be integral to their plans, though. Bane told Revan they could keep it a secret. Revan shook his head, and Bane asked why. Revan believed that if this Anakin Skywalker was what the Jedi considered to be a chosen one, they needed to hunt him. If they could not turn him, then he needed to be killed. They couldn't mess it up. He was likely the key to everything, and if they allowed him to grow, trust within this order, or even grow within the forest itself, then their reign over the galaxy would fall out from under them. Bane shook his head, suggesting that even if this boy could reach his full potential, they could destroy him even if they had to. It wasn't even a competition. Revan didn't believe so, and maybe it made him superstitious, but he believed that some boy could be able to destroy their empire. Bane looked at Revan and said that he trusted him, but they would need to further develop their plans. Revan told Bane that they needed to work quickly. If they didn't, they would sacrifice precious time, allowing other Sith Lords to drown their empire into obsolescence. Revan didn't want that to happen, and neither did Bane. So, it begged the question, what did they do? Revan strategically laid out a plan that could genuinely work. It just required the time and effort to work. He turned to Bane and told him that they make sure everyone was aware of Skywalker. They do not inform everyone that Skywalker was on a short end with the Jedi. They needed to try and turn him to the dark side, but only the two of them. He continued to say that aside from Skywalker, they had to find the Star Forge before any other Sith Lord did. If they controlled it, they controlled the Empire itself. Then they could rule side by side as one united force. Bane suggested that they get themselves allies, and while Revan agreed, these allies were not to know about this plan. As Revan believed, the Sith were far too greedy for their own good. If they informed the other Sith of their plan, the others could try and ruin it. 
it would be best if they try and create a system of allies that would support them. The main thing was to make sure XR, or whoever was trying to seize the reins, failed bad enough to make the others resent him or her. Revan and Bane made their way out to the archives and were greeted by Lord Malgus. He looked very disgruntled and he informed them that they were needed inside the flagship of the Empire. They asked why. Malgus gritted his teeth and said that the poor excuse for a Sith Thion returned. Well, isn't this interesting? Bane first asked why he came back. Malgus grinned under his mask and told him that he failed. They asked him where he failed at and Malgus told the two of them that he went to the planet of Tython as a means to strike at the heart of the Jedi. Malgus turned and started walking back to the shuttle. He continued and said that Sion killed a master and apprentice duo, or maybe it was a master and a knight. Regardless, he was there and his army won the battle over a force that was much smaller than their own. It seemed as if the Republic task force led by two Jedi knights snuck in and defeated him, killed his army, and left him for dead. Revan asked for the names and Malgus snarled out the names of Anakin Skywalker and the Tabre Morden. Revan and Bane looked at each other and followed Malgus into the vessel. Sounds good. Malgus informed them that Darth Treya was returning from her quadrant of the galaxy with Nihilism Dome. She was reportedly pissed, and she would come and pick up the pieces of Scion. Bane and Revan were amused that she was returning like a pissed off mother. Malgus asked if they found that Exar was looking for, and both of them nodded their heads, telling him that they would be informing the other Sith once they arrived. In the flagship, Scion returned begging for mercy as he currently stood at the feet of Exar Gun. His remaining vessel had returned and he entered the fleet flagship, allowing his personal ship to receive repairs. Exar was annoyed, but no one was really nearly annoyed as Lord Drea. She was out for blood, and because Scion couldn't die, she would make him wish he could. He was in complete control of that, but the pain he was about to go through was something he would not have control of. Exar kicked Sion in the head and turned over to the doors when they opened behind him. He looked at Malgus, Revan, and Bane. None of them seemed to be in high spirits. What a shame. That was something that needed to change. He would be sure to change those feelings within them. They looked down at the Sith Lord before Revan begged the question, asking Exar what happened at Gamor. He hissed, turning his head towards Revan and telling him that his forces got ambushed by the Jedi Master of the Order. Mace Windu was not a Jedi to be trifled with and should be taken as a threat and a number one priority for them and their order to target and kill. If they didn't, he could destroy them and perhaps he would lead a resurgence of the Jedi movement and the movement of the Republic. Revan was questioning of this, asking why he couldn't kill a Jedi Master. Exar told Revan that while he was talented, he was outnumbered when he was engaged by the Jedi Master. Revan wasn't buying it. He said there was a couple of acolytes there with him. If he was outmatched, then why didn't he ask for the names of more Jedi? Exar growled. He didn't like all this questioning, and he told Revan that if he didn't stand down, there would be a problem. Before either of them could go in for each other's throats, Darth Xana walked up to Exar Kun and told him that she believed there was potential victory sitting on the Mandalore system. He turned to her with a glare that could cut through a planet's core as he told her that he didn't want to hear about Mandalore at the moment. Before he could try and rile up Revan more, Lord Treya walked through the doors, surrounded by a couple of her bodyguards with Nihilus quietly shadowing her. He didn't say a word, he just followed her by her side. Treya walked through the center of the room and spoke with an elegant accent that could delight the ears of peasants for eternity. She told the Sith that she was quite sorry for her student's insolence. He must have forgotten his place because there was not a mention of going out and gallivanting around in her studies. She turned to Nihilus for a moment and asked if he had any recollection of going out and acting as such and he shook his head. Treya smiled and turned back to Sion. He looked up pleading that she show him mercy. She laughed quietly, placing her hands together as she looked down at him. Treya asked the other Sith in the room if they showed mercy. Of course not. They were Sith. They were masters of darkness and failure could only mean one thing. A failure to uphold the ways of the Sith. A failure to the brethren and a failure to oneself. To do as badly as Sion did was simply frowned upon. She lifted her fingers over him and electricity rained down onto his back as he cried out in agony. The collective Sith watched as lightning rang out a few more times. Sith Lords joined in from various locations around the galaxy over Hologram. They simply looked down and acknowledged that Sion was getting his doom. When she stopped, she turned to all the faces in the Sea of Sith and told them that this is what treachery would bring them. They had experienced failure and they would no longer partake in such failure. The Sith would win. They would always come out on top.
stop, and they would remain unbeaten. If they believed anything other than that, then they would be punished. Cyan looked up at his master and wished that she stop, and she told him that it was only the beginning of his suffering. He may have failed on Tython, but his failure would be one that would not be forgotten. Chaya moved her hand over so gently, and the guards scurried over to Cyan and dragged him out of the room. Nihilus sadded himself behind his master as Exar pulled up a hologram. He told them that they needed to find the Star Forge. It was clear there were relics laying around the galaxy, and they needed to find them. Bane pressed a button on his device and a hologram popped up, showing a number of artifacts that Jedi had hidden in their archives regarding the Star Forge. Exar asked if there were more than just those that are previously understood as the only ways to reach it. Bane suggested that it was entirely possible that other cultures hid these artifacts without collaborating with the Jedi. These efforts were a galactic effort to keep the Star Forge hidden. Exar stood up and he told the Collective Council that he would be taking control effective immediately over the Sith Empire. He said that his plan was flawless and they could use it to secure a means to have a victory over not just the galaxy but every other galaxy in the universe. Revan stood out from the crowd. He told Exar that if anyone's taking control over the Sith Empire, it wouldn't be the Sith Lord who just lost the Battle of Gamora. They could be cutting off supplies to the Republic and heading to Kamino, but since there wasn't a victory, the Jedi were going to fortify that position, which according to the scouts was already true. Exar didn't like this threat to his power, and as the Sith in the room watched with interest, they awaited the next move. Exar pulled his blade from his belt and demanded that Revan stand down. This wasn't meant to be a debate, this was a clear path forward so they could wipe the Republic from the galaxy. Exar used this as a moment to show that Revan, among others, wasn't worthy of ruling over the Sith. That title belonged to those who could unite their cause. They could, under his rule, find the Star Forge and become victorious. Revan ignited his own lightsaber. Exar's double-bladed lightsaber ignited and he prepared to fight off Revan. The two of them engaged in a direct fight on the bridge of the flagship, the two of their blades connecting. The devious dance had everyone on the bridge and on the holograms enamored. Exar used the double-bladed weapon almost like a hypnotic device. He spun it around in a flashing manner to deter each and every single one of Revan's strikes. The Sith all watched in anticipation. It wasn't like they would bow down to the winner, but perhaps they would respect the winner a lot more than they would anyone else. The plan for Exar was to defeat Revan and crown himself as the leader of their operation. He wouldn't diminish the role of the other Sith because that would only aggravate them. He needed to cultivate their minds. Revan and Exar collided in the middle of the bridge. The screeching of their blades echoed across the chambers and they spun away from each other. The two of them paced around in a circle, their weapons facing each other and their poised position prepared to strike at the other. Exar pushed his offensive and spun his weapon around before disconnecting it and attacking with two separate blades. This forced Revan to ignite another weapon, but before he could, his main one was thrown from his hands as he slipped backwards. At the last second, he was able to ignite the second blade and defend himself, but even by this point it was too late. Revan slid out, but Exar kicked the back of Revan's knee as he moved before sliding his blades around, deigniting one and holding the other around Revan's neck. Exar looked at the rest of the Sith in the ship and told them that it was over. He would take command effective immediately, and that would be all all that was needed to be said. The Sith begrudgingly looked around at each other, and then to Revan. Revan patted Exar's wrist, and he was dropped. He wasn't just dropped, he was kicked down to the ground. Revan gritted his teeth. He was just embarrassed. Exar stood up and waved his blade over his head before deconnecting it and telling each of the Sith Lords that he was not their master. He was not trying to control them, rather he was trying to lead them to victory. As the crowd looked on, he told them that he only had one fear. It was a fear of failing them. But that would never happen. They were Sith. They were built upon victory, forged through fire, and their sole purpose was to reign supreme over the galaxy. They would spread out, put the war on the front lines to a slight hold so they could discover the necessary artifacts to win. He can continue suggesting that each Sith Lord was meant to lead their armies on offensives so they could claim land that could have what they were looking for. Every database in the galaxy needed to be searched. The key to the Star Forge had to be located. They would be victorious if they followed him. He stopped and turned to the other Sith and requested that they inform him of everything they knew so the Collective Council of Lords could be on the lookout. Revan looked up at Bane and nodded his head. Bane told the Council of Lords that he and Revan found something interesting in the database of the Jedi Archives on Coruscant. There was a man named Anakin Skywalker who had a midichlorian count higher than anyone they'd ever seen. He needed to be hunted down and defeated. Exar stumbled back. He asked Bane to repeat that name, and he said the name again. Exar looked around the room in a bit of fear. He turned back and told them that Cyan was reportedly defeated by Skywalker. Exar exclaimed that the boy was nothing more than that, but he was only beginning to tap into his power. Exar told the Sith that while they were going on their conquests around the galaxy, they had to headhunt a number of Jedi. The most distinguishable were Mace Windu, Anakin Skywalker, and the Tabre Mornan. 
None of the other Jedi had survived an encounter with a Sith Lord, or a Sith of that caliber of Scion, and while his defeat was troubling, they could deny that he was a powerful adversary. If these young Jedi could defeat him seemingly on their own, aside from a Jedi Master who was on Tython, then they were a true problem. The Sith asked if there was anyone else for them to challenge. Exar looked around. His position was a little unsteady. The name of Anakin put a wave of fear through his body. What could he become if he was allowed to develop naturally? This thought made waves through his mind, and it made Exar even more annoyed about the fact that Skywalker was allowed to be given some sort of confidence. Exar suggested that the Jedi should be headhunted, but those three in particular could be utilized. Natabra would be a great tool against a Jedi like Skywalker. Unlike Bane and Revan, Exar had to assume, as every other Sith did, that Anakin was born into the temple and he was loyal to their ways. So instead of trying to convince the Jedi to turn on their brethren, they needed to kill an ally and that ally was Natabre. Exar wanted to inflict as much pain as he could. Killing the girl would force Anakin into an uncomfortable position, where as a Jedi, he wouldn't be able to act naturally. He would fall victim to their code and he would likely react out of anger and frustration. If the Sith could capitalize off of that, he would no longer be an issue for them. Before Exar continued, Darth Xana reapproached him to tell him that she believed aside from victory in the Mandalore system, there is a potential artifact relaying some information towards the Starforge present there. Most of the Sith had been afraid to head to Mandalore because of its reputation during their own respective eras, but now it was different. Several Sith had reported what they learned to be that Mandalore had become a rather peaceful planet. After a civil war that nearly destroyed everything, it was clear that they didn't want to actively pursue war. They were riding off the coattails of their predecessors, so the Sith might as well avenge themselves and destroy the Mandalorians, kill their leader, find the artifact, and leave its system in ruins. Exer told Darth Xana to go there. Her enthusiasm for the Mandalore campaign should be enough to garner her a victory in that sector of the galaxy. Exer sent her out, and so she quickly scurried off the bridge and prepared her forces for departure for the Mandalore system. Exer turned to Darth Malgus and informed him that he'd be leading the second campaign on the Axis of Three. The Sith had a problem in the core, and Malgus showed the most resolve through his campaigns. Exer believed that Lord Malgus would be able to go to the planets of Bis, Corellia, and Kuat and take at least one of them. It was a highly defended area, and the Republic had an assortment of vessels in that sector that were consistently fighting back against the Sith advances. Because of how tight the three systems were, they became an absolute nightmare for the Sith Empire. It was especially an issue because escapees from the other coral worlds fled to the Axis of Three and immediately signed up for military jobs. Whether it be assisting clone troopers or building the vessels they used, it didn't matter. The shipyards at all three planets were at maximum capacity, pumping out warships by the dozen. The issue was having crews demand the vessels. With so many volunteers throughout the three planets, it was easy to get people to fill these ships, but they needed people to maintain control over the operation of those vessels. Republic troopers were moved and spread out throughout the fleet, and they were given the exciting job of teaching civilians how to operate and fire cannons on Venators and so forth. While the Sith were unaware of this, they did know that the Republic fleet's size within the three planets was increasing on the weekly. They needed to attack, and if they didn't, or if they failed, it could be the life support for the Republic forces if they could, at the very least, break to Biss. That was the entry point into the Axis of Three. If the Sith could stop Biss, then it would be incredibly difficult for the Republic to get their reinforcements. Currently, Biss was a hard location to get to because it was surrounded by CIS forces, aside from the entry point at the top of the core. It wouldn't be easy to sneak into Biss, but once they were in, they were in. Exar had two thoughts when it came to an attack at Biss. The first one being that if Malgus could truly succeed in the battle, then they could wipe the Republic naval structure out. With the victory at Biss, Corellia, and Kuat, they could very easily destroy the hopes for the Republic to rebuild their military strength in fleet combat. On the other hand, something that Exar thought would be pretty prudent if Malgus failed is just that. With Malgus defeated and most likely dead, then Exar would have one less Dark Lord of the Sith to worry about. While Darth Vitiate was sitting on the outside of the core, mostly keeping a calm and collected control over the sector, he wasn't the active threat that Malgus was. Yes, Vitiate could be a struggle to deal with, and Exar knew that. However, he was a lot more patient and he wasn't exactly the type of Sith who would just try and kill you immediately. He was a slow burn Sith, whereas Malgus would likely go straight for the execution. Exar's paranoia was a large player in his thought process surrounding those around him. While Magus wasn't exactly fond of Exar's ruling, in the Sith Command, he didn't really care. As long as he was going to win, that's all that mattered. The same could be said for Vitiate. Most of the true Sith Lords were just buying their time until the proper time to strike. If Exar won the rule over them, then that certainly wouldn't be a big deal, because as long as he helped them get to the Star Forge, that's all that mattered, realistically. The most important prize in the galaxy was the Star Forge. 
On the other hand, Revan got back up and stood next to Bane. Exar could see some sort of bond starting there, and as a means to deter Bane and Revan from collectively forming an alliance, Exar told Revan to take his forces to head to the far side of the galaxy towards the Endor and Sulla systems. Exar intentionally sent Revan there. It was one of the most contentious spaces in the entire galaxy. Not that Endor had the CIS or the Republic clamoring over it, but more or less the Sulla's regions were consistently under barrage from Sith and CIS forces. If he could keep Revan occupied there, then surely he would create a between Bane and Revan. That's all that mattered. And while Revan had his apprentice Malik with him, it was a different type of bond. Revan was wise enough to understand that if he wanted a real chance of taking control, he needed an ally that wasn't already tied to him. Malik was already in his corner, and it would seem like the easiest choice to make, which is why Malik would never be privy to these plans. His purpose was to serve as a second in command until Revan or Bane could overthrow Exar. It wasn't like it was the only alliance forming in the ranks of the Sith Empire. The system was very fragile, and if they allowed it to fracture, then they could lose all their progress. Exar gave out a couple more commands to other Sith Lords, and then moved back to his personal flagship. When he arrived, he looked out over his bridge, watching several different fleets disperse into the wider galaxy. Even now, he could feel Scion suffering as his master began to torture him for his disobedience. The dark side was powerful when he fed off of it, not just Scion suffering, but the galaxy full of it. He then thought to himself, it would be a brilliant victory, not to mention how satisfying the destruction of the Jedi would feel. The Sith would reign victorious, and he couldn't help but imagine how he would feel when the time came for him to be heralded in as a Sith King. Our season continues on Mandalore. The Duchess of Mandalore was seated in her throne room with her advisors seated around her. Since the fall of the Republic, she and her advisors hadn't slept all that much. Ever since she met Anakin Skywalker, she had been raising defenses around the capital city of Sundari. There were no other attackable locations on Mandalore itself aside from Sundari. Of course, there are bits and pieces of Mandalorians elsewhere in the system, like for example on the moon of Concordia, but for the most part, it was all contained right here, inside the capital. Satine was a pacifist, and she saved her people from a civil war that nearly ended their civilization. There are more or less more than 2 million or so remaining Mandalorians on her planet. She needed them to be ready, but she didn't want to. Most of the weapons of mass destruction had been locked away. While Satine planned on melting them down inside the Great Forge for reconstruction purposes, she kind of forgot about it. While Sundari made a relatively quick recovery, after the Civil War, she had to be off-world for several months and weeks at a time so she could build up alliances with planets around the galaxy. Satine made it clear to her people that they would defend themselves from these oppressors, because she and her people recognized that this Sith Empire wouldn't be down to play politics. If they were indeed Sith, they needed to prepare for what came next. The Sith would likely try to destroy the Mandalorians because of revenge. The dynamic of the galaxy completely changed, and Satine knew she couldn't be reliant on other planets to bail her out of this. Without a Republic, and without a CIS having a strong foothold in the galaxy, Mandalore was isolated. She was trying to get in contact with the Republic, but that wasn't really getting anywhere for her. The Republic didn't have time for Mandalore because it wasn't in their inner circle. Mandalore was far outside the Rishi Maze, and too far away from Kamino or any other outlying systems to actively pursue defending. They did wish her well, similarly to how they wished the Axis the Three Well in the Deep Four. If they could help, then they definitely would, but it just was outside their range. Though there was some sort of possible saving grace. Mandalore being so prevalent in the galaxy, before the fall of the Republic became a beacon of hope for civilians of planets across the galaxy. Of course, not every Mandalorian was happy with the idea of people coming to their planet, but there was a genuine consensus, that while they were fleeing the Sith Empire, they'd band together to defend Mandalore, though they didn't know what was being done about that yet. All they knew is citizens were being restricted from the landing docks and the exterior of the dome. Satine was placing anti-air defenses all around the dome. The entire city became a safe haven, though Mandalore made it very clear to any citizens fleeing from other planets that if they came too close to Sundar without informing the landing docks of their purpose, they would be shot out of the sky. As Satine walked through the halls of her palace, she helped the refugees who made themselves home here. Satine opened up her palace to citizens and refugees from around the galaxy. Of course, there were residences around Sundari that could accommodate these people, but she wanted to lead by example. Of course, her royal guard blocked off the entry points to her quarters and the throne room, simply because she needed to have peace to sleep and she needed to be alone to work with her advisors. There were people from other planets with governmental status that she brought into the throne room to discuss potential strategy. As the Mandalorians decided where they were going, Satine sent her police force and royal guard down to the Great Forge to release these weapons of mass destruction that had been hidden away for the last couple of decades. She told them to make sure they were functional and put functioning ones up by the landing docks, but not outside. She needed every single one of the available weapons ready to go. As she concluded another 17-hour session with her advisors, she prepared to speak before her people. 
Satine walked away from her throne room and into her bedroom. She sauntered around the room and then decided she would go to her closet. She looked inside and peeled away a couple of beautiful gowns and outfits she had for political discord and official state business. Behind all of it was the armor of a Mandalorian warrior. Not just a Mandalorian warrior, but a duchess. Satine looked at it and lightly touched the side of the armor. It removed a small coat of dust that had formed. The last time she wore it, it was before her father died. Before the war started and before she became the Duchess, the armor was beautifully crafted, and while the prominent colors of Clan Kree's weren't present on it, it was recognized as the armor of the future Duchess. Satine hadn't grown all that much since her father died when she was 16 or so, so she pulled the armor out and put pieces of it on. As she did, she realized that for the most part she was able to squeeze into it. Was it the most comfortable thing in the galaxy? No. Did that matter? No. As she placed the shoulder pieces on, she could see her reflection in the mirror. A flash of memories popped through her mind, and she looked down at the helmet. She wasn't always a pacifist. She knew how to fight. She was trained to fight. She was a Mandalorian, and Mandalorian royalty at that. Satine was trained by some of the best warriors on all of Mandalore during her upbringing. Sure, she'd be a bit rusty, but there was no saying that she wouldn't be able to hold her own. She accessorized the helmet and rubbed some dust off the visor and smiled at it before a frown returned to her. She never wanted to be a pacifist as a child. She never wanted to be a warrior as a young adult. And now she had to return back to a state of mind she hadn't been in since she was young. It brought back a ton of memories for her because she was the apple of her father's eye. He loved her with all of his heart and they bonded over such things. They practiced with each other and preached about ideologies with each other. Their bond as father and daughter wasn't just over being Mandalorians, but being intelligent individuals. Holding the helmet, she remembered her father telling her about her place in the galaxy, and how when she was of age, Mandalore would look to her to lead. Her father was always so positive that when the time came, she'd be the best of her people. Satine looked at the mirror again and wiped the tear from her eye and firmed her stance. She was a Mandalorian. She walked through the halls, donning her armor. It was so clean and pristine, kept in mint condition that had people gasping at its beauty. Of course, she dusted it off before leaving her room, but people looked at her like she was a goddess, and a goddess she was. A flowing cape drifted behind her, she made her way to the balcony that overlooked her people. Satine looked down to not just see Mandalorians, but people from all sorts of different species gathering around, waiting to hear the word from their duchess. Satine held the helmet under her arm, and she took a deep breath before speaking. She told her people that not more than 20 years before, they rejected war. They collectively as a people chose peace and they enjoyed it for so long. It was time they became warriors again. There were villains outside, sitting at their gates, and they were the only defense they had against those monsters. If Mandalore was to survive, they would have to be the shining example of strength in this part of the galaxy. She acknowledged some other people's concerns by saying she understood that it may have been overwhelming with the influx of people from around other planets, but she reminded them they were Mandalorians. Despite their warrior past, they were all the shining example. They were all leaders. All of what they did would inspire the galaxy. She then said to all the refugees, she welcomed them all to Sundari, officially, before she said that there were supplies to fight back against the enemy. If they wanted to join the war effort, they would be welcome to join. This fight was for all of them. If they survived, they'd prove victorious again. Satine stopped as one of her guards came up to her left ear and whispered into it. Satine took another deep breath. A fleet from Coruscant was reportedly heading towards Mandalore. They'd have somewhere between 12 and 24 hours to prepare for the assault. She looked around at her people. Confusion and fear was written on their faces as she took the message. She was their leader. She was the Duchess. Satine steadied her breath and rested her hand on her hip to stop it from shaking. She looked down at her people and told the truth. She said that the Sith were coming for them. They would have to be ready. Satine reminded every single one of them that they were warriors. In the past, they defeated the Sith. In the present, they would do it again. She raised her hand with her helmet under her hand, and she told her people that no one would break their defenses, and no one would storm their gates. No one would bring them an apocalypse because they were Mandalorians. All the fear that sat in the crowd vanished as Satine slowly lowered her helmet over her head and raised her fist in the air. The Mandalorians and refugees all cried out in patriotism. They would fight back, and they would win. Satine told her people to gather their supplies and prepare to fight back against the Sith. She turned and walked away from the balcony as she entered the palace. She removed her helmet, and she told her guards to have the defenses ready to go immediately. One of the police commanders ran up to her and told her that some of the vehicles were struggling to turn on. She asked about their weapon systems, and the commander said that they were all operable. She told the commander to begin laying out a system of traps around the landing zone. They had to be ready at every turn. She requested that every single ranking member of her staff get to the throne room immediately. She was conjuring up a plan that would save Mandalore from the Sith. The commander nodded his head and quickly got on the move. 
As the team made her way to her throne room, she walked through the halls filled with refugees. But they weren't slumped over, they were on their feet. They all looked at her and surrounded her. They would fight with her, they would stand with her, and they would die for her. She looked at them and told them that they would survive this and they would be victorious, and they cheered her on. Eventually she got to her throne room and found all of her advisors around her. She gave out her plans. Every single child under the age of 16 would be sent to the lower levels of the city to stay at the Great Forge. They'd be safe down there. Adults who accompanied them would lay a foundation of traps to prepare themselves. The first four blocks closest to the dome would be emptied out and booby-trapped. If the Sith were able to break into the city, they had to survive by their own luck. After those four blocks of traps, she wanted ramparts assembled. It was a lot to ask for, but there were two million citizens. If half of them were ready to fight back, then they'd be able to defend themselves adequately. The Mandalorians quickly got to work and implemented her plan into action. They made sure that they took shifts to make sure everyone was ready to rest up before the Sith arrived. Satine sent out a distress signal to inform the Republic that there was a chance of the Sith Empire making their way to Mandalore. The amazing thing about the defense is, it had the refugees and Mandalorians coming together in an effort to fight against a common foe. They were in this with each other, and for many Mandalorians, they brought their armor back out to fight with again. Satine tried reaching out to Pre Vizsla in hopes that he would serve alongside them, but he still hated her and told her he wanted to see her people and her fail. Well, that was a shame. He'd be on his own as it turns out. Before the Sith arrived, Satine went to a bureau location. While her father's body was never recovered from battle, there was something placed inside the tomb that she put there. It was a weapon, similar to that of the Darksaber, but it wasn't quite a lightsaber-like weapon. It was an electro Beskar sword. It didn't ignite like a lightsaber, but it did have an on and off mode. When it was turned on, it radiated with the heat, and when it was off, it was just a ceremonial sword. Satine had been instructed on how to use it, and so she went to retrieve it. It was a Clan Kree's family heirloom and had been passed down from generation to generation, though Satine was unaware of where it came from. The markings on the weapon were older than even she could understand. It was ancient Mandalorian, but it was also mixed with something else. That didn't matter now. She took the weapon and joined her people by the landing docks. On the docks, next to an anti-aircraft artillery, were Mandalorian tanks, cannons, and weaponry. When Satine showed up with her royal guard, the people who waited on the front lines were all taken aback. Her presence as a leader was already well known and established, but when the Duchess walked to the front lines to be with her warriors, their morale jumped up. Only one of the doorways was open to the landing platforms, and she, with her troops, walked to the front lines. It wasn't more than a few minutes after her arrival when the ground rattled with the appearance of the Sith Empire, and it caught their attention. Satine called upon the anti-aircraft cannons, and everyone prepared for the siege to begin. Inside of the fleet, Darth Xana looked down with disgust. The Mandalorians would be crushed. She would see to it that they would be destroyed. She ordered the fleet to move in closer and prepare a landing procedure. As the fleet got into range, the heavy cannons on the landing platforms launched the heavy flag into the sky, and the first support ship was hit. The Sith fleet placed itself in the right place, because they were being bombarded from the ground by Satine's forces. The Sith fighters escaped the hangar bays and made a beeline for the surface. Without any aircraft, the Mandalorians were under a bit of a disadvantage. However, they were Mandalorians after all. The jetpacks ignited and they blasted off into the skies and began taking the fight to the sky. The fleet positioned here wasn't small by any means, and the Sith were also under some confidence. They all actually arrived earlier than anticipated, but they decided to make their stop off at Concordia because public databases showed that there was a Mandalorian governor there and they wanted to make sure they didn't have to worry about any surprise attacks. They made sure of it by stopping at the planet and ripping apart the Death Watch camp. It was so flawless that Darth Xana didn't even have to leave her command ship. Sundari was much different. Xana and her men got a little ego and confidence boost from Concordia, but there weren't two million Mandalorians on Concordia. The Sith fleet began getting hit with heavy fire, and the Mandalorians, under the command of the Royal Commander and Satine, were quick to take on a counteroffensive. While Satine wasn't much of a commander, she made it very clear that she wasn't going to lead the majority of the military battle. She boosted motivation. Now the people, trained for combat over the last several years, would use their knowledge to their advantage. Luckily, Satine's commander was a general during the Civil War, and he was well equipped with strategies that worked against other Mandalorians, which meant they were assured to work against someone like the Sith. This strategy came in clutch. One of the frigates from the Sith fleet dropped from the sky. Fighters and dropships tried to exit the vessel before they were blown out of the sky as well. The wreckage of the frigate was hit while descending, and the entire vessel exploded. Darth Xana ordered a full landing procedure to begin. She recognized it would be a suicide mission for a lot of her men, but they needed to do it now or never. With the Sith fleet taking the majority of flak, it would give them time for landing ships to get to the ground and allow the ground battle to begin. There was also a number of Sith marauders that were being dispatched to the surface to lead the assault. Xana had her own personal acolyte that acted like an apprentice in a way. He really wasn't, but he was the best out of the Sith that was accompanying her. 
She made it very clear that she would not be making her landing procedure until the landing zone was cleared, and then she'd be granted safety to land. With the flak cannons firing, the Sith fleet wouldn't be able to get over the top of the dome until they were shot down, and she wouldn't risk a bombardment of the dome either. While the flak cannons were an issue on the top most of the dome, she was most concerned about the cannons on the landing yards. The Mandalorians were very quick to defend themselves, and while there were a number of refugees fighting back, most of them were a part of the second line of defense. Satine and her troops knew that at some point they'd have to surrender to landing zone, which they did prepare for. She told her commander to booby trap everything, and he made sure he did. If the Sith wanted to get anywhere, they'd have to work for it. As the ships made their landing procedure, Satine noticed a ship at the back of the pack that had different markings. She knew it had to be some sort of leader, so it had to be taken out. Though the issue is they couldn't get to it. The shuttle was, well, too defended to get to. They had to hope for a miracle to take it down before it landed. The Mandalorians knew that the Sith would come with lightsabers, and while their Beskar would protect them from it, it would make their defense all the more difficult to defend. While the Flak was doing good at taking down the Sith air attack, it couldn't get everything, and neither could the airborne Mandalorians. The Sith troopers landed on the ground and began their assault. They emptied out of their vessels, and Satine stood on the front lines with their troops and fought off the incoming enemies. There were losses around the docking yards, but most of the individuals were the refugees, because they didn't have Mandalorian armor. Without the armor, they were a lot less defended. As the eerie looking shuttle prepared its landing gears, it was clipped out of the sky and it slammed down onto the docks, wiping out a number of Sith troopers. From behind the line, it was Mandalorians, not just any, but the Death Watch. The Mandalorian troops exited from a gunship as it was blown out of the sky. Some notable helmets dropped down, but only one of them did Satine actually recognize. It was her sister, Bo Katan. She was impressed to see her sister on the front lines, but she was still loyal to a badly injured Pre Vizsla. Behind Vizsla was Gar Saxon. The Mandalorians from Concordia barely escaped the wreckage and made their way to Mandalore to try and help. Not that they wanted to, but the entire purpose of the operation was to defend Mandalore and maybe get it back. Pre Vizsla had every intention of killing Satine when this was over, but now he needed to use Sundari as a base of operations and use the Sith as a means to gain her trust before killing her. Though truthfully, Pre was surprised to see Satine on the front lines because he didn't recognize her armor. He never realized, like many of the late war, that she was trained as a warrior by her father. He never considered her to be one of them for her pacifism, but she was just like any Mandalorian. It didn't matter. He couldn't register it. Satine stood on the front lines using pistols handed down from her mother. While their resistance was stiff, there were too many Sith troopers, and Satine knew it. Though her commander was confident he could get the most usage out of the landing platform's trap. He kept the warriors outside the dome for as long as he could. While they were fighting, one of the capital ships from the Sith fleet exploded. It was damaged from the explosion of the frigate, and from the right shot of the flat cannon, it hit a fuel canister and ruptured the entire system. Darth Xana was furious, and she demanded a status report from her troops. She learned the Sith marauders had been killed in their shuttle and never made it down to the surface. The Sith troopers were being held back by their failure to land. She looked at her acolyte and told him to go to the surface and clean up the mess. Before her acolyte could get inside the shuttle, the Mandalorians cleared the landing zone. All of their exterior tanks had been destroyed, and they were retreating to the second layer of the defense. The Sith troopers landed and the doors were closed on their faces. They prepared to open the gates so they could enter the city, but it would prove to no avail. Satine and her troops rushed back. The commander got to his position and they began the second part of the plan. Satine got to Pre Vizsla and told a group of troopers to escort him back to the palace, along with the rest of the wounded. They needed to get everyone who was injured back to full health. The siege had only just begun. The Sith troopers were finally landing on the platforms of Sundari docks, and as they prepared their breach of the docking yards, they were blown apart by a trip mine set off by the commander. He looked on with pride. The Sith army was decimated and thousands of their men died. Of course, being that they were Sith, this did not change the resolve. They would come in and break down the berries and kill the Mandalorians and take the planet. The commander issued repair crews to the topmost half of the dome to repair their flat cannons and reinstall any of them that were still operable. For now, the Sith fleet moved out of range of the heavy cannons. Darth Xana was livid, but she couldn't reach out for help. The Sith armies had all dispersed elsewhere in the galaxy, and she knew that if she failed, it would come back to bite her. She needed a sound strategy. She asked for a roll call from her acolyte on the troop numbers of the Sith. He told her that with the loss of one of the capital ships and one of the frigates, their numbers were drastically down. He informed her that there were men who entered the dome, but they were pinned down at the entrance. They were hiding behind debris and... They had really nothing else to protect them. She asked how many were down at the entrances. He told her that about 1,100 made it out of the deployed 21,900. For the entire invasion force, how many did they have left? The accolade told her that there were close to 47,000 troops remaining in the rest of the fleet. She asked why they didn't deploy them. The accolade stammered, and then he came clean. He told her that the marauders who died in battle earlier wanted to have more Mandalorians to kill themselves. 
they were expecting a little less resistance. As it turns out, they ordered the troops to allow them to go without any support. Xana looked at the accolade with piercing yellow eyes and asked why she wasn't informed, and he stuttered. He explained that they told the deckhands that it was an order from her. She rolled her eyes. Part of her wanted to strike him down and make him suffer for not telling her, but he wasn't the problem. The deckhands were. She asked where they were, and he told her that they were gathered up in the hangar bay. She smiled and told the accolade to have them thrown out of the hangar bay and let them fall to their deaths. He nodded his head and then asked what they would do about the overall assault. She suggested that they wait out the night, but make sure the Mandalorians knew they were still here. He asked how, and she said that they would bombard the land outside of the dome to keep the illusion that they would never win. The Acolyte nodded his head and escaped from the bridge to make sure the deckhands were all thrown to the deaths. It would be easy to do to make her happy. Xana stood on the bridge and looked at the captains and lieutenants standing around. She told them that if they failed in their next leg of the assault, then they would face a pain far worse than death. She told them what they were going to do, and how they would win this battle. This time, they didn't have to worry about anything other than the flak from the top of the dome. Once they landed, the city was theirs. She instructed them to kill everyone. If they found the leader, she wanted to murder them herself. That was her only request. In Thresendari, Satine walked along the front lines of the troops, asking and helping them where she could. not The wounded were all taken to various medical facilities around the city to be taken care of, and seemingly, Previsla was making a fine recovery. Of course, the team was surprised Vizsla wore his armor because he always talked like she did, but perhaps it was the same reason she was wearing armor here on Sundari. bo at this point was a lieutenant for the Death Watch, and she was the leader of an elite group called the Night Owls. Bo felt kind of off. She believed there's bad blood between her and her sister, but Satine never approached her like there was. Satine was just grateful that Bo was alive, because that's all that really mattered to her. Bo walked with her sister and tried to keep up. It wasn't that Satine didn't want to be around her sister or anything, it was that she was leading. Satine always chose her people over what she wanted because she was a leader. That's what leaders did. But watched her sister in action and admired her as she did her job. When they had time, Satine sat down on a rampart and stretched. Bo came in next to her and asked how she was doing, and Satine mentioned that she was a little sore. Bo asked her where, and when Satine pointed to it, Bo saw a bit of blood. It was a piercing made by a piece of debris that blasted through the air. It must have happened when they made their retreat from the landing platforms. Bo asked her sister to hold still as she pulled off a couple pieces of armor and called over a medic. Satine put her hand up and told the medic to come when he had time. She was alright right now. Satine leaned over to her right and Bo looked at the wound. It wasn't large, but it did make a decent dent. The piece of the breeze was a part of a landing gear, and it slid right between the armor pieces into her left ribs. It was closer to the back side of her ribs though. Bo told Satine to bite something, so she took off her glove and bit it while Bo ripped it out. It wasn't the most pleasant feeling ever, but it wasn't a terrible wound. It would leave a scar. Satine thanked her sister for the help and Bo just smiled at Satine. It was nice for the two of them to enjoy being sisters again. They hadn't been sisters in years. They talked with each other for a good period of time until someone put a back to patch over Satine's wound and she placed her armor back on over herself. The troops were able to get some rest in the ramparts until the morning came. When the morning came, Bo noticed Satine's weapon, and she asked her if she got it from their father. Satine nodded her head with a smile. She told Bo that he always said that she would rise up and lead Mandalorians. She figured that, as she did, she might as well have their father with her. Bo told Satine that she was very sorry for being gone for all those years. Satine shook her head. As the older sister, she didn't want Bo feeling any sort of shame for it. Their separation was what naturally happened, but they learned from it. They could make good use of what they had learned from. Satine never wanted to be away from her sister again, and she hoped that Bo felt the same. Satine extended her arm, and Bo grabbed it. They held each other's arms for a moment, and nodded their heads. They were in this together, as sisters till the end. Our season continues as the sun glistens over the dome of the Mandalorian capital of Sundari. Satine and her troops prepared for what would likely be the most arduous day of combat they had ever seen. The morning was calm, and Satine wanted the troops to get as much rest as humanly possible. Of course, what made that difficult was the arrival of the Sith fleet and the ringing sound of black cannons as they said good morning to their intruders. Satine tried to allow the troops to rest, but that was clearly no longer an option as Sith dropships filled the skies again. Thousands of troops, two Sith, and all that stood in their way were a band of Mandalorians being led by a pacifist with a saber that wasn't even the dark saber. Sounds like it should be easy. But Satine and their band of Mandalorians had no intention of making it that way for these intruders. Outside the dome, Darzana and her acolytes stood silently in their own dropship. They didn't use a specialized vessel because as it turns out, Mandalorians are smart enough to see something that looks vaguely different than everything else. Xana didn't want her mission to fail and she wanted the respect she believed she deserved, the respect that belonged to a Sith Lord. 
Of course, Xana was nowhere near the front of the landing party, but she did get the pleasure of landing and walking out into a sea of smoke and debris. Her troops piled into the dome and they were held off the main gate. The barricades that the Mandalorian set up were more than enough, but of course, it wouldn't last forever. The Mandalorians got to work and Satine joined her commander as he was leading the men in different formations. The commander kept himself distant from the battle because the Sith were infiltrating across the city, just as he and Satine predicted. Their plans were coming to fruition, however, they couldn't get optimistic about the success yet. It was clear that one of the flanks was collapsing. Bo, who was with Satine, immediately jumped at the idea. She told her sister that her unit and night owls were elite enough to make a move to that sector and clear it out. Satine nodded her head and wished her sister luck. Bo smiled and placed her helmet on with a little twist before the jetpack ignited and she shot off into the battle. Satine told the commander to keep up what he was doing. As she said that, he was launching his feet. A sniper that took a shot was deterred by a rocket. The sniper in all actuality was aiming for Satine. Considering her armor stood out, but he missed because the platform he was on was blown out from under him. Satine cried out, putting her helmet back on and checking the commander to see if he was still alive. He wasn't. Satine leapt back up. She had to use everything she learned from him the last several hours and put it to use. She was concerned though. There was a breaking point that the commander mentioned. If their forces pulled out too early, they would surrender the battlefield to the Sith. If they pulled out too late, they would completely jeopardize the defenses. It was a perfect timing type of thing, and he as an experienced general knew when that time was. He told Zatine, but as things go in chaos, she was cycling through three or four different phases that it could have been. Initially, she believed it was when the Sith got close, but maybe it was when they were down a number of troops. All she knew is that as she helped the wounded away from the ramparts and continued acting as target practice for the Sith, she couldn't remember what it was. Satine did keep up a good line though. Her troops were the most united across the battlefront, and a good part of that was due to her morale boost. Of course, as the battle continued and more waves of Sith troopers filed through the ramparts, she began to question where Previsa was. His injury wasn't much worse than the one she sustained the day before. He was either intentionally avoiding her, or he wasn't interested in the battle. She couldn't figure out why, but maybe he was up to something positive. One could only hope. Satine rounded the corner and looked out to see the heavy tanks making their landing on the platforms. She knew this is where they retreated. Satine called out to her troops across the line and told them to break backwards. She stood in her white armor as she directed orders to the troops. Sith troopers targeted her, but she was able to slightly evade their attacks. Her troops broke back to the final line of defense. While the Mandalorians knew it was happening, the Sith didn't. Darth Xana saw their victory closing in. The first couple blocks of residential buildings looked normal. The only thing missing were the people. For Xana and her troops, they naturally assumed that the Mandalorians evacuated the civilians and abandoned the outer lay of the city. They would soon wish that was the case. Xana told her men and the Acolyte to push forward. The Acolyte issued out orders across the lines and the troops all responded readily. It was becoming very obvious that since the Mandalorians hadn't fought for nearly two decades, that they were a little rusty. Of course, the refugees weren't helping much either. It looked like a really dire situation for the Mandalorians as the Sith Empire pushed further. The heavy tanks broke through the first block of city streets and residential areas, and then Satine ordered the trap to be pulled. The tanks and Sith troopers exploded. It wasn't one blast around the first blocks across the city, it was her entire segment in particular. The other Sith troopers hadn't gotten that far into the city yet, or were already blown the hell and didn't have a chance to radio it into the others. Satine could see the panic ensue, and she had to make a mature tactician decision. Of course, seeing the enemy troops route makes you want to chase them down, but she couldn't. It would sacrifice the protected locations. The Sith troopers under Xana didn't rout for long. She knew that the leader of the Mandalorians was in front of her, and she pressed further. She ordered a wing of fighters to break through a set of traps on the other side of the potential districts. If they could get those bombs ignited, they could progress and take out these Mandalorian warriors. It'd be that simple. Xana admired her own strength in this process, and she held the troops off long enough for the fighters to break into the dome and set off the traps. It took his time, and when the fighters broke in, the Mandalorians and refugees panicked. Satine tried to keep them steady, but it was hard. She then noticed that a safe spot for her troops to hide at would be the top of those buildings. If the jetpack troops could get up there, they could deter the fighters, though it was already too late. The fighters weren't used for anything other than kamikaze attacks. Their whole purpose was to set off the chain of bombs that got in the way. As the booby traps were exposed, and the Mandalorians saw the very undoing of their plan, they had to decide what to do. Satine panicked. She looked at her troops and realized that all their lives sat in her hands, as if they didn't already. But this is the moment she realized how important it was to get this right. Satine could see the heavy Sith tanks creeping into the residential district, which was nothing but rubble and destruction at this point. She thought for a moment. The residential area was safe, and the Sith thought it was safe to enter. Make it not safe. She quickly rounded up the troops in her quadrant and gave them orders. She told the refugees to use the ramparts as cover. Without Mandalorian armor, they were exposed. Mandalorians, on the other hand, would break into the sector, use anything they could to create a firing line. 
They knew the city better than anyone else. Use it to their advantage. If they could cripple their tanks and the heavy vehicles, they could win this. It could also give the refugees a chance to survive and give them a better shot being effective against the Sith troopers. She told them they didn't have much time to do it, so her orders went out quickly and the Mandalorians broke out of the ramparts as the Freedom Fighters ran to the ramparts to continue their fight. On the far side of the flank, Gar Saxon was leading his troops into an offensive attack. He had no permission to do so, but he took command after a captain in the sector was taken out. He told the Mandalorians and the refugees to attack and head into battle. It was the worst thing he could have ever done. The Sith troopers had the same strategy, and without Gar being privy to the traps laid throughout the residential areas, he ran his men into them. When the Sith fighters came barreling in through the dome and used the same kamikaze tactic, it completely wiped out an entire flank of fighters. Gar Saxon and a couple thousand warriors died instantaneously. The bomb shook the dome and Bo-Katan, who was in the area, acknowledged how desperate the situation had become. She couldn't get in contact with her sister because she was currently being followed by a couple Sith fighters. Satine was none the wiser to Gar's flank, or even that he had taken command. She had no trust for the Death Watcher or anyone who served with them, and now they were costing Zendari a chance at survival. Satine and her troops were able to get to the residential area and prepare a trap for the Sith, but they were a little too late. As they got to their positions, the Sith army had already begun unloading into the ramparts where the refugees were. Satine ordered the counterattack, and it did work. With rockets on their backs, the Mandalorians were able to cripple the front line of the Sith tanks and make it so that the surviving tanks couldn't break through. It was another line of ramparts in essence, and as the Sith troopers noticed what was happening, they began their own counterattack. They fired back at the Mandalorians, and when the Accolade joined them, he ordered a full-on assault, demanding that they get into hand-to-hand -hand combat. His lightsaber netted, and Satine grabbed her father's sword and ran forward. The Mandalorians cried out in a battle cry, their jetpacks flying them into combat, and all the Sith army could do was hope and pray they came out on top. The Acolyte on the hand targeted Satine. Her defining armor made her an easy target, and he was going to make an example of her. The Acolyte and Satine engaged each other. The initial strike was drawing for her. The last time she used full speed like this was when she was still a teen fighting against her father. This would be much harder than it was before. It didn't help that the wound that she had was in such a critical location, such as her ribs. For most of the day, she was able to avoid thinking about it, but she couldn't now that she was viciously defending herself with a weapon like a sword. The Acolyte and Satine drew the attention of those around them, and the battle continued to intensify. Darth Xana watched in pride. She could feel it. Well, at first it was victory, now it was something else. Xana was standing in front of the gate, and a massive explosion triggered her reaction to turn around. She hadn't seen that before. Oh no. It was the Republic. Her flagship detonated, and when she looked back, the skies were filling with LAATs. Satine was getting messages about the Republic fleet, but she was unable to answer them. She was a little busy at the moment. The troops who were manning the flat cannons decided that the Republic was here to help, and thank the Force they decided that was the case. The Republic jumped in behind the Sith Empire, and they were none the wiser. It came from nowhere, and the reason is, is because the Republic was en route when Satine sent her distress signal. The Republic just arrived with the closest fleet in the sector, with a number of Venators and support ships. The already crippled Sith fleet was no match. The Republic was already out here with a large fleet to begin with, which meant there was likely a Jedi Master here with them. Xana panicked as she tried to reach the communication on a bridge of her support ships. She got no response. She began the warriors as the LAATs funneled down to landing positions around the dome. With the cannons primed, the gunships quickly took out the dropships for the Sith Empire, which immediately began to trap the Sith troopers inside the dome with no way to escape. They had nowhere to go. The most important positioning of these LAATs was on the flank that Gar Saxon died on, and as they made their way there, the counterattack made itself known to the Sith. Xana tried to reroute her troops to defend themselves, but it fell out from under her as she watched the final ships of her fleet crush under the Republic fleet. Satine, on the other hand, was on her back. She was defending every strike, but when you got a sister like Bo Katan, Satine was in good hands. Bo came barreling around the corner like a loft bat out of hell. Her jetpack sped her towards the accolade as she prepared to strike Satine, which truthfully, with her armor, wouldn't have done all that much. Bo's shoulder slammed right into his ribs, and the cracking sound could have been heard from across the city. The Acolyte was launched from his feet as Bo came back around to her sister. The Sith troopers were beginning to realize that they were trapped, and yet a number of Mandalorians hadn't realized that there were reinforcements coming to save them. The Sith troopers began their retreat, and as they did, they looked death in the eyes. Darth Xana ignited her lightsaber preparing for her final stand. The reason her lightsaber was ignited was a Jedi Master made himself present. He was leading his troops and his blue lightsaber sent rage through Xana's body. She looked at Jedi Master Plo Koon and the clones that he was leading with pure rage as she launched herself across the battlefield and engaged him. Plo blasted his lightsaber against hers and forced her back as the men of the 104th plowed their way through. The Mandalorians saw these men as allies and they quickly got themselves out of the way. 
Satine, on the other hand, prepared to finish off the Acolyte, who was again up trying to kill the Mandalorians. She looked at him as her troopers made their way back to the ramparts, where the rest of the refugees were. She used her jetpack and sped forward with the sword ignited. The weapon slashed him across the leg as she launched herself up into the air. Satine didn't have time. Lowering her back, a rocket launched from her jetpack and smashed the Acolyte in the face, killing him on impact. Satine lowered herself to the ground and pushed Poe towards the ramparts. She turned around to see the clones quickly getting into the mindset of city fighting. Their tactics and years of training were put to good use as they squatted up and began to hunt down the Sith troopers. In the middle of all of it, Plo Koon and Darth Xana were going head to head. She was quick on her feet, using her blade to try and end Plo, but even Plo wasn't trying to kill her. He told her that she could change. There was no reason to die for the cowardice Sith Empire. She was engulfed in fury. Her blade sped forward, clipping and slashing Plo's blade. His back pedal and finesse were perfect. Each counter move was calculated before she even made it. In her mind, she knew she wasn't a match for him, and he knew that too. He was hoping that she would see it before she ended up dying for no reason. That didn't come though. Her blade and her strikes got heavier and more aggressive the more time went by. Plo gave her chance after chance, but when she jabbed for her stomach, he did what he had to do. As the clones were killing the remainder of her force around her, she was hit with a three-point saber combo. Xana lost her grip on the first strike and the blade fell out of her hand. In the third one, she was slashed across the chest and dropped to the ground. As she fell, she looked at her flagship as it descended to the ground and exploded in a flash of fire. Her fight was over. The clones were able to route the survivors of the Sith Empire to the underparts of the city. That wouldn't do them well because there are some other Mandalorians throughout the city waiting for them. Sundari was a mess. Satine took off her helmet and watched as the clones sped to the gates looking for Sith troopers. Commander Wolf came up to her and asked if there were any undefended locations that needed to be checked out. Satine looked at Bo, who was quick to point out where they needed to go. Satine walked to the rubble of her city. When she was last in this position, she was just a girl. She was a new duchess after her father's death. It brought back a lot of pain for her, and she sort of stood there in a perplexed position. Thousands of her people had died, but they saved the planet. She looked at everything and felt terrible shame. However, she was much more grateful that her people fought for themselves, rather against themselves. If it was a civil war, then it would make all the death all the more worse. But these Mandalorians ensured that Mandalore would survive. Because of them, there was a future for their people. Plo Koon, after killing Darth Xana, walked over to Satine and asked her how she was doing. She told him that her only concern was her people. They would make it. But the war would bear a lot of pain for them, especially those who survived the previous war. Plo agreed, and he told her that whenever she had a chance, he would like the chance to talk to her about something. She nodded her head, and she told him to make his way to the palace. She would accompany him. Before he left, she apologized for the lack of civility. He shook his head. He applauded her for her work. He understood why there weren't such pleasantries. Plo Koon was surprised when he reached the palace to find a number of Mandalorians with blue armor standing guard outside of it. He walked past them into the halls. All the refugees had been cleared out, but their stuff still remained. Plo could hear someone yelling on and on about something, and how he's going to make her pay. When Plo walked through the doors, he saw Pre Vizsla standing in the room, holding the legendary dark saber. He was going on a tangent. The blade wasn't ignited, he was just holding it. He pointed the blade at Plo and called him Jedi scum. He demanded to know why he was here. Plo said he was waiting for the Duchess. A crazed laugh left Pre Vizsla's mouth. He said he could finally kill her and become ruler of Mandalore. Plo begged the question, asking how long that would last him. Pre hadn't gotten far, but Satine saved her people from one war and just won a second. How exactly would they accept him as their leader? Pre ignited the blade and laughed, telling Plo that he was lucky he only wanted to kill Satine, because if he wasn't saving his energy, then he would gut Plo. Plo just looked at the Mandalorian with a serious tone and told Pre that he had no intentions of being the Mandalorian ruler. This set Pre Vizsla off. Oh, so you think you could just threaten him? Plo shook his head. He said it wasn't a threat, it was a guarantee. However, he had no interest in being the Mandalorian leader again. So as it turns out, Pre Vizsla was out of luck. This pissed him off. Plo insinuating that he could just win so flawlessly made his anger rise. But he knew he couldn't play patty cake with Plo and attempt to fight Satine after. So he let it slide. His blood pressure, on the other hand, did not. Satine was across the city, not even thinking about Vizsla. Her thoughts were on her people and helping them. She wasn't wearing her helmet, but she was tending to the wounded, asking survivors and refugees if they needed anything getting an update on the people from under the city and so on. She didn't leave the front lines immediately. She did everything she could because that's what she specialized in as a leader, leading. After she was out with her people for a little while, she and Bogatan returned to the palace so that they could talk with the Jedi Master about the potential of Mandalore joining the Republic. They walked in through the doors. Satine stopped before they got to the throne room. She looked at her sister and told her that she was really glad that she was here. Both smiled and thanked Satine. From older sister to younger sister, she loved her. 
The feeling was mutual. Satine told Bo that she wanted to forget about all their time apart. She just wished that they could be sisters again. Bo smiled and nodded her head in agreement. She would like nothing more than that. Satine smiled and turned to open the door, and when she did, she looked at Pre Vizsla. He turned around with madness in his eyes. Satine asked what he was doing, and he told her that he was waiting for her. She asked why he wasn't on the front lines with his men. Pre told her that he was going to kill her so that he could become the true ruler of Mandalore. Satine was so confused, he looked like a bumbling idiot. So he came back to the palace because she wanted him to heal, and then he decided that instead of helping his people, he was more concerned about being called a leader and killing the true one. Did she get that right? He snarled. The other Mandalorians in the room looked at Satine and realized that perhaps she was right. They didn't agree with her pacifist ideology, but more than anything, that just seemed to be propaganda made by Pre Vizsla to get people to join his clan of crazed maniacs. He fed off the perception of the Duchess, and it turned it further against her. Pre ignited the dark saber and told her to face him. She shook her head. She told Pre that there would not be bloodshed shared in her throne room. Plo Koon admired her for staring into the eyes of death itself after fighting a long battle and surviving it. Bo stood up for her sister and told him that he wasn't a real Mandalorian, he was a fraud. Pre pointed the blade at her. He said after he guts her sister, he'd make her death insufferable. Bo grabbed her pistols, but Satine put her hand down. She lowered them. She told her sister not to stoop to his level. Pre told Satine that if she didn't accept the challenge, then she wouldn't be considered the true ruler of Mandalore. She refused to accept the challenge, and then he ran forward. Satine didn't buckle. She looked him dead in the eyes, and he swung violently. Bo reacted, her eyebrows shooting open, and she pulled her pistols, but it was too late. He swung, but nothing happened. Satine didn't drop to the floor. She didn't die. She didn't even blink. Pre's eyes opened after realizing that he didn't make contact. He turned his head, and Plo Koon was standing on the other side of the room, holding his hand out ever so gently before pushing him backwards. His boots slid across the ground. Pre yelled out, telling the Jedi he had enough of this. Why don't we see how tough the Jedi is without the Force? Satine snapped. She knew he wouldn't stop unless he was stopped. She demanded that Vizsla stop what he was doing. He egged her on, begging the question, or else. Satine grabbed the sword that belonged to her father. Bo looked at her and shook her head. Pre had so much more experience fighting than she did. Satine nodded her head. She told her sister that no matter what happens, Mandalore is ready for a stronger future. They were united, and that's all they needed. She was willing to die if it meant that her people could be united. Bo asked what she meant, and then it clicked when she saw the look of determination in her sister's eyes. Satine didn't believe she could win, but she believed Bo could. The keys to the kingdom were hers, and if Satine lost, then Bo could challenge Vizsla, take the blade from him, and become the Mandalore. Bo shook her head. She pleaded with her sister. Satine ignited the weapon and told Pre Vizsla that she challenged him for the Darksaber. He grinned. He turned back around and looked at the Duchess. This would be too easy. How pathetic. How could she think that she could beat him? The two of them looked at each other. Satine closed her eyes. She was a kid again. Her father was standing across from her. He told her that he wasn't going to go easy on her. She smiled slightly and told him that she wouldn't go easy on him, old man. When Satine opened her eyes, she looked at Previsa. His jetpack ignited and he leapt forward with full speed. Satine quickly defended herself as she dipped to the ground. He glided over her head, swiping and knocking a small lock of hair from her head. It was egregious. How could he do that? Visa landed and ran forward. All of his rage, resentment, and anger showed as he swiped. Satine knew it would be impossible to match him blow for blow, so she avoided him. He swung heavily, and the blade slammed into the ground. She ducked back as he swung forward. Each step she took, he was more off balance. Satine used her grapple on her armor and shot it around his legs. He cut the wire, but as he did, he toppled over it. She didn't go for the kill. It wasn't in her nature. If she could win, it'd be through his own mistake. Satine let Vizsla rise to his feet, and he demanded yelling that she fight back, but she refused. He swung viciously forward, and she slipped away, the darksaber clashing off her chest plate. She kicked her leg forward, catching him in the stomach, but with the armor on, it was almost an inconvenience. He pushed forward, trying for anything, but as he did, he lost grip on the darksaber. He wasn't going to play nice. He pulled out his pistols and shot forward. Satine quickly opened a shield that sat from her wrist, similar to Bo's armor, and defended herself until Vizsla got the blade and leapt up into the air. His jetpack aided him, and as he sat high in the air above the Duchess, he swung down. Satine saw her opportunity. She flung her mother's pistol into the air as it smacked Vizsla in the head, and he lost focus. His neck slammed backwards, and Satine threw her blade upwards and put her arm over her head to protect herself. She had reason to believe this would work. Vizsla slammed down on her saber. His torso was pierced. He landed directly on the soft spot within his armor. He raged. He was angry. He slipped off the blade and swung around violently. As Satine, just as shocked as anyone else, backpedaled away. Vizsla did just as she hoped he would beat himself. While he was dying, he continued swinging violently as a means to hopefully kill her or something. It didn't matter. 
he was losing consciousness, and he slipped to the ground and told her that she would never be Mandalore. She looked down with shame. She extinguished her blade and held it. The dark saber rolled out of Vizsla's hands, and his pulse went lifeless in front of everyone. Satine knelt down to his side and whispered an old Mandalorian saying in the old language as a way to hopefully give him peace in the afterlife. The Mandalorians chanted Satine's name, and they began to kneel. Satine put her hand up. She told them all that she may have won, but they did not have to kneel to her as such. Her victory was a victory for Mandalore. She reached down and held the Darksaber in the same hand with her father's blade. Bo came to her sister's side and told her that she was the Mandalore. Satine nodded her head. She knew that, but it didn't matter to her. The Darksaber was nothing but an artifact. To hold it didn't mean anything other than she could hold it aside from the other blade that she already had. Satine took a deep breath. She said that her wound probably opened up again. She smiled at her sister and Bo smiled back. They did it. Satine turned her attention to Plo, who was walking up to her. She asked the Jedi Master about what potential the Mandalorians had of having consistent Republic assistance. He told her that consistent Republic assistance was unlikely. However, there was an initiative he wanted to talk to her about. She nodded her head and listened to him as he explained the goal and platforms in the space stations the Republic was constructing. It was at the very least a frontline defense. And he suggested that with the Mandalorians finally united, they likely wouldn't have any trouble with fighting off the Sith again. She smiled, but they both knew the truth. Darth Xana wasn't the top of the Sith ranks, and her death only made a target for Mandalore that much larger. Satine asked Plo to come over to the briefing table they'd set up in the throne room, and she asked about where the Republic was going or what their strategy was. Bo stood side by side with her sister as they listened to the Jedi Master convey the plan. They weren't looking to just recapture planets, but they were also looking for a legendary weapon. Satine placed her hands on the table, releasing the grip of her father's blade and the Darksaber as she asked what they were looking for. Plo told her that it was called the Starforge. Truthfully, the Starforge and Mandalorians were related in some way, but like many other cultures across the galaxy, they kept it a secret. Well, not they, someone far down the line in Clan Kree's. Satine said that the secret of the weapon was passed down from generation to generation, but she never learned of it. Her father told her that someday he would tell her, but not the day. She believed it was something she would learn on her 18th birthday, which was ironically true, but never came to fruition. Plo asked her if she had any information regarding the Starforge. Satine shook her head, expressing that if she did, hold on, ancient weapon? Well, it's perhaps possible the sword given to her by her father had the answers. Plo looked down at the weapon, as did Satine and Bo. There were engravings all across it, and some of those engravings were hieroglyphics. At the base of the sword, there was a circular section that had four wings on it. Plo asked if she'd ever tried to open that particular piece. She shook her head, but she pulled it up to her face and read a small translated piece. It seemed that over the years, as the language changed from Old Mandalorian to Galactic Common, her family made sure it was legible for whoever needed to know. Satine twisted the circular piece and the weapon vibrated it, and so she dropped it. In front of the three of them, the blade transformed. The blade became less sharp and extended. There were uneven pieces on it, and at the top of it was a small sphere-like object. It lit with a blue haze, the same color as Clan Kree's. Plo asked her if she understood any of it. Satine looked over it. Through all of her years of learning and dedication to learning the people's language, even this was too far back for her to understand. She read through it and picked up on a couple letters. It seemed as if there was a planet with the name L on it, or maybe there was a star system. She wasn't sure. It was all too difficult to decipher. She flipped it over and read through what seemed to be a step-by-step -step instruction for it. Or she couldn't really actually tell, honestly. Plo told her that he understood the weapon belonged to her family. Before he could finish what he was going to say, she handed it to him. If the Republic was trying to find the Star Forge, there wasn't any time to waste. Satine brought Plo with her. She said that she had a number of drives that had information on it. She could try and decipher it for him, and Plo told her that it would likely be easier for the Jedi Archivist to go through the drives she provided and see if they could find anything. She agreed and quickly retrieved them. She asked Master Plo if there was anything she or her people could do for the Republic, and he shook his head. Plo told her that she and Mandalore have already done so much. They provided a light to the galaxy, one that hadn't been seen since the fall of Coruscant. With an individual planet being able to stand up to the Sith, others would rally. Of course, Mandalore now had a target on his head, but they would be ready. Satine told Plo that she was grateful for his assistance, and his response to their call for help. He told her that they did all the work, he just cleaned up what they had left. They bowed to each other, and Plo took the sword and the drives with him. The Republic wouldn't fully vacate from the planet. Plo would leave behind two Venators and a couple support ships until the Golden Platform was completed. For Satine, she took the Darksaber and brought it before her people. She told them that the weapon wasn't a sign of leadership. It was a symbol, and it was an ancient relic. She was with her people. They would rebuild Mandalore, as they had before. They would be prepared for the Sith if they came again. And they would continue to inspire people around the galaxy. Bo stood by her sister's side and looked on with pride. Satine raised the blade over her head and told her people that they were Mandalorians. They would never go silently. They were victorious, 
She then reminded them to stay strong. What came next would be arduous, but they would make it. As the teen said this, a chant began. It started from members of Death Watch, but it crept its way through the crowd. Young and old, Mandalorian and refugee. They all chanted out one word, calling Satine what she always was and forever would be, the Mandalore. Our season continues instead of a Jedi cruiser, or in other words, Venator class Star Destroyer outfitted for Jedi training. The Venator was one of five inside of a fleet that was being dispatched to Malastare. The best part about this fleet is that it was outfitted with all shinies. That was a term used by the clones given to each other, meaning clones or group of clones that hadn't seen active combat yet. Truthfully, no one a part of this division had seen any combat. They were all fresh off Kamino. Their group of newer faces in the group. Initially, this group was a part of a defense fleet not far from Ahch 2, but it was time they were being dispatched to the front lines. Another planet crumbled away from the Separatist, due to their battle droids not being entirely efficient against its troopers, acolytes, and such. The leader of this group of clones was Commander Cody, and in charge of the fleet was Admiral Coburn. The fleet awaited the arrival of the Jedi Generals and Commanders. The Admiral stood on deck and watched the Republic shuttle enter his vessel and the hangar bay doors close behind him. Coburn instructed the deck to prepare for a launch into hyperspace. He called down to the hangar bay as Skywalker and Morden met up with Commander Cody for the first time. He pulled up his wrist and spoke into it as Admiral Coburn asked the Jedi Generals if they were ready to launch towards their next destination. Anakin looked to Natabre and she did the same to him. In one moment, they both nodded their heads before turning back to Cody, who relayed the orders back to the bridge. Admiral Coburn quickly responded by turning to his deck officers and issuing out the orders to jump the hyperspace. Down in the hangar bay, Commander Cody continued introducing himself to the two Jedi and asking if they'd been aboard a Jedi cruiser yet. They shook their heads and he asked if they would like a tour of the vessel until they arrived at Malastare. Natabre, who was still much more by the books than Anakin, was immediately ready to take up the offer. She could tell that Cody was more of a by the books commander, which would be great for her. Not that she had any reason to believe that there were any clones that weren't by the book. Anakin looked over as she walked over to Cody's side and asked if it was true that Jedi cruisers were outfitted with Jedi training arenas. Cody nodded his head and told her that he could show them the way. Anakin took a deep breath. He turned back and looked at the two students. Ahsoka and Zala weren't all familiar with each other and hardly said a word to each other as they were transported to the vessel. Their interactions with each other were brief and Ahsoka had the same assumption about Zala as everyone else did. She was an aggressive student. Why did she get poor the Jedi Master before anyone else? When Anakin looked back at the two students, they were looking up in awe at the vessel they were in. It rocked a little bit before it blasted off in the hyperspace. Both Padawans had a gut reaction to it that set Anakin off a little bit. It didn't make sense, but then he thought for a moment. He realized that the last time they were in hyperspace, they were surrounded by a number of children, and the Order had just been lost on Coruscant. Anakin walked up and asked them if they were alright. The wonder in their eyes had vanished, and a terror surfaced. He distracted them by getting them to look over at Natabre and Cody as they walked away. The distraction worked, sort of, but it made Anakin realize that he may not be ready for this as he once thought he would be. He watched the two of them get their way over to the two leaders. Anakin caught up and listened as Cody told them that the boys would be ready for anything that they came across. Natabre was inquisitive, asking questions wherever she could, just so she could get a read on everything that was going on. Zala took a liking to her master immediately. Though it was hard for her, aside from her protective outbursts, she was too timid to ask questions or anything. It wasn't easy for her unless she was doing it for someone that wasn't herself. While Zala was shadowing behind Natabre, Ahsoka and Anakin were walking side by side. There was a lot of room for a relationship to be fostered here, but they had to understand each other. As it turns out, Ahsoka was a lot like Anakin, and you'd have to struggle through what Obi-Wan had to go through. At the moment, it wasn't easy to see that. There wasn't a war unfolding around them, and they were just focused on getting to know the layout of where they were. Moments into their walk, Cody would show them where their rooms were. The generals, commanders, captains, admirals, and so forth had a position in this hallway. It was close to everything. They could easily get to the bridge via an elevator, which was right down the hall, and the prize of the vessel, which was right over there where the Jedi training room was. Cody led the Jedi into the massive hall. Ahsoka and Zala followed their teachers in, and they looked up at its great magnitude. It was significantly better than anything they had on Octu, which made them feel good about the prospect of their training. Ahsoka was ready to go. She was antsy, and Anakin had to tell her to calm her jets. There was no reason to get ahead of anything. He liked her energy, but the time for training would come. While Anakin didn't agree with their whole poor thing, he was willing to humor it because he and Natabre were generals together. They had to act as one force, and he understood that. At least he thought he did. Natabre and Cody were really on the same wavelength. The by-the-book understanding of everything worked well between the two of them, and she was grateful for his demeanor. Once the tour was over, Natabre and Anakin regrouped and decided it was time for their first instruction with their students. The Padawans were sent to the training room. Ahsoka ran there, Zala walked there, and the two masters talked for a moment in solitude. 
They had the same thoughts and the same fears. Could they really do this? Zala and Ahsoka were both 14 years old. These two masters weren't far removed from that. Latabra was 18 and Anakin was 19. They had to be adults, and be adults really quickly. The growing up process during a war could be very difficult, and they had to be ready to be grown up. When the two teachers arrived in the training hall, Ahsoka seemed the most excited, and Zala stood quietly next to her. Anakin asked if Natabre would like to take the first instruction. She smiled and nodded her head, walking forward and calling both of their names. She told them that this was their first exercise and it would be one of speed, focus, and precision. Anakin stepped back and allowed Natabre to take the mantle. She was in a teacher favorite lesson, at least the one she liked the most from her teacher. She told the two students to be ready. They would need their lightsabers, but it wouldn't be revealed when they would need to use their weapons. She turned back and nodded at Anakin, and the two of them made their way to the command room. A couple of clones were standing in there and asked if the Jedi needed any assistance with the training simulations. They thanked the clones but said they didn't need anything at the moment. Natabre walked up to the console and flipped a couple switches before turning her attention to a speaker. She spoke into it, asking the Padawans to be ready. As Ahsoka and Zala readied themselves, the training segment began. The walls opened up and began moving around. Natabre said it for two Padawans, so there would be double walls, double obstacles, and everything for each student. Natabre knew this would be very challenging, but she wanted it that way. If it wasn't, then there would be no purpose in training them. It would be especially difficult since there weren't such facilities on Ahch 2, so they weren't at all used to using such structures in their training. Asuka was quick on her feet, but there was something Anakin noticed immediately about his student. She was impatient, she was jumping things early, and she was almost throwing herself off because of that which at the same time proved to be throwing Zala off of her focus as well. Natabre watched her student and realized that Zala was being far too timid for her own good. Natabre could relate to this in some way, but her loyalty to the code and her by-the-book nature didn't make her a formerly timid student. Natabre wasn't quite Anakin, but closer to Ahsoka when she was their age. There was obviously something she would have to teach her student, and for Anakin it became readily obvious that he would have to play the Obi-Wan in this scenario. But as he watched his student in Natabre's, he couldn't help but think of his master. Obi-Wan would have been so proud of him, and thanks to what Satine had said, he knew that it was likely true forever that Obi-Wan would be proud of him. He would have to keep working at himself and his new role as a teacher. After around 30 minutes of arduous training, including lightsaber training, the session ended, and Natabre and Anakin descended from the command room. Ahsoka had her hands on her knees taking in deep breaths, and Zala was standing silently, trying to seem as if she wasn't tired. It wasn't her trying to act tough, it was just her timidness, trying to keep herself quiet so she didn't look fragile or something. Not that anyone would judge her anyways. Natabre came in first, and since this was her lesson, she told both of them that they had done well. She turned back to Anakin and suggested that he would probably like to have some words or one-on-one -on -one time with the student, and he nodded. She asked Zala to come with her. She was planning on allowing Anakin to have the training room to himself and Ahsoka. Natabre knew Anakin. He would likely run Ahsoka through the gauntlet. Natabri, on the other hand, wanted to understand why her student was acting so timid with a track record like the one she possessed. Natabri wanted to take a slower approach with her student, so as she and Zala exited the training room, Anakin looked down at his student and told her his thoughts. He expressed that she lacked patience, and she was in dire need of it. Her focus wasn't exactly there either. Ahsoka challenged Anakin and said that she was focused. This is when Anakin realized that his penance for being such a troublesome student to Obi-Wan was about to bite him in the back. She had the same temper as he did, well, not as much of a temper. How did Obi-Wan deal with him? Anakin snapped back to the moment and told her that she needed to get a better grip on what it was that she was supposed to be doing. And she challenged him again, asking what that was, and he told her to run the practice room again. She questioned him, still catching her breath, and he told her that she was going to run it again, no matter what. This time, she needed to take her time. While Zala wouldn't be here with her, she had to act like she was. Ahsoka questioned him, but he walked out of the room without answering. Moments later, she learned that the practice would be the exact same one as before, set for two students, while there was only one in the room. Of course, with Skywalker, nothing was ever straightforward, so he made sure it was as challenging as he could set it, which for him was below what he wanted to do. It'd be fine. He could make up for it in due time when he was doing his own instruction. As Ahsoka ran the gauntlet that her master set up for her, Zala and Natabre walked through the halls of the Venator. The Tabri told her student that she wanted her to feel like she could be as transparent as she wanted with her, and even Master Skywalker as well. Zala was genuinely confused. She asked what her master meant, and the two of them stopped in the middle of the hallway and scooted out of the way as a couple of clones came down their direction. The Tabri mentioned that Zala was apparently a troublesome youngling, always starting fights and engaging in some sort of conflict. Zala shook her head and asked her master if that's really what she thought of her. The Tabri's eyebrows moved up her head as shock and worry covered her face. She asked Zala what she meant. 
Her student turned to her and said that she wasn't ever the agitator. A frown covered her face and she told her master that she, she just wanted to be alone. Natabri reached out her hand but her student quickly turned her back and shuffled away. Zala eventually found her room and broke down inside. Her struggles as a youngling seemingly hadn't come to an end. Zala believed that her master would be able to see that she wasn't what she was always portrayed to be, but it seemed as if she could only be seen as an agitator and a bad Jedi. The Tabre kind of stood in the middle of the hallway and looked around. She thought that she was being honest and transparent with her student, but apparently she wasn't getting something right. Was Zala afraid to be seen as a hostile Jedi or was she ashamed of it? The Tabre didn't want her to feel bad, she was just trying to help her through this. Truthfully, she believed that Zala was a troubled youngling, and that she needed guidance to become a better Jedi. It's why she assumed Zala was assigned to her. The Tabra made her way back to the training course to see Ahsoka going through her third run in a row. Anakin was pushing her to her limits, and at the end of it, she collapsed and fell down at the end of the training simulation. Anakin walked down to find the Tabra walking towards the training room. She had been to the bridge and pretty much everywhere else in the ship until she decided it was possibly time to confide in her friend for advice on the matter. She followed Anakin in, who told Ahsoka she did well. Her focus was on point, but the speed wasn't. Ahsoka threw a fit. She told Anakin that it was unreasonable to ask this of her. No one could do this this many times. Anakin crossed his arms and told her that she was limiting herself with that kind of thought. Ahsoka threw her hands up in the air and asked why he was demanding perfection. Anakin told her that he wasn't demanding perfection. He was demanding that she push herself so that she could survive. It was a war. She had to be ready for anything. She looked at Natabre like she would save her from this. But Natabre didn't budge, she just looked at Ahsoka and let her master teach her in his own personal style. Once Anakin gave her the rest of her instruction regarding focus and survival, specifically, he told her that she should go and get some rest, so that she was ready for whatever came when they arrived at Malastare. Ahsoka looked at Anakin and then to Natabre again, before bowing to her master and leaving the room. Anakin asked where Zala was after Ahsoka left the room, and Natabre said that's why she was here. She told him that Zala didn't like being asked about her past as an agitator, according to the records. She seemed to have a breakdown of sorts, but she didn't know how to handle it. Of course, Natabre had plenty of experience dealing with emotions, as she and Anakin shared a number of moments of vulnerability during the previous weeks. She told Anakin that maybe she said the wrong words, but she wanted his thoughts on the matter. Anakin asked if there was anything in particular, and truthfully, Natabre said that she just wanted to know about Zala's past and help her with it. She said that maybe she was assuming too much or saying the wrong words. Perhaps Natabre said maybe she should listen instead of speak. Anakin nodded his head, saying that maybe that would do Zala better. It was possible, though there was no guarantee until she tried. Natabre thanked Anakin and prepared to leave. He stopped her before she left. He asked her what her thoughts were on the training of their students. Natabre said that she thought it was well, but Anakin had some other thoughts on it. He told Natabre that they were going to be engulfed in the war again. He suggested that their tactics as teachers should be more unorthodox. Natabre tilted her head in an interested but reserved way, which Anakin continued. He said that the students needed to be pushed further than they already were. It was a matter of life and death, and if it was treated anything lesser than that, it could inevitably cost their lives. Natabre told Anakin that she agreed to a degree, but she didn't want their students to lose something that was so integral about being a Jedi. It wouldn't be worth losing that. Anakin saw where she was coming from but he told her to remember their fight on Tython. If they weren't prepared for it, then they would have died. Latabri told Anakin that they survived it because of each other. No amount of training could have saved them in that moment, or prepared them for a Sith Lord. The same would be true for their students, because despite the nature of war, they had brothers in the clones and they would have their teachers. Ahsoka and Zala wouldn't be the ones to face the Sith. It'd be the two of them. Anakin saw her point. They wanted to keep training the students together, but they should really consider the intensity of such training. If they threw everything at their students, they could strip them of what remained of their innocence. They weren't just soldiers, they were children. Everyone was, even the two of them. Several hours later, Natabre would be able to find Zala and apologize to her. She expressed that she didn't mean to come off so judgy, she just wanted to understand more about her. Zala looked at her master and offered an apology of her own. She told Natabre that it was her fault, and there was no reason for Natabre to blame herself. Natabre shook her head. She told her student that it was her responsibility to understand her student and to help her. Zala said that it wasn't true. None of it was true. She was clearly upset again, and Natabre asked what wasn't true, not realizing that Zala picked up on the previous conversation right where it left off. She told her master the truth about her accusations and the ridicule she'd received from the higher ups inside the order. Natabre twisted her head and listened as Zala continued and told her master that she wasn't responsible for it. She was trying to help. Older kids would pick on younger kids, and she would step in. She was only trying to help them, and she got accused of being the bully. 
The Tabre watched Zala's heart fall into her stomach as she spoke. Zala just wanted to be a good Jedi, but she was constantly being called the worst of the Jedi. She didn't want to disappoint her master, but because of her quiet nature, she didn't know how to break the ice and express it to her. The Tabre told Zala that she believed in her and trusted her. The Tabre didn't want her student to feel alone in any of this, and Zala smiled. She was relieved that her master believed in her. The Tabre waved her student over and wrapped her arm around her shoulder and told her that she never believed the accusations anyways. Zala asked why, and the Tabre told her that she was way too quiet to be a bully. Zala let out a little giggle, and the Tabre smiled as she asked her student to come along with her. The two of them would continue to flourish their growth over a small lightsaber training inside the training facilities. At the same time, Ahsoka was in a comatose state of existence. She was completely wiped out by Anakin's training. Anakin, on the other hand, was located on the bridge standing next to Admiral Coburn. The two of them were discussing strategy and what they would expect. Anakin truthfully had no clue where he was going. He just knew that he was looking for artifacts that could take him to the legendary Star Forge. That seemed to be the most important thing, and so while the battlefront needed to be won, he was looking for a means to get to the legendary weapon. Admiral Coburn was explaining everything to Anakin about the CIS flanks and how they were falling apart. As it turns out, the Separatists under Admiral Trench were fantastic. They had a foothold around Genosis and their other Foundry planets. On the other hand, all the Boundary planets were either winning or getting crushed. The main thing saving the Separatists was the number of battle droids they could release. Admiral Coburn told Skywalker that there were just simply too many strategies for the battle droids to try and follow, and they couldn't pick up on the accurate Sith fleet or Legion when they attacked, so they were being beat by strategy alone. Anakin asked how the Republic would fare against either or, and the Admiral smiled, telling Anakin that they were superior strategists. As Cody walked into the room, Coburn smiled and told Anakin that they were also superior warriors. Cody stepped up to the console in the middle of the room and asked how far along they were until their arrival. Coburn admitted that it shouldn't be more than an hour. He was currently preparing the fleet strategy. They had five Venators plus a number of support vessels that could be utilized heavily during the battle. Skywalker listened in. Eventually, Natabri and Zala would enter the command deck, and shortly after them, Ahsoka, who was still sore from her training. Zala was of course sore, but without the extra rounds, she was doing alright. When they arrived, chaos ensued. Admiral Coburn realized that they were outgunned. Over the orbit of Malastare, there was an entire Separatist fleet, which was reduced to garbage. The Sith fleet was sitting in the middle of it, and a number of dropships were exiting from the capital ships. Admiral Coburn noted it, and told the two Jedi. The Tabre jumped the gun. She told Coburn to focus on the fleet battle. If they could get some support to the ground, they would do it. Coburn nodded his head. He moved up to the front of the bridge as the communications opened up between the several vessels and the fleet. A couple of support ships sat on standby as Coburn directed the fleet into position. Commander Cody followed the Jedi as they made their way to the hangar bay. Anakin and Atabre were pacing around with each other in the front of the pack. She told Anakin that her and Zala would lead an assault on the ground. He smiled and told her that it was a great idea. As they entered the hangar bay, they told each other to have the force be with them as they crisscrossed each other. Ahsoka followed her master, and the two of them picked up their pace from a fast walk into a run. Anakin told Ahsoka to fall closely behind him. Skywalker jumped into his yellow starfighter, and Ahsoka jumped into her own. On the other side of the bay, the Tabre jumped into a green one and her student followed suit. Skywalker and Ahsoka were the first out. They led a group of V-19s out of the hangar bay. The other Venators released waves of fighters. A couple of light frigates piloted forward as Republic light cruisers opened up with fire from their long-range cannons. The Sith Empire was getting into range. Skywalker took complete point and the flak started to settle in. Ahsoka was behind her master as he piloted like a madman into active combat. Sith fighters began to engage as the capital ships entered the combat range and opened up against each other. Out of the hangar bay came an array of fighters following behind Natabre and Zala. Alongside them were gunships with Commander Cody on the interior of one of them. Admiral Coburn noted that everything was going as planned as he moved the capital ships closer. The Sith fleet had more vessels, but they were weaker than the five Venators. If he pressed hard enough, which is what Skywalker was doing already, he could take advantage of them nearly being out of position. Coburn was actively holding his Y-Wings in reserve, so he could release them close to the fleet. At this rate, the heavy bombers could avoid active combat with Sith fighters. Anakin's aggressive approach would liberate the bombers from potential danger. The Y-Wings would be able to rip apart the vessels once their shields were down. Skywalker and Tano were making an effective push against the Sith forces. The fighter fight was already going extremely well. Inside of the atmosphere, Natabri piloted down through the clouds to find the remaining dropships landing on the outside of the city and on the planet's surface. Natabri noted that they were trying to take the civilians as hostages, as she radioed it over to Cody that they needed to be careful upon their landing. As LAATs landed on the ground, the fighter support ripped through the landing craft. Not everything was grounded as they did. Several Sith transports were destroyed, reducing the troop count for the Sith. 
Matabri ripped her ship back and told the fighters to make sure they controlled the skies for Commander Cody. She then radioed over to Zala and asked if she was hanging in. While Zala was consistently quiet, she showed some step in her voice. She had some life. Matabri smiled. She was glad to see that her student was embracing this. When the LATs dropped to the ground, the Shinies were entered into the first real combat of the war. Some may say it was just like the simulations. Others might say nothing could have prepared them for the war they faced. Natavri made it extremely clear to Cody to inform her if there was any sign of Sith Marauders or Acolytes. He understood the orders and he led his men into combat. Anakin, on the other hand, was engaged in an intense dogfight. A Sith Acolyte was chasing him down in a starfighter. Skywalker broke off in the main group, which meant that Ahsoka was pretty much taking charge, which wasn't entirely true. She was just guiding them as she did the same thing Anakin did, though she wasn't happy about him breaking off unannounced. Skywalker was just keeping this acolyte away from the men so that he could take him out alone. Skywalker's being chased as blaster bolts crushed into the side of Sith vessels, and Anakin narrowly pulled away from them. The acolyte was actively trying to kill the Jedi that seemed to be the lead of the operation. At the same time, a wing of fighters barreled out of the hangar bays, with Sith dropships filing out after them. Ahsoka saw it, and she decided that she had one moment to make a choice. If she led the men away from the directive, it could be terrible, but she also didn't want Natabre or Zala to get blindsided. Ahsoka thought quickly, blasting through a fighter and then dividing up the squadron. Half continued their route as the rest followed Ahsoka when she flipped to the right and followed the Sith dropships. Skywalker under the hand blasted a ship through a hole in the hull of a damaged CIS frigate, and the Acolyte followed him in. Anakin pulled out the other side of the hole, and when he did, he cut the engines in his vessel and slammed his hand against the wall and slid the ship around, grabbing its handle and twisting it as hard as he could. It spun quickly and his fingers landed on the trigger. The acolyte who was coming out of the hole in the ship was completely vaporized in the explosion. The blast ripped him apart. Inside of the atmosphere, Natabre and Zala got a warning. Two actually at the same time. There was a marauder on the ground and Cody needed help. The Sith was ripping through clones and cutting down support vessels. Natabre told Zala that she needed to be ready for this. Without a hint of fear in her voice, she said that she could do it. Zala pulled back and Tabri broke off from the fighters. She piloted down towards the city and looked for the clones. She found them and told her Ashmech to continue piloting the vessel. The Tabri grabbed her lightsaber from her belt and opened the cockpit window and jumped out the side. The wind blasted her in her face and she sped down to the surface of the planet. The Tabri pinned her arms to her sides so she could gain speed and when she looked up, the city streets were coming quickly towards her. The Tabri used the force to slow herself down which created a massive shockwave, moving bricks from the ground and tossing them into Sith troopers. Turns out there was a small resistance of B1s on the ground. The clones were fighting two enemies, but their enemies were also fighting two enemies. It was one of, if not the first sign of this war becoming an all-out battle royale. The Tabra ignited her lightsaber and blocked a couple shots, and looked for her men. Skywalker grouped up with the rest of his squadron in space, while Admiral Coburn continued his assault. It was working to perfection. The Sith fleet was crumbling, and it didn't even stand a legitimate chance against the Republic. Their strategy was just too perfect. Coburn told Skywalker that they had everything handled if he wanted to assist the ground invasion. Anakin thanked the Admiral before taking his wing of fighters down to the surface. Ahsoka's pursuit was stalled when the fighters turned back on them and a dogfight began in the clouds. Zala, on the other hand, sped her ship towards the dropships, but because she was fighting through the clouds, she was clipped by a dropship. They collided and her wing was inoperable, and Zala panicked while her ship spiraled out of control towards the surface of the planet. Zala was trying to grab the controls to steady herself, but it wasn't working. She looked over the wing and realized it was completely compromised as the ace pilot from the squad broke off to follow her down to the surface. He told her that her vessel was losing airspace. She needed to get out of the ship now. Zala's panic came to an end when she heard the clone trooper's voice come over the radio. She had to get out of her head. She grabbed the handle and pulled it. The cockpit wouldn't budge. The systems were too badly damaged. The clouds began to disappear, and she could see that they were spiraling towards the city. Zala held her breath. The sight terrified her, but she ignited her weapon, blasting the cockpit window off of the ship. She told her Ashmech to be ready, and the droid popped itself up, and the two of them escaped the ship before rocketing down into the side of a mountain outside the city. Zala jumped onto her droid and held onto it as its rocket boosters slowly piloted them down to the surface. The fun didn't end there as one of the few remaining wings of starfighters came out of nowhere. Zala saw it and yelped. The ace pilot flew down and got in the way, sacrificing himself as his V-19 was blasted to pieces in front of her. She cried out the pilot's name. His vessel descended to the surface in a bundle of flames. Ahsoka sped out of the clouds, chasing the wing of fighters. She could see Zala holding onto her Ashmech for dear life. The clones who were behind Ahsoka could see as well, and they quickly reacted, blasting away the Sith fighters who broke away from Zala. On the surface, 
The Tabri rounded a corner to see her men pushing forward. At the front of the lines was Commander Cody, who despite the Marauder was pushing forward. The Sith came around the corner, throwing an ATRT into a wall, crushing it and killing the trooper inside. Cody stopped in his tracks and held his hand over his head when the Sith started to strike at him. The Tabri's Emerald lightsaber exploded in front of his eyes, blocking the Crimson Blade. The Marauder noticed Natabre immediately. She was on the hit list of Jedi to kill. He muttered to himself, telling her that this would be all too easy. When he killed her, he would be rewarded highly. Natabre slipped her robes off to make sure she had as much acrobatic range with her tunings as possible, before smirking at the Marauder. She told him that if she was too easy, then surely he wouldn't struggle. This was the right choice of words because it pissed off the Marauder just enough to get him to rush forward. His blade slammed into hers and she smiled at him. Not for nothing, he had nothing on Scion. She spun around and used her finesse to her advantage. Her blade slammed up against a Marauder and she could see that there was a blaster wound in his left shoulder. He was using his hate and anger to block it out, but it would be the perfect place to strike. The Tabri spun under a strike he made before giving herself some space. She jabbed forward and caught him in the wrist and he pulled back, flipping the blade into a less dominant hand. She threw her elbow into his left shoulder, which turned out was the right one. Her lefts and rights were a little mixed, but it didn't matter. It worked out the way it needed to. The Marauder stumbled back and she slashed across his chest and he flopped to the ground. The Tavri backed her lightsaber up to her face and blocked a shot from the remaining troopers. Cody thanked her and she just smiled at him. The two of them pushed forward. Zala was able to safely land on the ground and the two Jedi in the sky finished the rest of the reinforcements. The battle was over within minutes of the death of the Marauder. The Tavri was proud of herself, but her style needed some more personality. She was formed too, but she was a long ways away from being as developed as she would even like to be. Skywalker wouldn't land on the ground, and neither would Ahsoka. They would reposition themselves on the bridge of Admiral Coburn's flagship. Natabri was fine with it, because she and Zala were making sure the citizens of the city were safe, and that all the forces from either the Separatists or the Sith Empire had been dealt with. As it turns out, it seemed like it all was dealt with. Before returning to the ship, Zala told her master that she was sorry for failing her part of the mission. Natabri made sure that her student didn't need to apologize. But Zala told her master that the ace pilot, Scarce, he sacrificed himself for her. She nodded her head and told her that the war would take a lot from them. They had to be resilient. A similar conversation was happening on the bridge of the Venator between Ahsoka and Anakin. She felt bad because a couple of her men died when she took control. Anakin reassured her, but also took the blame for the situation, reminding her that he was in command. But she should be prepared. When she was given a chance to lead, that was a responsibility she would have to endure. Ahsoka told her master that she didn't want to lead if that was the case, and he told her that regardless of that, she would have to at some point or another. He didn't want her to feel bad about it, but the day would come when she'd have to take command of her own men and watch them die under her command. She was upset at the notion, but he told her that she'd be able to handle it. Both masters informed their students that as the time came, the time for them to be leaders, that they would help them through it. They'd make sure that they weren't alone. Zala also did express some anxieties about being in another dogfight in the sky. She didn't see it coming. The Tybra comforted her student and told her that in due time she'd be able to sense while she focused. When they returned to the fleet, she would help her with that. Instead of the Venator, Skywalker realized that they weren't out of it yet. He contacted Natabre and told her that they needed to evacuate the ground immediately. There was a group of reinforcements coming. Natabre asked how many. Anakin said that they weren't sure, but they definitely would appreciate it if they could get the troops off the ground. Natabre told the men to round themselves up and get to the LAATs. She turned around to Zala and told her that their lesson would have to wait. She'd have to be strong now, because she would be forced out of her comfort zone again. Zala looked at her master as she ushered her to the LAAT. She realized the severity of this war, and how she would have to adapt in the most difficult situations, such as those she didn't want to be a part of. Our season continues inside of a number of LAATs, where Zala and her Ashmech stood side by side with Commander Cody. He was silent, and so were the men around her. She stood with her eyes closed, feeling through the Force, practicing what her master had said to her, before Master Skywalker requested them to the bridge. The sound of the LAAT rang through her ears. Her master and a wing of starfighters were situated right outside the ground troops as they ascended through the atmosphere. Zala could feel it, the pressure of everything changing as they left the planet itself and entered space. Her hand was holding onto the hooks that hung from the ceiling when she felt the chill roll down her spine. It was space. No, it was something else. She called out to the men inside the dropship telling them to hold on. The Sith Empire arrived at hyperspace. General Skywalker and a squad of starfighters exited the Venators to provide cover fire for the LAATs. Natabre pulled back and her squad followed her. The starships from the Sith Empire found themselves in a bit of a bind. While Admiral Coburn and General Skywalker believed that the fleet that arrived would be aggressive, they were surprised when they saw that it was far from. The fleet that arrived was just a support fleet full of transports. The entire purpose of this fleet was to ensure the Sith had control of a Malastare. The Acolyte and Marauder that were sent here requested their reinforcements after the Separatist fleet was destroyed. 
and they happened to arrive after the Sith Empire had been defeated. The whole thing was convoluted. The Republic was here because they got reports of the Separatist fleet caving in, which was entirely true. And then of course the dynamic between the Sith Empire and the CIS, it was just a mess. Skywalker called on the bridge of the flagship, to which he told the Admiral they needed to make a push. Coburn was already on it. He told Skywalker to press forward. The light cruisers would be joining him. Anakin pushed the throttle in as his squad pushed their V-19s to keep up with Skywalker. Zala and her men were able to get back inside the interior of the respective vessels, while the Republic capital ships pressed their engines forward and lowered their shields so they could begin the open fire at maximum ability. It was a potential risk, but with the fragility of the Sith vessels, there wasn't really any risk. The largest ships in their fleet were support frigates, which were smaller than the Republic Arquentin's class light cruisers that were currently supporting the fleet, that is. The main point Admiral Coburn was trying to make was that they needed to wipe out the vessels before they escaped. It didn't take too long, especially with Skywalker leading the charge, to rip the fleet into screws and bolts. The Republic wasn't messing around, and Skywalker leading them made it abundantly clear to the Sith Empire that there was no surrender and there was no mercy. Perhaps that wasn't the Jedi way, and it's something that Natabri took a note of, but she didn't see it as a reflection of the dark side within Anakin. She'd already seen that, and this was not that. Once the fleet rallied up all of its vessels and promptly secured Malastare, Skywalker, Morden, Tano, and Isisia made their way to the bridge. Commander Cody and Admiral Coburn were of course there as well. Anakin told the command deck that he believed that they had a real opportunity to expand the front lines of the Republic. This initially confused the commanders on deck, but he explained himself. He told them that he believed they could bounce over to Thyphera and set up a base on the planet, as according to the scans from the long-range scanner, a system away, it seemed as if the planet was unoccupied space. Natabri pointed out that there seemed to be some sort of surge coming from the ground. Anakin smiled at her with a cockiness that suggested whatever the Sith were trying to build, they'd blow it into splinters. Commander Cody asked if they were suggesting they'd go to Thyphera and do a ground invasion, or if this was more so a raid where they could send some fighters down to the surface and bombard whatever the surface energy was out of existence. Anakin stopped for a moment. He told Cody that the chances are they would have to go in for a ground invasion, simply based on the fact that they needed to make sure whatever the Sith were building didn't have any clues or waypoints to the Star Forge. Admiral Coburn told Skywalker that the Council and Republic High Command structure would never agree to this mission. Natabria agreed with the Admiral. She suggested that it could be an unnecessary risk. Anakin shook his head, placing his hands on the table and leaning forward, suggesting that if they could take Thyphera, it could be the key to connecting the Republic to the Axis of Three. She looked at the galactic map. It was actually a smart idea. It would leave their flanks undefended, but if they did it, then perhaps they could get close to those three Republic planets. The core was so undefended, but if the Republic could have access to Bisk, Corellia, and Kuat, then the naval power structure would be increased. The Republic knew that this still existed because they were still getting the frequency showing that each planet was still maintained by the Republic. There were listening posts on all three worlds that were set up after the Sith return. The purpose was to inform the survivors elsewhere in the galaxy that they had survived. Though, maybe the Sith took them over and they were keeping the signal going. Zala spoke up for the first time. She told Master Skywalker and Morden that the frequency would immediately transmit a distress signal if there was an invasion on any of the planets. When some of the command looked over at her with confusion, she smiled with a little bit of embarrassment. She told them that she was reading through some of the specs on their construction during her free time. She apologized for interrupting, but they told her that she didn't need to apologize. She was a commander, and she had the ability to speak, just as long as it wasn't borderline insubordination. Skywalker continued and told them that they could legitimately do this and get away with a victory on Thyphera. They'd be able to open up a passageway all the way to the core and establish a foothold, a rock surrounded by a river if you will. The Republic wouldn't be able to crumble, and while Coburn told Skywalker he could ask for a replacement fleet to show up here at Malastare while they were gone. Anakin nodded his head and told them that he looked forward to seeing them on the ground at Thyphera. Admiral Coburn turned his attention to the deckhands and prepared to get everything ready. Skywalker stood up and crossed his arms, as Cody, Ahsoka, and Zala left the bridge. The Tabre told Anakin that she wasn't sure about this. He shrugged her shoulders, telling her that they would be fine, reminding her that as long as they had each other, they would be alright. The Tabre shook her head and suggested that it was more than that, it was bigger than all of them. Skywalker told her that she was being paranoid, and the Tabre admitted that she wasn't fond of him dismissing her concerns as such. She looked at him with a slight glare, suggesting that next time he wanted to say something like that, he should choose his words a bit better next time. Natabre stepped out of the room as Anakin stood in silence. He didn't really understand what he did wrong, but he shook it off in his head and waited for the jump to hyperspace. Hours later, Natabre and Zala would be inside of the training facilities. It wasn't the acrobatic challenge it was before, it was something different. Zala was staying on one of the platforms. It was moving and there were about a dozen training droids flying around. Anakin and Ahsoka came into the control room where Natabre was standing. Her arms were behind her back as she turned her head, enough to see them out the corner of her eye. She looked back towards the training facility. 
Anakin asked her how Zala was doing, and she praised her student before turning and addressing both of them with a bow. Ahsoka looked over to Anakin, realizing that there was something wrong with this. She was acting a little odd. Atabre asked Ahsoka and Anakin if they would like Zala to stop so Ahsoka could join her. Anakin asked if that was alright with her, and she nodded her head. Natabre turned to run and flip the switch that ended the challenge. Zala looked over the command center, where Natabre pointed at the door. Moments later, Ahsoka popped into it. The challenge restarted with 24 training droids. Anakin walked up to Natabre and stood looking down into the training facility. He asked her what he said wrong, and she turned to him and told him that it was a dismissal of her concerns. She wasn't trying to be paranoid. She was trying to make sure they didn't do anything unorthodox to get them or their troops into danger. She understood the one to release the people from those three core worlds, but they were generals. It was more than just them. They had to care not just for their students, but their men too. Anakin told her that he understood, and he apologized for dismissing her in such a way. She smiled and thanked him before telling him that she wanted this to work as much as he did, but she still was having a bad feeling about it. Anakin asked why, and she felt comfort that she was being listened to. She told him that she was unsure, the force just felt awry, especially when it comes to an energy source from the planet's surface, one without a defense fleet of any kind. Anakin understood the concerns, but what are the realistic chances of it being a trap? He told her that strategically speaking, the Sith Empire wouldn't put a fleet over Thyphera because the Separatists weren't actively engaging the front lines, they were holding their own planets. If Malastare was lost by the CIS and the Sith sent their fleet from Thyphera, therefore there shouldn't be any fleet to expect on that planet. It was strategically sound. She saw the point, but how long until the Sith Empire figured out that Malastar was lost? Anakin paused for a moment. He hadn't actually thought about that, but he quickly scavenged an answer. He suggested that they would be done and out before anyone ever arrived. She looked at him and then back to the students. The Tabri said that she trusted his intuition, as he had hers during the Battle of Malastar. He thanked her and asked her about the situation regarding Zala. She smiled and told him that Zala was an amazing student. Sure, they didn't have a lot of time with each other, but truthfully, part of this was Ntabre romanticizing the whole having a student thing. She always wanted to be a Jedi Master, and now she was, which made her feel good, and she felt like she could be a good master. That, to her, was the most important thing ever, being a good master. Anakin was glad to hear it was going well. She asked the same question, and Anakin gave an answer with some sass and said that Ahsoka could be pretty snippy. Ntabre laughed and said that she learned from the best. Anakin agreed for a moment before realizing that she was referring to him. He smiled and continued to watch the students work through their training. Ahsoka was fierce with a lightsaber. Zala, on the other hand, was quick, but her power wasn't like Ahsoka's. It was a discernible difference between the two of them at the moment. Zala was focused on her speed and gracefulness, while Ahsoka was focusing on her ferocity and accuracy. Both were good attributes to have, and they both equally represented their teachers in some way, shape, or form. After the session ended, Anakin and Atabre broke off again. They wanted to focus on their individual training with their students. Anakin had an idea regarding training Ahsoka, which involved the clone troopers. Ahsoka was initially confused, but she tried it out. After a couple deflected shots, she was hit with a stun round and was completely knocked out. On the other side of the ship, Zala and the Tabre were sitting in the training room. Both of them were on their knees, and the Tabre told her student that she won the strength and the connection between the two of them. Zala was interested, and then the Tabre told her already timid student that they would be sharing some of their past with each other. Natabri believed if they were to be an effective mash and apprentice duo, then they needed to know each other. Zala went first. She told her master about everything that happened on Octu. Natabri listened intently as the two of them sat on their knees with their eyes closed. Because while the both of them survived the fall of the temple on Coruscant, they both had very different experiences of the event. Zala told her master that in the moment she tried to get her friend, but she was pulled away by her mentor. The mentor didn't make it much further anyways because he was killed by a Sith Lord whose face was covered in a mask. Zala remembered looking into his ghastly yellow eyes and pale face. It still gave her nightmares. The rest was a blur. The trip from Coruscant to Octu didn't really matter. Zala told her master that when she felt like she came to, when everything stopped being a blur, everyone was different. Children aged like war veterans, Jedi fought like Sith, and there wasn't a light at the end of the tunnel. Zala told her master that she wasn't a bad kid, and she wasn't a bad Jedi. She was just always at the wrong place at the wrong time. She was just trying to help, and because she was breaking up fights, she was constantly seen as an agitator. Zala opened her eyes to look at her master, whose eyes were still closed. She told her master that as a Jedi, they weren't supposed to show their emotions. They weren't meant to feel what they had within them. But several nights, she looked at the stars and wished she wasn't born. Several nights, she hid her tears under silent cries. Several nights, she stopped. She told her master she thought about running away and disappearing. Zala's eyes were stuck on her master's face. She admired the beauty of Natabri's stillness, and then she watched a singular tear flee her eye. Zala's lips shook, and she felt shame. 
She pressed the sadness back inside her as she tried to silence herself again. Zella pulled her hands up to her face and pressed them against her mouth and covered it. The two of them sat in silence for what felt like hours, but it wasn't more than minutes. Natabri cleared her throat silently before telling Zala that she was sorry for assuming that she was anything but what she was. The student told her master that it wasn't her fault, it was no one's fault. It was a Sith, and the Jedi weren't prepared. Natabri told her student that she was wise for her years, and she was proud of her. Zala was silent, and Natabri continued, telling her student that everything she embodied was the best of what the Jedi were supposed to be, and she congratulated her for her determination to not let what surrounded her control her. Zala told her master that she was always afraid. Latabri opened her eyes and told her student that being afraid was only natural. She told Zala about the time she and Anakin were in a cave on Act 2, and she was afraid. She didn't explicitly say that she was afraid of Skywalker turning against her, just more so afraid. Maybe it wasn't the Jedi way, but the reality is that as sentience, they would always feel such feelings. They would have to be strong enough to handle these things, and if they weren't, then they would be no better than the Sith. The two of them continued their very still and poignant conversation, relating to each other and understanding each other better. Ahsoka inside the hangar bay woke up. She asked how long she was out for and Anakin smiled, telling her that it was an hour. Cody reached out his hand and helped her up. Anakin told her that it was time to go again. Ahsoka struggled to her feet as she shook her head and looked around. Her vision was a bit blurry, but she ignited her weapon. This time it took less stun rounds to incapacitate her. Ahsoka was back on the ground and knocked out. After she woke up, Anakin gave her a break, telling her that she had done well. It would take time to get used to, but once she got used to it, she'd be able to recover faster and get back into it. Faster. She asked Anakin what this training was, because it clearly wasn't reasonable. Anakin told her that it just so happened to be reasonable because it was for her survival. He wasn't training her to be a Jedi, he was training her to survive. Because to Anakin, that was the most important thing. He didn't want to lose her. If he lost her, he wouldn't know how to handle it truthfully, even having known her for so short a period of time. So, the alternative was being the most rigorous trainer in the history of the Jedi Order. Ahsoka had to live with it too. She was given time to head back to her room and recover. Zala was sleeping in her room at the moment anyways. Ahsoka's practice was physically difficult, while Zala's was mentally and emotionally difficult. This was a key difference between both teachers and individuals as a whole. Anakin was focused on the war side of things, as he believed their bond would grow in due time. Alantabri was focused on what should be done in regards to understanding oneself, as she believed if Zala could come to peace with herself, then she could come to peace with the war around her. After learning about Zala's backstory and how she was constantly thrown under the bus, Latabre knew she made the best decision for her student. Zala could be pushed, and she would work hard, but because she was actively being listened to and understood, she'd have a much easier time developing into who she needed to become. At this point, Natabre knew that Zala would eventually become a great Jedi. It would just take time for her to see that within herself. As Natabre realized, she and her student were similar, just as Ahsoka and Anakin were similar. Two masters were gathered up in the hangar bay. They were talking about their respective situations and how they were handling them. Anakin told Natabre that Ahsoka was going through training really well. Natabre said the same thing about Zala. However, this discussion was more or less about their interest in the joint training and how it should be handled. It's not that there was anything wrong with it at the moment, rather it was the fact that maybe there should be more of a concentrated effort on teamwork in the joint training rather than individual work. Skywalker believed that this was because of Ahsoka and Zala's sizes. The acrobatic work would be very important, However, it would likely be more important to know how to fight together, or with another Jedi around. Anakin told Natabre about the whole thing that he was doing with Ahsoka, and she found it to be borderline unethical. To have her own men shoot her, it just seemed kinda weird. Anakin believed that because of the training the Sith troopers had, it'd be easier to have the clones fire at them. Natabre did see the point and told Anakin that she'd begin to strategize with some ideas of how they could take Anakin's concept and expand upon it. He smiled and she told him that it was a great idea, in all honesty. She just never would have thought about having the men fire at her student. She nudged him playfully before making her way to the bridge and Anakin followed. In the coming hours, they would arrive at a hyperspace. The planet was still. It was kind of weird. There was a small vessel floating outside the planet, and well, it wasn't exactly small. It just looked that way from where it was. Anakin requested a squad of troopers to go investigate the vessel, while he and the others made their way to the surface of the planet. Admiral Coburn told Skywalker that they would keep the fleet at a reasonable distance in case the Sith Empire forces came to the planet and blindsided them. In other words, as long as they kept posted here, then they would be fine. The Sith wouldn't be able to trap them on planet, which in reality is all that mattered. The Jedi got aboard an LAAT along with a couple of other ones that launched up from the skies and made their way down to the surface of the planet. Anakin had his communication on and he was waiting for any transmissions 
from anyone. An LAAT, on the other hand, moved its way onto the vessel that was sitting above the planet. The group of transports at the same time landed on the surface of Thyphera. Skywalker got out of the ship first and immediately noticed something was off. The Tybrae jumped down from the ship and looked at Anakin. The two of them shared a set of thoughts as Anakin's expression lost the confidence it had on the bridge of the capital ship. Zala and Ahsoka jumped down and the clones filed out of the ships as well. Anakin told the men to keep close to each other. There were some cities on the planet, but they weren't near them. The reason they were here, in the middle of this field, was because of the surge of energy. Though there wasn't necessarily anything for them to lock onto. They were just kind of aimlessly looking into openness. There were some fields, and there was a largest hill in front of them. Anakin looked into Tabre, and she nodded her head, suggesting that she would come with them. The two Padawans followed closely behind, while Cody and the clones moved forward, checking out the area. As the Jedi were walking up the hill, Skywalker and Morden got a communication from the team set to enter the ship above the atmosphere. They said that the ship seemed pretty devoid of life. Part of them felt like the ship hadn't been activated in eons, though at the same time it partially felt like there was something terribly wrong about all this. They didn't know what it was, but they told General Skywalker that they would continue to provide updates to them as they continued their mission. The Tybrae told Anakin that something felt wrong. Before they could get to the top of the hill, Ahsoka stopped, and Zala noticed immediately. Anakin and Tabre turned around and asked what was wrong. Ahsoka shuddered, and she told them that she felt terrible darkness. She didn't know what it was, but it was haunting, and it made her skin crawl. Both masters turned their attention back towards Ahsoka, and she looked from the ground up towards them. The Tabre told Anakin that they should go, and he shook it off. He told Ahsoka that she didn't want to cross over the hill, then she didn't need to. Anakin turned and started up the hill. Zala followed him, and then the Tabre and Ahsoka did. When they reached the top of the hill, they looked down to see a ghostly figure standing in the middle of the field. For whatever reason, the field looked dead. All of its coloration had vanished, and this ghost didn't move. Anakin told everyone to stay close, as he put his hands on his lightsaber and stepped forward. The Tabre grabbed his elbow and looked at him. He smiled with an arrogance, telling her that it wasn't a big deal. He put his arm forward and out of her grip and started walking towards the ghost. The hill on this side was much smaller than it was on the other side, so they descended rather quickly. Anakin pulled his blade into his hand without igniting it. As he got closer, a communication from the vessel came over. The clones were crying out in both terror and agony. They tried to relay a message. Anakin stopped for the first time since her arrival to Thyphera and felt a wave of fear wash over his body. The ghost could hear the sound emanating from the clones on board of his ship. The shadow slowly rose to his feet. He spoke out telling Skywalker that he'd been expecting him to bite the bait. The failure of the Empire of Amalister was simply a test of his arrogance. A test to see if he'd be foolish enough to come to Thyphera, to die along with every citizen here. The four Jedi ignited their lightsabers. Anakin shook a shiver from his shoulders, stiffening his upper body and preparing for whatever came his way. A blood-curdling laugh slipped from the shadow, and it turned around. There was a horrid mask. Anakin spun his blade in his hand, telling the ghost that he had faced worse adversaries before. Nihilus laughed, telling him that Scion was foolish. But he wasn't. Anakin rushed forward. The Tybrae hesitated but followed him. Nihilus moved like a flash, crushing his blade against Anakin's. The force and the speed were something Anakin had never seen before, and it threw him from his feet. Ahsoka, Zala, and the Tabra came running to his aid. They threw their lightsabers forward in an attempt to drive Nihilus back, but his finesse resembled that of his master. While his master used three lightsabers, Nihilus made his lightsaber feel like three. The Padawans were thrown from their feet, but Natabra stood long enough until she too was thrown down. Anakin got to his feet. Nihilus told Anakin that his mistakes would cost the lives of all he brought with him. At that moment, Admiral Coburn radioed over and told Skywalker it was a trap. The Sith fleet was here, they needed to evacuate before anything happened. He would send a light cruiser to pick them up, while the rest of the fleet had a fighting retreat. Luckily, Coburn stationed the fleet far away from the planet. The only issue is, the troopers on the planet that had to get to the fleet immediately. If they didn't, they'd be stuck and they would die. Skywalker cried out a terrible no. It was a mix of fury and emotional betrayal. He couldn't believe he fell for the trap. Skywalker rushed Nihilus, but he wasn't here to deal with a Jedi. He was here to torture one. Skywalker was parried a number of times as his allies tried to get up and fight against the monster. Anakin could barely keep up with his pace. The tragedy is, Nihilus was far from the best duelist the Sith had. He was talented, but he wasn't one of their best. Sion was just arrogant, in the same fashion that Skywalker was being now. Nihilus was going to expose it. He thrusts his Skywalker from his feet and extinguishes his lightsaber into his belt. Before throwing his hands forward, the Tabre, Zala, and Ahsoka fell backwards. Nihilus turned to Skywalker and told him that first, he would watch his allies as they died before him. And then, he'd be brought to the Sith, where he would die alone, knowing he had failed his only friends. Anakin cried out as he watched the three of them have the Force essence drained. Anakin jumped forward, attacking Nihilus, who released his grip on the three who fell to the ground. 
Anakin's blade never met Nihilus. Red lightning fled his fingers, and Skywalker was forced to block it. But Nihilus was using so much that the red lightning trickled over the lightsaber and crawled across his skin, ripping through his Jedi uniform and burning him. Anakin fell to his knees, still holding his lightsaber above his head as he cried out in agony. The clones on the other side of the hill were given orders to retreat back to the fleet, but they heard the lightsaber duel. They finally made it to the top of the hill. Cody saw the Jedi on the ground and told the LAATs to go in and provide cover fire. The clones rushed forward and began firing. Anakin fell backwards and looked over. He tried to call out to them, trying to get them to stop, but it was too late. A number of the blaster shots were stopped in midair and launched back at the clones. Several of the clone troopers dropped dead at this, killed by their own shots. Cody didn't understand how this was at all possible. He tried to get the men together to help the Jedi, but it seemed like it wasn't working. Skywalker turned back at Nihilus, who stood over them, like a man possessed. He leaned down and grabbed Anakin's face and looked into his eyes with a soulless expression. Nihilus told Skywalker that even if he survives, he'll never forget. Nihilus shoved Anakin's face into the dirt. The rest was a blur. Everything moved in slow motion, but it was an echo. The LAATs blasted away at Nihilus, and one of them was brought down onto a group of clones. Nihilus seemed to disappear when a wave of V-19s came down for cover fire. In the air, the Republic light cruiser sat above everything, waiting for the Jedi to return. Skywalker remembered being helped up, and his arm slung over Cody's shoulder as he treaded himself along to get to the LAAT before collapsing on the inside. Waxer had Zal in his arms, and Boyle had Ahsoka in his. Natabre was helped into the LAAT the same time Anakin was. The trip to the Republic light cruiser was quick, and before they knew it, they were back in the hyperspace. When Anakin woke up, he was petrified. His heart rate was through the roof, as a clone medic stood with him and shook his head, putting his hand on his shoulder and pressing him back to bed. Anakin put his hand on the clones and asked what happened. The trooper told the general that everyone was okay. The fleet was en route to Malastare to meet up with the backup fleet that has since replaced them. Everyone would make a recovery, but now he had the rest. Anakin shook his head before he slipped back into sleep. When Anakin next woke up, Natabra was sitting up next to him. She had her eyes closed and she could feel they had woken up. She asked him how he was feeling. Anakin jumped up and asked if she was okay. She nodded her head and then she slowly opened her eyes. One of her eyes was bloodshot. She asked Anakin if he was okay. He apologized profusely. He never should have taken them to Thyphera. The Tabre agreed, but everyone was alright, for the most part. He should see it as a lesson more than anything else. Anakin reached over and asked her about her eye. She put her hand up and slowly guided his back to his bed. She told him that the Sith they encountered used force drain on them. She'd be fine, it would just take some time for her to fully recover. Anakin remembered instantaneously. What happened to the troops? The Tabre frowned. She told Anakin that out of the 57 men they landed with, only 14 returned alive. Five of those troopers were injured, and one of those five was mortally wounded. Chances are he wouldn't survive the trip to Malastare. Anakin leaned back on the bed and asked what he had done. Atabri didn't respond. She couldn't. She tried to warn him and he didn't listen. This was his lesson. She patted him gently and told him to rest. He would need it. She got up and walked over to where her student was. She was still sleeping. For the Padawans, it was much worse for them. The Tabra was alright because she was an adult, though Nihilus took a lot from them. It was a short burst and it did an incredible amount of damage. He specialized in Force Drain, and if it weren't for the clones, they wouldn't have survived. Anakin lay on his bed for hours, staring at the ceiling. Eventually, he got up and went to Ahsoka's side. She was still sleeping. The Tabra and Zala had already left the room. When Ahsoka woke up, Anakin asked her how she was feeling and she rubbed her head in a confused manner. She wasn't sure. Where was she? Or what happened? Anakin told her and expressed in his sincerest apologies to her for having put her and the other two in that position. She told him it was okay, but he wasn't going to just forgive himself that easily. This wasn't okay, and it needed to be addressed accordingly. When Ahsoka eventually went back to sleep, Anakin made his way to the bridge and transmitted a recording to the rest of the fleet. He apologized profusely for everything that happened in the previous mission, and he told them that he never wanted to mess up like that again. He was going to take full responsibility for the loss and the decision being that it was his. Anakin told them all that he didn't want to let them down again, and that he never would. The losses on Thyphera were terrible, and they were unacceptable. He would accept any punishment levied against him upon the return to Malastare. The men were appreciative for the message, and it connected them to Skywalker unlike ever before. Not just him, but the other Jedi General. Their ability to own up for their mistakes and handle adversity with a cunning morality made them all the more relatable. The clones greatly appreciated it. Skywalker wouldn't be seen much longer, being that since Ahsoka, Natabre, and Zala were okay, he was with the clones in the medical room. The clones who had been wounded, three of the five, had already left the medical bay, and the fourth one was heading out soon. The clone who was mortally wounded was still in recovery, and his chances were slimmer. Cody came into the room to see how lucky he was doing. That's what they called the clone, at least. The two of them talked about the clone trooper, and Cody mentioned that if he pulled through, 
then he'd have to embrace the name Lucky. He always hated being called that. He believed it was just juvenile and he wanted to reject it. But his pod mates always teased him with the name, and his squad mates just furthered it. It wasn't their fault, he was just a lucky shot. Apparently, really lucky because on Thyfera, he managed to shoot himself in the chest with a long rifle. When Cody eventually left, Anakin was stuck in his thoughts. Lucky was surviving, but he was fading in and out. Anakin thought about what he put his close friends through. He put Zala and Ahsoka through more torment than they needed to, and he almost killed his closest friend Atabre. It really put a perspective on everything for him. Seeing that he nearly killed Natabre, he began to realize how high in regards he held her. Anakin hadn't fully moved on from Padme yet, her death only being a few months old, if that. He knew he didn't need an attraction to see value in Natabre because she was her. He loved her presence and he loved having her as a friend, as that was what he needed most in life. She was perfect in his eyes. Sure, maybe a bit more Jedi than he, but still perfect. Maybe he did fancy the attraction to her, though he couldn't be sure. All he knew is that with her life on the line at Tython, he was willing to do anything to save her and having put her life in danger here, he realized how much he really cared. Maybe he just hadn't put it in perspective since the fall of Coruscant, how much she really meant to him. Considering Kenobi, Padme, and most of the people he was close to actually died, he didn't realize how open those wounds were. Natabre filled a hole in his heart. Ahsoka and Zala did the same. The bond with Natabre was obviously much different than the one with Zala and Ahsoka. He couldn't help but feel like he let them down with his actions. His failure was a lesson about patience, leadership, and the reality of being a Jedi Master. When they eventually returned to Malastare, it turned out that Clone Trooper Lucky would own his name, and survive the loss of Thyfera. Anakin, on the other hand, would prepare to be demoted and be sent back to Octu. But as it turns out, according to Admiral Coburn, the Republic was preoccupied. General Plo Koon was last reported on Mandalore, and General Windu had another engagement on Gamor that he had to currently attend to. Republic High Command was also unavailable. So Admiral Coburn told Skywalker that he'd make an arrangement with him. Anakin listened and he liked the terms. Coburn would take full control of all fleet movements, and Skywalker would not be able to order or change them around. On the other hand, Coburn would make no mention of what happened on Thyfera to anyone. It was a slap on the wrist, and truthfully, Anakin believed it to be a bit superficial. But he could stay here with his best friend, and that's what mattered to him. He told the Admiral that he would continue to try and better himself on the daily, so that they would never have an encounter like the one they just had again. However, Skywalker needed to warn the other Jedi about the individual they encountered at Thyfera. He never got the name of the ghostly figure with a mask, so Anakin started to refer to him as the Ghost. Our season continues over Coruscant. Lord Malchus returned from yet another successful campaign. He was disenchanted to learn that Mandalore seemed to hold his own against Darth Xana. He at this point was accustomed to being back at the Sith HQ before anyone else, as he was the most successful individual when it came to campaigns. This wasn't a strategy thing for Malchus, more or less he just threw everything he had as hard as he could. It often crippled the entire structure of any defense. Malgus by this point was the most successful Sith Lord in the Sith Empire, which for him led to some resentment for Exar Kun. Though Malgus was simply buying his time. He did it before, and he would do it now. His entire mantra was allowing Exar to overthrow himself. Once that was done, he would take over. Of course, while Malgus was looking through his own strategy, another fleet returned from active combat. Malgus was looking at the crucial defense systems put in place by the Republic, and he had an acolyte who was helping him with this. Her name was Sola Gray, but he didn't care. She was just a grunt in his eyes, and that's all that mattered to him. She was showing him hollow maps of where assaults went well, and where they struggled the most at. Malgus was simply looking this over because he wanted to be able to continue his campaigns without having to refuel his resources. He would often need several repairs and tons of new vessels simply based off of his attack patterns. While his attack could be seen as overwhelming, which most of the time it was, they cost a lot of warriors. The Sith warriors weren't that important to him, just like Sola. She was someone who would die for the greater good. That was the ascension of his power. If he could get what he wanted, then it didn't matter what happened to them. Malgus told her to go away after she pointed out a couple of things. He could be a bit of a brute, but this anger wasn't exactly directed at her for simply existing. Malgus was pissed because he had to deal with Exar Gun. He could only tolerate listening to his rambling for so long. He swore if he got up in his face, he would drop him, but not even Malchus wanted to deal with that at the moment. It wasn't worth his time. He sat on his throne on his bridge, and he was hailed by Exar. He requested that they meet on the surface of the planet. Malchus nodded in agreement, and told some deckhands to fetch his shuttle. He was pissy as it was, but now he was really annoyed. The whole point of coming to Coruscant was to gather supplies so he could go back out to the battlefront. Of course, Exar had to arrive here. The main issue Malchus was having on the front lines was the fact that the droid armies were so vast. It wasn't their strategy, it was their numbers. As Malgus noted, the tactical droids were having a really difficult time handling Sith assaults, with Vitiate and his children causing rampage on some fronts, brief skirmishes with the Republic, 
Exar's foolish behavior, Darth Treya's pets running rampant, Malak and Revan doing their thing, with the ever elusive Darth Bane out and about, it made sense why they couldn't pinpoint a counter strategy that worked. Malgus walked to his vessel and boarded the ship. There she was again. Why was she always around? It was getting annoying at this point. Solo was technically his second in command, because at this point Malgus didn't have an apprentice running around. She wasn't really much of a commander either. Her role was relegated to cannon fodder. The fact that she survived this long was nothing short of a miracle for her. With the way Malgus sacrificed acolytes and marauders, it was a surprise he had any left to his command. His vessel cruised down to the city skyline of Coruscant, or what was left of it. There was really a deadly haze that filled the fiery skies of Coruscant. There hadn't been light on the planet since the fall of the Republic. When his ship landed, he exited. Solo was falling behind him like a shadow. He stopped where he landed. The Sith had a makeshift command center at the top of the steps of the Jedi Temple. It was set up by Exar after Revan and Bane left the area. He felt that if he set it up, he could use it to rupture the alliance that seemingly formed between the two of them. It didn't work, but whatever made Exar feel better at this point. That was the common mantra between the Sith and their understanding of this makeshift ruler of theirs. It was only a matter of time until he fell. Revan knew that when he lost to him too. Regardless, Malgus watched the fiery skies engulf the planet. He turned to Sola and told her to fetch some reports on the conflict of this planet. He wanted updates. He could still hear a distant battle going off. Explosions and blaster fire. The smell of death filled his lungs and empowered his darkness. Malgus walked over to the command table to find Exar standing there. He told Malgus that he was excited about their opportunities to work together. Malgus looked at Exar without saying a word as Exar opened up a hollow map of the known galaxy. He pointed towards three planets and said that they needed to be taken. Malgus responded under a grit in his voice. He didn't want to be here, but he was doing it so that the Sith could win. Exar said that the Jedi were seemingly trying to get to the Axis of Thream. If they could cut off the Republic from those reinforcements, then it would completely thwart their effort in the war. Malgus told Exar that their fleets were impenetrable. They couldn't get through to them. While Malgus was the most successful Sith out of the Empire, he didn't want to risk going against the Axis. What happened whenever a Sith fleet attacked was never worth it. When the Sith showed up, they would begin the battle and then they would be caught in a situation they couldn't escape from. It happened to Vitiate's son, and Vitiate wasn't very happy about it. He even expressed that he refused to dedicate his troops to that sector of the galaxy because it was clearly not worth the time. While there was a point that Vitiate had, Exar didn't care. To Vitiate, he believed that the Jedi would break into the Axe of the Three. Once they did, the three planets would collectively weaken themselves for the Republic War effort. Once that happened, they could pounce and rip apart the three infrastructure worlds. Malgus begrudgingly asked Exar which Jedi tried to get to the Axis of Three. He smiled and pulled up a hologram that depicted Skywalker facing down Nihilus. Exar told Malgus that it was just a child. The boy wasn't a real threat and he proved that with his faulty maneuvers. While Malastair was a loss and so was Mandalore, they were out of the way worlds. If they could get to the Axis of Three, then they could win this war quickly. Malgus didn't see it at all. He knew that the foundry planets of both their adversaries were to the south. While the Axis of Three had a lot of supplies, they were useless because they were just building up vessels that had no one that could fill them. Genosis and Kamino should be their main targets. The tension began to rise between the two Sith Lords as Exar realized that Malgus was attempting to challenge him. Before it could escalate any further, Sola came running up and gently placed the chip into Malgus' hand before scurrying away from the near conflict. It was enough to break the tension as Malgus plugged the drive in and looked at the reports from the Battle of Coruscant. He scoffed. He asked Exar if that was enough. Seriously? Only a billion people were killed on Coruscant. That was hardly anything. According to the debates, there were three trillion sentients who lived on the planet. Exar told Malgus that it was because the people barricaded themselves in the lower levels of the city. Most of those casualties were topside residents. All of them were upper class individuals who had a lot of money and no grit. When they were targeted first, it gave the rest of the people of the city ample time to prepare anything that came their way. Sure, they were just civilians and people with weapons, but turns out when you have nearly 3 trillion of them actively fighting against you, you can't do anything. Coruscant was like a fortress. It could probably hold out for the longer part of a decade if it needed to. The people down there could grow their own food, and they had their own water supply from what was under the city and the planet. Malgus was so furious. Exar was such an ineffective leader, and he almost had enough of it before his train of thought was cut off. Exar told Malgus that he was being assigned to attack the Axis of Three. Malgus gritted his teeth and asked why. Exar completely ignored the question and told him that he was being directed towards the southern planet of the Axis of Three. Malgus said this in a questioning voice, to which Exar nodded his head. He told Malgus that this, according to reports, was the least defended location in the Axis. Truthfully, Exar was lying. This was well defended. Not the best defended, but like the middlemost defended. 
Kuat was the best defended and Kareli was the least defended. However, Kareli sat in the middle of both Kuat and Biss. The only thing Biss was the closest to was Thyphera. Nalgus asked if he was going to attack the planet alone, and Exar confirmed that he was. Nalus was being rerouted towards the unknown regions because it seemed as if there was a trail that Revan was on. Maybe. Exar wasn't positive. For a leader, he didn't radiate confidence, but that was because he actively was looking over his shoulder rather than focusing on the war at hand. Nalgus stormed off when he was finished and left Coruscant for his flagship. Upon his arrival, he'd have about 30 minutes on his bridge until Sola informed him that their preparations had been completed. They were ready to go whenever he was ready. Nalgus dismissed her and told the fleet to prepare for the jump to hyperspace. They were heading to the Fera. Nalgus then realized something. He realized that he had no clue who the Sola was. He got out from the throne once they were in hyperspace. He would kill her. She had to be a spy of sorts. Nalgus realized that he couldn't find her. Where had she gone? Turns out, she went back to the bridge and missed him. When he eventually returned to the bridge after searching for her throughout the ship, he ignited his weapon and demanded to know who she was. Sola was very confused, but she saw the threat coming her way and asked what he was doing. He prepared to swing, and so she ignited her lightsaber and put the blade up to her face. It was crimson, which confused him. He swung down and she was thrown backwards, staggering. He demanded to know how she got that lightsaber. She was confused, but defended herself again as he pushed her back against the window of the bridge and looked into her eyes with a soulless expression, demanding to know why she was here. He blasted her again as she fell off of her feet and her lightsaber dropped to the ground. She looked up and put her hands over her head, telling him that she served with him on Raxus. He stopped. That was one of their first victories after Coruscant. He stopped, but kicked her lightsaber backwards. He lowered the blade to her throat and demanded that she choose her words wisely. Sola told him that after the Battle of Raxus, his formerly second in command died in the medical wing. She was the next in line. Malchus paused for a moment. He looked up and his anger dissipated from his face. His lightsaber extinguished. He realized that's why the dude wasn't around anymore. He told her to next time make him aware. The worst part is she did. He just wasn't paying attention. She said it was when they returned from Raxus. He either heard it but didn't retain it or just didn't hear it. Either way, the little mix-up was over. She got herself back up and put her lightsaber on her belt and made her way away from the bridge. Malgus didn't understand that. Kind of annoying, but whatever. She'd probably die on Biss anyways, so it didn't really matter. When the Sith fleet arrived at Thyphera, Malgus noticed the lonesome vessel floating above the planet. Nihilus held Malgus and told him that he was set for his invasion of Biss. According to recent fleet activity, the Biss fleet should be considerably smaller. The fleets in the Axis were responding to activity on Kita Nemodia, which was still Separatist territory. For whatever reason, the Republic anticipated an attack. Due to them being cut off from the rest of the galaxy, that was to be expected consistently. Though the response was likely generated from the Republic assuming the Separatists got clobbered by the Sith Empire, which wasn't true. Nihilus told Malgus that he would enjoy the pleasure of killing a Jedi if he came across one. Nihilus was jittery with the thrill of the hunt. To nearly kill four Jedi was enthralling for him. He just wished he could have finished the job. Perhaps he would next time. Malgus didn't care. At the moment, conquest was his main priority. The Jedi would come and go as they pleased. He would kill whoever wanted to challenge him. It wasn't that difficult. With the fleet rerouted, they jumped towards Biss. For Malgus, the anticipation began to mount. He loved it. To rip through defenses and then burn civilization to the ground was something he enjoyed with all of his heart. He loved the smell of burning cities. He loved hearing the cries of civilians as they were mass executed. Malgus called together the individuals who would be integral to different pieces of this assault on Biss. Firstly, he was planning on using a strategy he liked to call the Blitz. It was really simple. Of course, he didn't have much information on the defense at Biss, but he had a hunch of what they had. Chances are they'd be outfitted with the Venator-class Star Destroyer, as a ship of the line with several other frigates and light cruisers. Chances all the acclimators would be held in reserve because they didn't take hits too well. There were great support ships and drop ships, but their shields were atrocious. Malgus decided that the best decision would be to push the fleet down the middle of the Republic fleet and then back end them. He did it at Raxus, which worked really well against a poorly defended Separatist fleet, though that had a lot to do with ship design, which is something Malgus didn't prepare for. The bulk frigates the Separatists used had cannons all around, unlike the Venator, so when he broke through their lines, they could still fire on him. Plus, the Separatists had Lucre Hulks at the ready during that battle. With the Republic fleet, the Venators would be the ship at the back of their lines. If he could drive through them, he would catch them off guard. The main thing Malgus noticed was the autonomy of their flagships. The triangular design, which was strikingly similar to their own flagships, had a great output towards the front of the vessel. However, everything from the edge of that triangle backwards was undefended. This is where Malgus got Sona, or whatever her name was. He told her that she'd be the lead of the ground assault. Once they broke through the lines, the support ships, which were in the middle of the Sith fleet, would break off. 
This would allow her to lead an invasion on the ground. He had one simple instruction for her. Destroy their troopers and find anything that related to the Star Forge. She understood and abandoned the bridge. Malgus waited on the bridge. His deckhands prepared him. They told him that they would be dropping out of hyperspace in 10 seconds. Malgus' heart pounded. He rose from his chair like a man possessed. 7 seconds. He walked towards the front of his bridge. 4 seconds. 3. 2. 1. The fleet exited from hyperspace. The interior rocked a little, and then he looked at the Republic fleet. They were currently doing fleet exercises, which meant they weren't at their best defensive position. However, this did mean that they were essentially in an offensive position. Malgus had to order all their shields up. Being that they were in hyperspace, their shields weren't up, and all their power needed to be redirected. The Republic quickly pounced on the Sith, and one of their capital ships was bombarded. Malgus ordered forward, an experimental vessel. He commissioned this without anyone's knowledge. The fleet broke out into explosions, and shields went up really quickly. And as they did, Malgus realized his right flank was heavily damaged by the exit from hyperspace. He ordered all fighters out of their bays immediately. The Republic was sending its V-19s in for combat. They needed to be destroyed. The Sith quickly countered, but they were in a bad position. Malgus called to his deckhands, demanding to know where the experimental ship was. They told him that it was damaged, but it was able to get the shields up before it exploded. Malgus took a deep breath. That was close. He ordered the fleet to begin a counterattack. His orders rang out through the comms as he told them to initiate the Blitz maneuvers. Fighters from both fleets engaged with each other, blasting away and ripping apart at each other. The Sith fleet hit its thrusters forward and lifted its frontal shields to maximum power. The return fire wasn't all that impressive, but it would suffice. The experimental ship Malgus brought forward kicked on its engines and was directed towards the fleet. There was a tactical droid inside of it. He stole it from Raxus. Actually, everything about the ship was stolen from Raxus. It was a super yacht that a wealthy investor on the planet owned. Well, he owned it until he was gutted by Malgus. The Sith Lord believed that it would make a useful tool, so he filled it up with explosives, ripped the shield generators of a couple Separatist flagships apart, and put them inside of it and rigged it to detonate. It was a miracle it even survived going through hyperspace. A lot of the ship was just a mess. There wasn't even a life support system inside of it. But Malgus was using it for the purpose of bombing his enemies with him. Oh yeah, and he also attached as many engines to the back of it as he could. It was a Frankenstein of a vessel. The Republic turned its attention towards the ship. It was already smoking from the initial barrage, but the tactical droid, who was completely convinced he was fighting for the Separatists, piloted it towards the center of the Republic fleet. The Republic stopped focusing on the Sith fleet, which was casually closing distance after its surprise entrance. Once the Republic locked onto the yacht, it was already too late. The vessel sped towards the middle of their lines and its shields were deactivated. The ship full of Rhydonium imploded, which was very anticlimactic to Malgus, before it exploded. The explosion sent out debris that ricocheted off of every available ship in the area. The Republic was caught in a bind. The explosion rocked their ships, some of which were destroyed in the process. Malgus pressed forward. They would destroy them now. The Blitz was activated. The wings of fighters went in towards the middle. Behind them were the capital and support ships. The whole crater was large enough for two fleets to fit through, let alone one. As they slid through, the bombers were released and slammed down on the Republic vessels from the middle outwards. The Republic Navy was at a loss, the Fleet Admiral was killed in the explosion, and they were left defenseless. At the moment, the clearing was sort of open. A wing of four acclimators were coming around the shipyard to defend. They were preparing to engage with the Sith. Malgus told Sola to begin her ground invasion. He knew that they would lose a couple of dropships in the process, but it didn't matter to him. The long-range cannons on the capital ships opened fire at the acclimators, and they were caught off guard. At the same time, the rest of the fleet moved behind the engine bays on the Venators and the support vessels. It was total chaos, and the Blitz seemingly worked as they rounded behind the Republic fleet. Malgus made sure everyone knew they could not target the shipyards. The Sith Empire could use them for their own fleet and their own construction. Sola, on the other hand, led the dropships away from the fleet as they descended towards the planet. The capital city of Vis was heavily defended. Not only were there anti-air cannons, but there was a shield generator that covered everything except for the exterior walls. It was a work in progress and they no longer had time to work on it. The heavy fire from the ground cut through the dropships until they found a bundle of trees to land in. The dropships had to open fire on the ground so they could make a safe landing procedure. When the troops exited, they made it clear to the fleet that their heavy weaponry wouldn't be safe to drop yet. Malgus was furious, but he gave them a simple order, figure it out before he got there. If he landed and they weren't able to take the shields down, they would all be killed by his hand. That was as clear as it needed to be. Sola lined up the Accolades and Marauders. Malgus had probably the largest group of Sith Troopers who could use the Force. It was a great aid to his ability to succeed. The Sith Troopers lined up and began running forward. In front of them were the lightsaber-wielding Maniacs, and at the front of their line was the warrior Sola Grey. 
She did hope for the opportunity to become Malgus's apprentice. It was a prized role and she believed that if she could earn it, she could finally be respected as the best Sith Lord student. When they left the tree line, they were fired upon. The capital city was a fortress and it was designed to be that. Because if the Sith broke in, they needed their defenses ready. The speed of the Acolytes and Marauders separated them from the rest of the Sith troopers who fell behind due to the lack of ability to use the Force. They were also providing covering fire, which as it turns out, wasn't very helpful for them because once the turbo lasers turned their attention towards them, they were blown to pieces. The Sith troopers weren't the issue, though on the bright side, they were smaller and harder to hit. So once they began breaking out of group formations, they were able to press further. The Sith on the other hand were launching themselves up the walls and attacking the turbo lasers. At the same time, Sola and a group of her best marauders broke off to the side and snuck through the shield itself. Once they were through, their trouble began. Clone troopers and Republic militiamen were ready for the counter. The counter was horrendous, and once they breached, they were cut down. It wasn't a large number of clones or militiamen, it was just a group who happened to be stationed here, though an ATTE saw them and blasted at them. Sola saw it and used the force to repel the blast into the side of a skyscraper. The building was extremely lean, so it knocked the building off the stability, and it began to tilt. Sola pointed at it, and her marauders used the force against the building before they all leapt up and began their ascent. Clones and troopers began rounding the corners as they climbed up the falling structure. While they were climbing, one of the marauders found the shield generator and directed the group there. On the outside of the base, the Sith troopers were being slaughtered. ATTEs and ATRTs were beginning to press outside the shields, which was a terrible idea. As they broke out, the Sith acolytes who were on the outside pounced. They'd been using the walls as cover and launched themselves at the counter assault once they were out of the shields. The clones were caught off guard and they were quickly slaughtered for their ineptitude. Inside the shield, Solo's group left off the falling structure as it slammed onto a couple heavy cannons that were stationed for mortar fire. Obviously, they didn't last too long. There were a couple of other groups, but that didn't matter at the moment. The Sith charged the shield generator and began cutting through it, which within moments led to the collapse of their shields. Solo called out for reinforcements and they were deployed with a wing of bombers and fighters. Malgus was kept on his bridge watching over the chaos as it ensued across the battlefront in space. The Republic was beginning to retreat, but he didn't plan on allowing that to happen. There was one flagship that was preparing to escape. Malgus told his deckhands to target the engines. He wanted to board the ship. As it turns out, the hunter could sense Jedi on board the ship and he wanted to chase the hunt. He was a butcher and he wanted to slaughter. While his shuttle prepared to deploy to the disabled Jedi cruiser, the ground battle was going extremely well. With the shield generator down, the heavy turbo lasers deactivated. As it turns out, the turbo lasers were connected to the generator system itself. So when the generator was destroyed, it shut them down. For the Sith, that was terrific. Their fighters and bombers had clear control over the skies with little flak resistance. The reason this was was for the heavy tanks that landed on the ground and began their counter assault of the Republic counter. The ATTEs were superior tanks, who was Sith on the ground, and the advantage rapidly slipping away from their grip, they were swarmed and destroyed. The capital city was beginning to get engulfed in flames. Within the city, the people became seen as cannon fodder, and this was done by their own heroism. Not that they would have survived anyways, but some of their militiamen were wearing citizen outfits, so they started firing back. All the citizens became targets. Sola, on the other hand, led her marauders on their continued push against the Republic. Though something caught her attention, it was a child and a swarm of people running away. He was next to his dead family, who had surely been killed by the conflict. She watched as the building toppled over next to the child. There were citizens running around, the kid like a rock in a river, but it was no use. The crashing wood of the building falling down on the kid jolted her a little. She just didn't expect to see it. She snapped out of it and continued ordering the conquest of the planet. At the same time, she began a personal investigation for any potential leads to the Star Forge. At the same time, Malgus's shuttle arrived inside the hangar bay of the Venator. The bay doors were locked open while the Jedi were trying to get the troops inside the vessel before the retreat to gather reinforcements. Obviously, that didn't go as planned. When his shuttle landed in the hangar bay, there was a certain demeanor that changed within the halls of the Venator. Clones lined the halls and they aimed their weapons at the shuttle. The doors to the shuttle opened, and they opened fire at literally nothing. At the same time, Malgus's flagship docked with the ship. It was a decoy. Malgus roared into the hallway, cutting down any clones who happened to be by him. He marched down the hallways without saying a word. He directed his troopers in the different locations of the vessel to shut it down and take it over. The people in the hangar bay rerouted to find the Sith Lord and kill him. If they could at least do that, then there would be potential for a victory after all. Not a total victory, but at least one. Clones fled to the boarding hatch, but as they closed in, they were met with stiff resistance. Most of the clones were lucky, because most of them came across the Sith troopers, though the rest of them were in for a nightmare. The Butcher crushed hallways and ripped apart clones. His swiftness with the blade was unimaginable to the clone eyes. 
When the Jedi came, it was a mash and apprentice duo. They weren't on Coruscant when the Order fell, but they survived just by being stationed here. If they weren't here, they likely would have been one of the casualties on the assault on Coruscant. The Master told her apprentice to stay back. He did until she launched herself at the Sith Lord. He was an older apprentice, maybe a year removed from being a knight, so instinctively he followed his master in. The clones rounded the corner too. Their hope was to be able to attack the Sith. Malgus was quick with the blade, blocking their strikes and kicking her into the wall, before catching the apprentice with his hand and throwing him to the ground. Malgus could have already killed them, but where is the fun in that? His lightsaber fled his hands as it whipped itself down the hallways and cut through the clones. The two Jedi were at a loss for their brethren dropping to the ground. The Master got up as she threw herself at the Sith Lord. He laughed, blocking her strike with absolute precision, before leaping over her and using the force to launch her to the wall. She dropped to the ground unconscious from the hit. Malgus was traveling alone, so both hallways surrounding him were filled with clones as he stood, towering over the student. He told the young man that he could live if he wanted. He got up and ignited his lightsaber, telling Malgus that he would never join the dark side. Malgus loved when Jedi did that little thing. That thing where they acted like they had a real chance of being able to resist. It was so adorable. Malgus slammed his blade against the students. He was waiting until the master woke up. At the same time, the clones rushed forward, and they couldn't shoot because they could harm their commander. They were coming in for hand-to-hand -hand combat. As they got close, Malgus lifted his hand and they all stopped. The apprentice looked on in terror. Thirteen clones were stopped and placed on both sides, each of them clamoring for their necks as they all lost their ability to breathe. Malgus smiled at the student as he panicked trying to save them. He raged forward and Malgus egged him on, telling the young Jedi to give in to his anger, let it fuel him. Malgus blocked and parried every single strike with ease as he snapped the clones' necks. He could feel that the masters were awake, and she got to take witness of the deaths of their clones. Malgus turned to her with a grin under his mask. His piercing yellow eyes haunted her, and without even twisting his neck back to see his opponent, he drove his lightsaber through the student's chest. The master watched her student fall lifelessly on her as his blade dropped to the ground. Just like her student, anger rose from within and she leapt forward, attacking with all of her strength. He blasted a parry back and she ignited her student's lightsaber and attacked him with both, but it didn't even take that much for her to lose. Her first step caused her to lose all of her focus. When that was gone, she was cut across the chest and she dropped to the ground. A group of clones saw it and they opened fire, trying to get revenge for their Jedi General. Malgus didn't even give them the time of the day to turn around. He stopped their blaster shots with the force and released them back at the clones, killing them all, as he kicked the master's lifeless body off his lightsaber and started forward. On the ground, people were retreating into the forest. The city was ripped to shambles and the Sith were victorious. Sola, on the other hand, found something that she believed was interesting. This had actually found some relics pertaining to the Star Forge. While they weren't in constant communication, they were informed of Revan's message about the Star Forge, and they were told to look for anything they had about it. Truthfully, the Axis of Three was mounting up their fleet so they could break out and give this information to the Republic High Command. They were far too worried about sending the information over wavelengths and having it intercept him. It didn't matter if the Sith knew what the Jedi were looking for, what did matter was the information the people of Biss had, which the Sith didn't even know the Jedi were looking to begin with. However, the people on Biss kept all that information inside the military facility, inside the command room. It was easy to find. They happened to forget about it once the battle began, and they paid the price for it. Luckily for Sola, she had two things she could deliver to Malgus. By the time he landed on the surface, he was in a pissy mood. Turns out the Venator he raided didn't have stable enough anything to survive, which meant that Malgus couldn't ship the vessel to Corellia and do the same trick there. Of course, there could be repairs done to it, they probably wouldn't be able to get the ship through hyperspace to begin with. The way the engines were hit completely damaged the hyperdrive and the entire system was a ticking bomb. So even if they could install everything without killing themselves in the process, there wasn't even a guarantee it would hit its target. When Malgus found Sola, she explained that everything was going well. The planet had, for the most part, been captured. For the most part isn't what he wanted to hear, as he choked her, lifting her off her feet with the force. He told her that he didn't want failure. She reached for her pockets frantically, trying to pull out the sphere. As she did, she found what she was looking for. The sphere dropped to the ground and rolled to his feet. He released his grip on her and she dropped, her feet hitting the ground and she falling to her knees. He asked what was on it but she was busy coughing. He kicked her and told her to tell him now. His patience was thin. She heard a snap from within her side after he kicked her. She scrambled for the words and told him that it was a chain of planets on the far western side of the galaxy. They were Kyria, Endor, and Bakura. He stood over her and asked if the Star Forge could be found at any of those locations. She said that it was unknown at the moment, but there was a chance she was cut off as he grabbed her by the back of the head and leaned down, telling her that she better go and find out. She was being removed from his army. 
He told her to link up with Revan's forces on Foma. He released his grip on her and stood up. An acolyte ran up to him and told him that Lord Exar was waiting a response from the battle and his progress. Malgus nearly cut the acolyte down before storming forwards towards a hologram. Sola, on the other hand, coughed up blood before looking over at the sphere. She reached for it, but that was a terrible idea. She could feel it the moment she tried to grab it, but decided against it because of the pain. She realized that she wasn't using the dark side to fuel her pain and the power. How odd. It was likely the shock from what she had just received. She grabbed the sphere and clawed her way to her feet and got to a ship. On his way to the briefing with Exar, Malgus was muttering to himself under his breath. He was sick of this guy, he was so terrible, and as proved by the success here on Biss, he was the legitimate he stopped. He rounded the corner to see more than just Exar. Revan, Vitiate, Treya, and Vane were all situated on the hologram table. Malgus told them of his success, and then he was praised. He then told Revan that his second in command was coming his way. Revan asked for the trooper's name, and Malgus admitted he didn't know, and he didn't care. He just told Revan to be ready for her arrival. She was leaving as they spoke. Revan was taken aback by this, but he didn't have time to care. They were busy talking about the failures of the Mandalore campaign, and a couple of other failures across the front lines. Turns out Vitiate's children weren't as useful as he said they were, and Exar was fuming. Arkan, Thexan, and Valen went for an attack on a mid-rim world, controlled by the Separatists. It was a terrible mistake because they barely came out alive, and Admiral Trench ripped their fleet apart. He strategically prepared for them, and they had nothing against him. It was a brutal failure. Exar admitted that he was fond of Malgus' success, and they began redirecting fleets to potential targets. Malgus told Revan that his former second-in-command would inform him more about Kyria and Doran Bakura. Revan questioned what this meant, and Malgus cleared the air. He said he didn't want her. If Revan did, then more power to him. If not, she was disposable, just like all their second-tier Sith. Malgus didn't care for them, and Exar only forced him to be more brutal towards them. Instead of taking his anger out on Exar or the other Sith for not collectively turning against him, he took it out on his own troopers. The next second in command would likely face the same wrath from Malgus. Sola Great, on the other hand, got inside of a vessel and set her coordinates for Foma. Once she was in hyperspace, she laid the sphere down on a small table and pulled out a medical capsule and turned on a small medical droid to help her with her ribs. She lifted her arm with her other arm as the droid sprayed some back on her robes. She leaned down on the cot. While naturally, it would take over a month for this injury to heal, she didn't have that. While she was thinking of ways to feel herself through the pain, she realized that perhaps Malgus wasn't meant to be her teacher, though Revan already had a student. Maybe she'd find a Sith Lord somewhere. Her intentions weren't fully fleshed out. She just wanted to be regarded as more than just dirt. So maybe this was the way to do it. All she knew is that Malgus wasn't the Sith Lord for her. Our season continues on the trip from Bis to Foma in the western quadrant of the galaxy. Sola Grey was waiting to arrive so she could give Revan the spear she found on Bis. While her injuries were daunting, she believed she'd be a good warrior for Revan. She, of course, was unaware of what Malgus said in regard to her no longer being his second-in-command. She had no reason to assume that. She was just hoping that Revan would treat her better than Malgus did, which wasn't really saying that much. As she got up, her ribs creaked, but it was alright. The back to patches were seeping through, and they were working their way through her tissue and into her bones. It would help, but she needed to remain away from activities for at least 12 hours. Good thing it was such a long journey. She had probably gotten a third of that under her belt, and after a nap, she began to analyze the sphere again. It belonged to an ancient people on this, and unlike the weapon from Mandalore, hadn't been passed down from generation to generation. It was kept in a museum, and its purpose was for art. Now it was going to be used to fuel a nightmare for the galaxy, especially for the ancestors of those who perished on this after Malgus' arrival. She twisted the sphere around in her hands, looking for something to gain from it. She looked thoroughly at the sphere and pondered over the planets she had and whether they were right or not. Turns out they were, but everything else was simply a mystery to her. The language didn't make sense. All that made sense was the style in which the planets were arranged. She spent hours toiling over it, even writing out all the markings on a large sheet of paper so that she could analyze it better. That clearly wasn't working for her. Sola's hope was to have something more useful for Revan because she didn't know how cruel he could be or if he would simply kill her or not. She then realized that the spears were pointing to each planet because apparently, there was supposed to be a clue on each planet that one could utilize to find the Starforge. She was so annoyed. It could never be easy with these things. Eventually, she arrived over the planet of Foma. Revan's fleet was situated. Outside the fleet, there was a wreckage field. It was a mix of two fleets, one Republic and one Separatist. It seemed like one of those rare occurrences when two fleets arrive at the same location at the same time. Sola didn't make a mention or a notice of any of it. She flew past it like it was a small asteroid belt. When she docked with Revan's flagship, she was permitted to enter. Once an armed guard came in to make sure she wasn't a traitor. Revan wasn't given the best report from Malgus, but this was pretty typical. There's a reason why Malgus was on his own most of the time. 
simply because he didn't like to play nice. Solo was escorted to the bridge of the vessel and found Lord Revan standing at the front of the bridge, looking out over the wreckage field. Behind him on the little catwalk that stood over the deckhand's positioning were Lana Sith. Closest to Revan was Malak, his apprentice, and falling down were a bunch of nameless Sith, some wearing masks, others not. Revan turned to face her and asked her what he brought to her, and if she had time to analyze everything on the drive since the Battle Abyss. She nodded her head without speaking outwardly. She didn't want to play the game she played with Malgus. Revan was kind of just confused as he told her to come forward and tell him what it was. Sol looked up and handed Revan the sphere. She expressed that the ancient people of Abyss believed there were clues or links that could lead to the Starforge. However, it would require them going to three different planets and scouring them for the potential artifacts. Being that the people of the ancient world didn't want anyone to find it unless it was absolutely necessary, it would be extremely difficult for them to find it. Revan looked at the sphere and then asked why it would be more difficult, assuming that she was suggesting he and his armies wouldn't be able to find it. Sola expressed that while she was examining the sphere, she pulled up data on the people of Abyss. There were individuals who knew the history that worked in the museum where the sphere was. They likely would have been able to give insight on it. Even more than that, give details that would aid them in their quest. Revan asked what happened to them, and Sola told him that Malgus wanted everyone killed. So if they survived the initial attack, they likely were killed if they didn't escape. Though she did say that there were three planets that were likely of interest, at least according to the text on the side of the sphere. It was Sira, Endor, and Bakura. Revan scoffed and turned around. He spoke to himself quietly, so quiet that no one else could hear him. He just admitted that he was so annoyed with Malgus. He was always thinking about conquest and never about the potential success in some other facet of the grand plan. Malgus stalled them, and at this point in the race, they could not afford to be even a day behind the Republic. Revan highly doubted that the Separatists were in on the joke. But if they were, then they couldn't allow either corrupt faction to take control over the Star Forge. He turned back and thanked her for her assistance, and told her that she would be staying here on his flagship for the time being. He dismissed the other Sith aside from Malik and her, and brought her over to the communication table and placed a sphere above it. As the sphere lay down, it was lifted up, and out from it, there were three hollow maps. Sola was left in awe. Revan turned to her and told her that she still had much to learn, though she was off by not more than a fingertip from getting the correct combination. The people in Biss liked their riddles, but they were always too simple for their own good. It's why they failed against the likes of Malgus. Though the chances are that the axe of the three, that was now of two, would likely be able to hold their own against any other assaults pressed forward by Malgus or the Sith. Revan pointed to the star map and noted how out of date the readings were. They were even more out of date than he was, though as he looked at it, it gave him some more insight than he would initially believe. Despite the star maps not having been updated, it would do them better. Revan used the table to zoom in on the maps that were pulled up, and it closed in on the three planets of the far west side of the galaxy. They were all in a row. It was the same three planets that Sola mentioned previously. How interesting. They embedded the map within the sphere, but it was also on the exterior for those who could read it. Something was off with this. Revan looked at the sphere and held it up. As he examined it, he asked Sola if she noticed anything else about the sphere that she didn't mention. She said that she didn't find anything else, but if she may, be as still bold to state it, that it seemed like there was something wrong. Revan looked over to her and waited for her to come forward. She was obviously timid because of her experience with Malgus, but when he wasn't as hostile, she moved forward and stood close to him, but not too close. She showed Revan that the designs on the sphere were different than the markings on the interior. He asked what she was referring to. She expressed that clearly they were trying to send mixed signals about where the artifacts were going. She took the sphere down and allowed the table to do a full scan of the sphere before putting up two holograms side by side. One was a sphere laid out on a flat map, and the other one was a star map from the interior. He looked at it and immediately caught what she was saying. There it was. Revan figured it out. He told the others to look closer. The stars that were charted went in the same three planets, but they gave precise locations. Of course, the star map on the exterior was carved in, so it was permanent. The map from the interior was simply a mirror. In other words, the intention was for the people who took it, if they were not this, to open it up and trust the wrong set of coordinates. Like Revan said, the ancient Biss believed they were clever when in reality, they were just stupid. Revan turned back to the front of the ship and called out an order and told the crew to plot a course to Sierra. The fleet needed to be ready for anything. The deckhands quickly got to work. Revan turned to Sola and told her that she'd be staying with his army for the time being. She might as well get herself comfortable and acquainted with the troops they were going to be serving with. Revan shooed Malik away and told him to take Sola to the troops. Malik bowed and started away. Revan turned back and walked across the catwalk to the front of the bridge and watched as his fleet departed in hyperspace. Malik and Sola were both very quiet and didn't say anything, which was fine. Sola's ribs still hurt, so talking wasn't exactly the most fun experience for her. 
but she was actively trying to turn that pain into fuel for the dark side. It was a learning experience. As they came down, Malik stopped. He looked at Sola as if he was listening to something, and then he barged into a room. There were a number of acolytes and marauders standing around. In the front was a lieutenant or the highest ranking Sith in the army that wasn't Malik or Revan. Sola stepped in behind Malik, and he told her that this was Coriel Sue, and the rest of them could be introduced by Coral if he wanted. Sola nodded her head and watched Malik. He stared at Coriel as if there was some tension between the two of them before whipping around and storming out of the room. Sola looked back and Coral said that she shouldn't worry about Malik. She nodded her head and looked around. Coral asked where she was coming from. She recognized a couple of individuals from the bridge, but Coral was there too. Maybe he wasn't paying attention, but she said that she was last deployed at this. One of the Sith spoke up telling her that she had to tell them about her experience there. From what the troops heard, they won the battle. Sola nodded her head and told them that it was a fierce fight, but with Lord Malgus, they were able to storm the planet and catch the Republic off guard. Coral smiled and told her that it was always good to crush the Republic forces. Sola nodded her head. She said that it was much more enjoyable with the clones than it was with the droids. Coral agreed. He said nothing beat crushing a clone's windpipe or simply killing them. They were all brothers so it made their pain so much easier to feed off of. Some of the Sith ferried in and out of the room, but for the most part they stayed in the room talking about the conquest and so forth. What surprised the troops were her interactions with Malgus. She didn't bad talk him, she just told more PG stories of what she experienced under his command. She now got to learn what it felt like to serve under Malik and Revan. Coral mentioned that Revan could be a mean cuss sometimes, but nothing in comparison to Malik. He could get upset and then he would just let it ride within him for the longest time. Coral expressed that there was a growing tension between Malik and Revan. Not that he believed it would come to a boiling point, or at least not openly admitting that he believed it would. The troops also told her about their previous couple battles. They were stuck in a line of battles against the Separatists, which was really quite a drag. The battle droids were a pain to deal with, mostly due to their exorbitant numbers. It was hard to compete with, though Coral showed a lot of excitement for working under Revan. His strategy is what got them through, because unlike Malgus, Revan knew how to persevere with his troops. Revan was going four battles strong, he won four of them and he had a draw at the other. This was four battles back to back to back to back without having to wait for troops or fresh supplies. He was a brilliant tactician. Sola saw this as a night to day contrast with Malgus, because he had absolutely no issue sacrificing any and all troops whenever he wanted. But because of that, Malgus was stuck on this, which gave the other two from the former Axis of Three to form up the defenses and prepare. Malgus also got a little cocky which meant a number of civilians were able to escape and inform the Republic of the strategy used during the Battle of Abyss. Kroll came back and told Sola about their previous battle. The order of the four battles they had were victory, draw, victory, and of course the previous battle, which was a victory. Sola looked up and he jumped up expressing, it was a slaughter. The Republic and the Separatists were interlocked in a battle when they arrived. Sola asked about that, because she thought that they typically didn't fight. Kroll said that they didn't, which is why it was peculiar. He said that despite Revan not thinking the Seppies were onto the Starforge, Kroll thought they were. He believed that they knew everything about the weapon. Anyways, he told her that they jumped the gun and Revan was able to perfectly sweep them. She asked what it was, and he essentially said they split the fleet up, went around the backside of the unsuspecting fleets and blindsided both of them. With nowhere to go, they ran forward and all they could do was run into each other, which is why the debris field was so close to the other. She admired the move. Coral was exhilarated about this, he was so pumped about it. He told her that this group of Sith was unlike any other group of Sith in the galaxy. They may have been with Lord Revan, but they were quite the group. They were all good with each other, though Sola realized something. Despite there supposed to be a mix of Acolytes and Marauders, this was only a group of Sith Marauders. It wasn't mixed and matched. Coral was the lead of them both, but he was a Marauder too. Though Coral didn't make a mention of it. He just expressed that his loyalties lay with Revan. As the trip through hyperspace passed by, Kurl and Sola continued the structuring of their alliance. While Sola wasn't technically a marauder or an acolyte, she was a Sith. She was just like them, and Kurl and the other marauders welcomed her into their ranks. As Kurl liked to believe the acolytes were more so for cannon fodder, but the marauders were the ones you brought in when you wanted to ensure victory came. The group told each other stories of conquest and even delusions of grandeur. Some of the Marauders wished to be students of Exar, Malgus, Kraya, or Vitiate, while others believed they could become worthy of the rank of Sith Lord. Of course, it was all a bit of fun banter, but one could see how high or how low a Marauder held themselves. During the talk, Korra would leave and then he'd come back within 20-30 minutes, as he expressed he liked to give consistent updates to Lord Revan. Sola asked why Korra never mentioned Malak, and he simply laughed it off. 
He told her that Malik was a fall guy. Revan didn't care about him. Or at least this was from Koro's perspective because he couldn't see why Revan would ever care about Malik. He was just a waste of space. Koro believed that he should be with Revan and be his apprentice. But this wasn't something he often vocally said, let alone said to Sola in the moment. At the end of their journey, Revan activated the switch to inform the troops of the vessel to prepare for the ground invasion. They didn't really know what they were arriving to here at Syria, but Revan wanted the troops to be ready. If there was a battle to be fought on the ground, then they would fight it. If not, no worry. But it was better to be prepared for anything at all times. Coriel told Sola to tag along with him, so that's what she did. The other marauders and acolytes had to ferry themselves down with the regular troops, while Coriel got to go down in the last few dropships, which meant for him, he'd be safe from whatever ground fire there was. Coriel was a frontline warrior, but it was his way of gaslighting the troops into believing he was one of them. As he and Sola made their way to their dropship, the doors closed, and they stood on the interior alone. He said that she would probably be around here for a while, so she might as well understand the chain of command here. He said that the grunts were all here to make sure he got to the surface safe. If she wanted any part of that, then she was more than welcome to join him. It was clear that despite his outward hostility to just about everyone, Coriel took a liking to Sola. He expressed that what he did for his troops was serve on the front lines, but he told them that Revan wanted him at the last transport to the surface just to keep him safe. The truth is, Coriel told his troops he wasn't allowed to be at the front lines per the command of Revan. The troops bought it, and so when Coral came running up to the front lines after the landing procedure, it was his way of saying he would fight with his men until the bitter end. While Coriel loved the conquest, he didn't care about any of them. Only little of this was ever revealed to Sola. He just told her that he preferred to get a running start at the front lines anyways, which is why he was fine with the last vessel. How interesting. Regardless, it was a wheel of fortune with Coriel, as she came to find out. As the fleet exited hyperspace, the ship rocked back and forth. They just entered another battle. Revan called over the intercoms and called out battle for mission 37. Sola looked over at Coriel and he smiled, pulling a helmet over his head and telling her that they were going to be boarding the enemy vessel and taking over the capital ship. Sola looked back with a shocked expression, saying that she thought Revan didn't risk his forces. He didn't. It was calculated. The bay doors opened and the dropships ferried out. At the same time, Malik was sent to the surface of Sira alone. The Separatists had tracked the Republic fleet out this far and ended up engaging them again. Jedi Master Even Peel and Captain Tarkin were leading the campaign out here, and then they got jumped by the Separatists. Admiral Trench didn't know what the Republic was doing, which is why he kept beginning engagements with them. He assumed that the Republic was trying to get around his flanks to get reinforcements. The only reason he engaged the Republic is because he believed they were coming for him, when in reality, he wasn't even in the viewfinder. The fleet engaged in battle. Revan could see the command ships for the Separatists and the Republic. Luckily, the Republic was on the far side of the planet. The Separatists were in the middle, and the Sith were behind them. The only thing they had to do was take out the Separatists and chase down the Republic. Truthfully, Revan believed that even Peel would dip before he could even get to them, simply based on an algorithm of previous battles involving an inferior Republic fleet, though there was one outlier. But as Revan learned, Skywalker has since been dealt with by Nihilus. The dropships ripped out of the hangar bays and started towards the Separatist flagship. It was a Lucre Hulk, and Revan had one instruction, capture the ship. He didn't care how it was done, he just wanted one on his fleet. The dropships didn't encounter too much flak as they sped towards the back of the line. The flak that hit the fleet upon their arrival was stray shots from Republic lines. The dropships sped through the field of combat as the Lucre Hulk's rear cannons turned the fire at the dropships. Luckily, the cannons were heavy cannons. Unluckily, the dropships were in a batch of vessels heading in one direction. They broke off into evasive action. The flak was stiff, but the dropship pilots were some of the best within the ranks of the Sith army. They slipped through the fire and avoided a couple of spare vulture droids, as the Sith made their landing procedure on the interior. Once they broke into the hangar bays, the Sith exited from their vessels, and the droids who maintained the interiors were caught off guard. Warriors ignited their lightsabers, and Coriel ignited his lightsaber inside the ship. When the doors opened, Sola leapt out, igniting the crimson blade and watching his flames engulf the interior of the ship. At the command of the Separatist fleet was Captain Mark Tuck. He was ordering the fleet around and combating against the strategy of Captain Tarkin to perfection. Master Peel knew this battle would be a decisive loss, so he tried to order Tarkin into a retreat, but the captain was adamant that a break would come. With the Republic fleet holding, there was no guarantee they'd be able to handle themselves against both fleets. Tarkin was gunning for Captain Took, though. They had bad blood because of the skirmish over Ord Mantel, one that Tarkin lost. His emotions got the best of him, and his outright disliking of the Jedi was showing more and more. Tuck noticed the Republic not calling off their assault and proposed a strategy where the Separatists could loop around the starboard side of the flank, pop the Republic, and then pull the fleet around and hold off the Sith. Though his strategy changed as he started receiving news of Sith inside of his flagship. 
He looked on the monitors and saw dozens of Sith warriors running down the halls, though Tuck noticed something in particular. Unlike previous Sith iterations, they would rip the ship apart. They were actively trying to avoid damaging the interior of this vessel. Tuck turned to the droids and gave them all a command to obliterate the ship. He knew that Revan wouldn't get on the ship, per se, but their fleet would get into range of the explosion if the Separatists moved out of the way. Tuck ordered the fleet to move ahead and he would join them. The Kata Nemonian captain abandoned the bridge and made his way down the halls with an escort. In the lower levels of the vessel, Sola and Coriel were moving side by side. This wasn't intentional. They got separated in the hangar bay, and while they were separated, they destroyed a number of droids. They rekindled when they helped each other take down a bundle of destroyer droids. Sola was impressed with Coriel's skill. For a marauder, he wasn't too bad. Typically, they were brutes that swung their lightsabers without any finesse, but he had it. Coral was also very impressed with her. Aside from the rumors circulating from Biss, and the little input he got during their time in hyperspace, he didn't expect her to be so proficient with the blade and with the force. She used the reverse grip of the Form 2 blade, and it was really awkward to look at but she made it look natural. It was partially of her design, which is why it was an odd look. They charged down the hallways until a rocket blasted part of the ship apart. Tuck told the Hellfires in the hangar bay to detonate the hallways and kill as many as possible, which is what they did. The Hellfires opened up and the Sith were left either to be blown to hell or get sucked into the abyss of space. Sola and Koro were running down the hallway, ducking and avoiding super battle droids in the lot. All of a sudden, one of those Hellfire rockets sped past them and slammed into the wall, opening up a hole on the backside of the ship. Both Coral and Sola saw the hole and looked at it for a moment. They could see the Sith fleet before they got sucked towards it. Sola reached out and grabbed onto the wall, and then she grabbed the only thing she could reach to the closest person to her, which happened to be Coral. She grabbed the back of his robes, and so as the abyss of space was pulling him towards it, he was gasping for air. He looked back and saw her arms, his legs flailing in the air as he pulled his arms back and lashed onto her arm. Her grip on the corner of the wall was slipping, but they were able to hold on just long enough for the ratio to open up and allow them to drop. They both fell to the ground and laughed it off, helping each other off their feet and then looking at each other. The first words out of Coral's mouth was, Do you want to get that Nemodian with me? Of course she did. They grabbed their lightsabers and continued forward. They worked their way through the battle droids and got to an elevator. As they caught their breath, they wondered where the rest of their forces were. Coral expressed that it didn't matter. They would show up, or they wouldn't. Perhaps they'd be able to capture the ship together and prove to Revan why she should be here. Sounded like a good plan to her. She didn't care much for the other troops anyways, but figured she'd ask just in case he was concerned about them at all. But as is the way of the Sith. When the doors opened, there was what looked to be a brigade of B2 battle droids. Their lightsabers ignited and they moved forward. Sola and Coriel blocked every shot they could, using the force to throw rockets back at the droids. The two of them got forward, and Coral told her to cover him. She listened as his lightsaber extinguished and he rolled behind her. Back to back, he reached out with the force, using all of his pain, anger, and passion to rip panels off the wall and fling them behind him. Massive chunks of the wall slid past Sola and Coral and crushed into the battle droids. The battle droids were fighting with so much power as they could, but they weren't getting anywhere. Sola stopped when Coral looked over at her. She was gritting her teeth. In front of her hands were every single blaster shot that was being fired at their direction, and she was holding them. She was slipping, so Coral joined her. It was a massive focus, because there were rockets and several thousand blaster bolts. The two of them used all their strength and flung the blaster bolts back out. The battle droids ripped the pieces, and the rockets blew open the walls. But they were closer to the middle of the ship, so they didn't open the halls in the space. They ran forward with a clear path, and then they threw their lightsabers into the wall so they could cut it down and get into the bridge. Their blades rolled around each side of the door and met in the middle. They used the force and launched the door in and ran in. The entire bridge was empty, and they looked out. The Separatist fleet was moving away. The Republic fleet, on the other hand, was making a swift retreat. Tarkin's arrogance cost the Republic a couple support ships. He pulled the fleet away, and as Korra was looking out the battle, Sola told him they needed to run. She pulled his arm backwards and told him to contact the fleet. They started running as an explosion sounded from the bridge. Korra yelled out to Revan, telling him to get away from the ship. It was a bomb. Revan nearly panicked when the news came over the comms. He told the fleet to disperse, which put them into a terrible position strategically. But he did it. Inside of the Lucre Hulk, the Sith dropships evacuated from the ship, but they ended up leaving behind both Coral and Sola, who didn't know they were still alive. The two of them ran through the broken halls as they tried to get away, down to the hangar bay. An explosion broke off and blew them into a wall. Coral was the first to get up, and he pulled Sola off the ground, and they continued running forward. She noted that that wasn't very Sith-like of him. It was kind of peculiar, but she didn't have time to think about it. They got to the hangar bay eventually, and it was mostly void. They looked back and forth. The ship continued to rumble and they began the stabilizers to break, so the ship began to tilt. Coral and Sola continued running forward, and they found a shuttle. As they got in, Coral and Sola jumped into the pilot's seats and pulled away. 
They hit the throttle as hard as they could as they exited the vessel. The explosions cut through the walls behind them, and they were able to barely avoid being hit by the explosions. They pulled the Separatist shuttle through the end of the hangar bay and felt the shockwave of the explosion throw the ship they were in further. They were able to successfully escape, but they weren't done yet. They still had to get back to the fleet. Revan was able to pull everything back together in a relatively timely manner, which allowed him to make a successful counterattack on the Separatists. Captain Tuck was surprised and decided that he would let the battle come to an end today. In his book, it was a draw. To Revan, it was a victory. Inside the Separatist shuttle, Coral and Solo looked at each other. The shuttle was drifting slowly towards the flagship, and they turned their chairs towards each other. They leaned in and put their foreheads together. There wasn't much more than that that needed to be said or done. They both, in their own way, were able to thank the other for being there for them. Was it a break in their Sith code, or was it something more? The two of them held their heads against each other for what felt like hours, but it was only moments. When they arrived back in the flagship, they exited the shuttle to see the other Sith Marauders and Acolytes standing there. Most of them had survived. Coral was furious, but he didn't show it, and the only reason is because Lord Malak's vessel was arriving at the same time. He had to be obedient for the arrival of the true second in command. Malak walked out of the vessel and turned to see Coral and Sola standing next to each other. He turned and walked away, holding a small object in his hands. Coral turned and walked over to the troops and told them that they did well in their mission. Sola watched on a little bit in confusion. When he was done, he came back towards her and thanked her for saving his life when a hole was blasted in the side of the ship. She said to him that she didn't really do anything, he just held on. It was a funny but charming little moment between the two of them. On the bridge, Malik and Revan were holding the artifact collected from the surface of Sarah. It was found in a small broken down structure. It wasn't too difficult to find, it was a small triangle. On one side was a small structure that Malik found the artifact at. On the other side was a cave painting, which was certainly odd, and on the last side there was a structure. Revan looked at the structure and then pulled up a hollow map of the current city located in Bakura and the structure wasn't present on the updated hollow map of the city. Revan looked at his student, and then to the front of the bridge. He told them to prepare invasion forces for an attack at Bakura. Our season begins at the arrival of Bakura. Revan's fleet dropped out of hyperspace, and the Sith Lord looked over the planet. He observed everything and realized that the actual chances of the defense force countering them were extremely unlikely, simply based off the lack of fleet or defense force outside the system. He turned to Malik and told him to maintain control over the bridge. His student nodded his head and watched Revan make his way down to the hangar bay where his troops were located. When he arrived, he told the troops that they were to prepare for a malicious resistance. Despite the fact that they were actively trying to conquer the planet and find an artifact, they were not supposed to be destroying anything. The main directive was to keep as much of the city intact as possible. Coriol and Solo looked on, standing next to each other and awaiting the Sith Lord's instructions for the landing procedure. He told them it would be a normal landing procedure, escorted by fighter cover, to ensure they were able to survive any potential flag. Solo looked over at Coriel, and he waved her on, as they entered one of the main dropships and waited for the go-ahead command. When the order came, the gunships lifted off and sped out of the hangar bays of the fleet. Inside the bridge of the capital ship, Malak watched in silence. He waited for the ships to file out of the hangar bays before turning back around and walking to a hollow map that would depict the entire battle about to take place. Inside of the dropship, Sola stood silently next to Coriel. They were holding onto the bars overhead and felt the ships rock back and forth. Gunships weren't always the most stable vessels to travel in, so this was common. He asked her if she was ready to win this, and she nodded her head with confidence. The descent to the surface was silent and they landed on the ground. The first troops exited their shuttles. Revan specifically wanted to land outside the city. He didn't want to alarm a neutral population. If they were indeed neutral, then they should have no issue going in and securing the artifact, wherever it may be. Revan stepped out by his side where a couple of guards, and he walked up to Coral and told him to prepare the troops for their march into the city. The Sith Marauder nodded his head and rounded the troops up and told them to march forward. The sounds of their feet were all silenced by the mud they were collectively trying to avoid slipping in. Coriel called Sola over and told her that the troops were moving in. She was looking at something in the distance, but it seemed to be nothing. Revan looked over the troops as their procession approached the gates of the city. He acknowledged how prideful it looked. The Sith Empire was a true force to be reckoned with, and the galaxy knew it. He turned to Coriel and told him that they would begin moving into the city and search for the artifact. Revan held out his hand and displayed a triangular artifact. He pointed to the third side and told him and Sola that this is what they were looking for, and it would likely be part of an older structure. Revan suggested it would likely be in the center of the city, as cities tend to start inward and expand outward. If they could find the structure, they would likely find what they were searching for. Coral asked about the cave, and Revan suggested that the cave was most likely on Endor's system. They would be going there next. Because despite the lack of civilized population here, there were a group of evil teddy bears that existed on the other planet and despite their small stature, they would be a nightmare for their visitors. He didn't want to deal with that until they got what they wanted from Bakura. It was all a part of the plan for Revan. 
He put the artifact on his belt, and then the sound of an explosion sounded off, and cries from the city let out in a united front. The militia. Revenant ignited his lightsaber and charged forward. Coriel and Solo were right behind him. The marauders and acolytes on the front lines pushed forward and began to attack the front lines. On the grounds, hundreds of troopers were strewn about. Most were killed. Those not initially killed in the blast were shot down. The mud was an ally to the militia, but it would only work for so long. While the troopers were slipping in the mud and struggling to get to the blown open gates, the Sith acolytes and marauders were not. Coriel and Sola followed Revan. His precision with the lightsaber was to be admired. He quickly deflected anything that came his way with flawlessness. He leapt forward into the air and over the gates into the city. Coriel and Sola were left in shock, but they followed in after their troopers and other Sith. The battle on the interior of the city was quick. The militia was no real defense, and against the Sith and troopers, they were no match. Though Revan made it clear that those who tried to fight against them were to be killed. No one else. It was a conquest, not a genocide. Coriel and Sola could see Revan in the distance. His blade was quick and he made every move flawless as possible. He slammed his blade across members of the Bakura militia. Sola and Coriel bunkered down behind a building avoiding a shell from militia tank. They had built themselves defenses in case anyone came, whether it be Sith, CIS, or Republic. They were prepared for anything that came their way. Revan ordered the troops forward as Sola and Coral pulled around the building moving side by side with each other. They blocked shots, but not nearly as efficiently as Revan did. They pushed forward, leaping over dead bodies and ducking under shells from heavy tanks. Sola reached her hand on a blasted lightning at a tank which shut down this heavy cannon, but at the same time Coral climbed up the side of the weapon and sent his blade down across the cannon itself. He backflipped off and Sola used all of her strength to throw the tank backwards as it exploded, killing a dozen militiamen. Revan was right behind them running past him and using the force to pull two tanks together and force them to explode through a collision. He rounded the troops up in the city square, where the silence filled the air. The battle had seemingly come to an end, relatively short at that. Revan pointed at Coral and Sola, telling them to go round up a dozen troops and prepare to go into the structures. They nodded their heads and got to it. While they were searching for the best troops, Revan pulled the artifact from his belt and held it up. He called it brilliant, but it was just simply evolution. The structure was right in front of him, but it was built over top of, though the original design of the building was implemented in the art on the front of the building. The people of Bakura saw it as respecting the elders, not as a means to locate an artifact they didn't know existed. Coriel and Sola walked side by side as they thanked each other for helping take down those tanks. Through hyperspace, they expanded upon their development of their relationship. The two of them were able to talk about their future thoughts, and Coriel admitted that the future seemed bright for him, still not hinting at his interest to become Malak's replacement. As for Sola, she didn't know what her future held yet, though she expressed joy, in a way, that she had found herself someone to be allies with. They both enjoyed each other's company, and they got along. Being able to fight well with each other on the battlefield was also great for the true Sith within each of them. Regardless, they gathered up their troops quickly and moved back to Revan's location. They went in. The building was massive, but the interior felt crammed. As they walked in, they could see it looked barren from life. Obviously, the modern structure was maintained, but there was no one inside. Revan turned around and told the troops to fan out. They were looking for an access point. What they were going to try and do was get below the structure. That's what he believed it would be. Coral and Sola split up, each of them looking around followed by two troopers as they scoured the area. Revan held the artifact in his hand, analyzing it, and looking around the main hallway of the building. He looked up at the massive open space above him and then he looked back down. The triangular artifact reflected what was on the exterior and then it clicked. While the ancient Bekura built the structure here, in the last millennia, had to have been taken down and replaced by this building. In remembrance of the original structure, they left space for where the original stood. It was much thinner than the modern one. The walls were marked with the design of the original structure. Revan looked at the ceiling, which was a good ten or so stories above him. Looking back down and seeing the markings on the ground, he paced around the marking, trying to see if he could recognize it. Revan called Sola over and asked her if she recognized anything about the designs here from her time on Bis. She shook her head, though she admitted that the ancient Bis and Bakra likely were similar to some degree. He asked how, and she pointed at the ground and then traced a circular object on the ground in the air. She said that perhaps it was a depiction of Bis, but she pointed and suggested he take notice of how it came to an end in the middle. Down here, she lifted her finger up and pointed directly to the southwest side of the hall. Revan looked at her and then moved closer to her side to get a perspective from her point of view as he looked up and saw the corner of the room. That looked odd. He turned his head and looked at the other corners. While the other corners were all similar, it was obvious this one was slightly different. Revan and Sola moved towards the corner together and he put his hand up against it. He realized it was a flat surface. It was a door. The people made it an optical illusion to make sure no one could find the entrance into the catacombs. Revan pulled the door open and he called up to the troops and told them to get into position. Within 30 seconds, the troops all got to the area and were ready. 
His lightsaber ignited, and he told them to prepare for any potential threats. If threats approached, they were to be neutralized. Revan thanked Sola for her insight and moved forward. Cora looked at her and nodded his head, his smile being hidden under his mask. She followed the troops in, and the last ones out kept an eye out for the sixth. The lightsaber didn't really do much for their view, but it was better than nothing. Revan's foot hit the ground and he noticed it was soaking down here. He looked down both hallways and told the group to stick together. They had plenty of time to kill, there was no need to risk troops for any potential threats that lay down here. Coral hated how cautious Revan was being, but he dared not say anything to reject what the Sith Lord was doing. The group of 27 members moved forward cautiously. The sides of the catacombs were layered with corpses buried into walls and coffins. It was so creepy, but for a Sith Lord and the two Sith that followed him, it only made their call to darkness ever more prevailing. Revan stopped at a split in the hall. He could hear water dripping from one hallway and he told the troopers to follow him as he proceeded down that exact hallway. They kept their eyes peeled for anything in particular, but nothing came. As they did, a man from behind the group yelled out in some unknown language and fired a shot, killing the last trooper in the flank. The men turned around and opened fire, but it was already too late. Revan heard the rushing of waves and told the troops to run backwards towards the other split hallway. They turned back and hauled down the hallway. One of the men split off, deciding against Revan's orders. Then, three more troops followed him. Sola and Coral ran the other direction, and the rest of the troops followed them. Revan was the last up the other side, but as they ascended the other hallway, they could hear the four men get swept away by the flood, and their deaths were shortly followed by the sound of blaster fire. Coral asked Revan how he knew, and he told him that he could see the slight incline. He turned to the rest of the troops and told them that listening to the orders to save their lives, it'd be best to not make the same mistake as the others. 22 remained. Revan turned back and he could see that the hallway from here was singular. He told them that the Bakura wouldn't dare risk their artifacts. Even if the people from the modern era didn't know what they were protecting, the ancient people did. Sola asked what he meant. He started forward expressing that the traps laid here were more than a millennia old. That's why the water was dripping. Revan expressed that he wanted to make sure that the water wasn't a diversion. In reality, it was just one of the ancient traps becoming unstable, which would be why the floors down here in the catacombs were so loose. They continued forward for several more paces, and they could feel the slight incline dip lower and lower. The troops began getting nervous, but as Revan expressed, the rest of the traps from here on out would be surviving rebels or traps set by the ancients. The troops continued checking their six, but nothing came. Revan stopped and put his hand out, stopping Coral, who was walking nearly side by side with them. Coral looked over, and Revan pointed forward with his lightsaber. It was a pressurized trap. Revan took one of the troopers' blasters and tossed it a couple feet in front of him, and watched a number of traps deploy. They grabbed the weapon, and continued along the path. As they were walking, blaster fire erupted, igniting the hallways into a frenzy of terror and flashing red lights. The troops turned back, but they dropped to the ground quickly. Sola ran forward, igniting her lights for filling in for the trooper who was killed. Revan ran forward and told the troops to hurry up. These rebels would fill the catacombs quickly. Sola backpedaled, stepping over the dead bodies with another troop by her side as he laid down heavy fire over her shoulder into the rebels. They rounded the corner and Revan looked into a hollow tomb. The sound of blaster fire was distracting, so he told Coriel to search the tomb for anything relating to the triangular artifact. Revan rushed forward and darted out from the middle between the trooper and Sola. He ignited two lightsabers and told Sola to get into the room and find what they came for him. She turned around quickly and moved into the room to find Coriel, searching for anything he could find. There was a coffin in the tomb, but it was locked into the ground. From above their position, a fire rained down on them. The catacombs were so tightly interweaved that there were blaster holes for the rebels to protect the artifact. The room was a kill box, and the coffin couldn't be accessed easily. Sola and Coral raised their weapons to defend themselves as their troopers dropped to the ground next to them. Those who weren't killed in the initial barrage fired back, spreading out. They could hear a couple of the militiamen getting clipped, but the resistance was proving more and more effective the longer time went on. Revan continued cutting through the rebels and militiamen on the other side. The halls were so narrow and allowed for the perfect kill box for the Sith Lord as he spun his way through his foes, before returning back to the tomb to find the chaos. Revan reached out and ripped people's legs of the holes, which made them targets. He looked to Sola and Coral, telling them to find the artifact. Coral looked at her and nodded his head. She quickly got down to the ground and started trying to pull the coffin up. She found a latch, which released the coffin. When she pulled it, the coffin shot up, launching one of the troopers into the ceiling. Though there was an issue, all the blaster holes locked up. Sola looked to the ground and Revan turned over, after realizing what happened. The kill box wasn't just a box to trap those in here so they could be shot. Instead, it was a perfect device that trapped them and then drowned them. Water started to gush out from where the tomb was. Sola looked to Revan and he urged her to hurry up. Sola got down to the side of the tomb and looked around. He and Coral got around to the other side. It was incredibly dark in here, but the troopers had flashlights on their weapons and held them up. 
though it wasn't helping considering that the few of them that survived were shaking. They were petrified of drowning, but they had to put their faith into their unmerciful overlords. Revan put his hand up to the side of the tomb and found some pieces that were strewn about. On the other side, Sola did too. She started twisting the piece and the water flowed faster. She put it back and it slowed down. She called over to Revan and told him that she found pieces. He got up and ran over and noticed that they were the same. They were out of order. The water was rising up past their knees at this point and the entire tomb was about to be submerged. Revan told Coriel to come where they were and he did. Revan grabbed the artifact from his hand and held it up. He told her they needed to make this shape on both sides. So quickly, that's what they did, moving it in the piece. Everything stopped. Did they do it? The troops took a deep breath until the walls opened up and they heard screaming. The militia men who were firing down on them were drowned and water began flowing through the blast ports and the room was filling up at twice the speed. Revan looked at her and asked her to figure it out. She didn't know what she was doing. He looked at his side and then her side. They were perfectly aligned. Revan knew it wouldn't make any difference cutting the top of the tomb off because sure he could get the artifact but what could that do him if he died? They'd still drown. They were stories below ground with no way out. Not even the ancient Bakura gave safety to their own defenders. They needed to fix this water issue first. Sola and Revan looked at their issue and continued to sort through it. Coral looked at the size, but it was filling up. They now had to dive under the water to look at it. Coral got the artifact and got down to Sola's side and tilted the artifact upside down. He told her to reverse the image and then quickly shuffled to the other side of chest high water to Revan's side to tell him the same thing. As they quickly dove under the water to hold their breaths, they reorganized the puzzle on the side, but nothing happened. Revan and Sola popped up and looked at each other as the troops in the room looked for a way out. Their panic wasn't helping the situation. Revan said they needed to figure a way out of this now. Sola and Coriel thought for a moment and Sola told them they should try pressing the sides in. That was something, it might work. Both of them dropped down and held their breath. Sola pushed but nothing happened and then Revan pushed and nothing happened. The air window was getting tighter and tighter as Coriel and the men looked at what was likely their last chance of breathing. Under the water, Sola tapped Revan on the shoulder and he looked at her. She put up three fingers to insinuate that they go at the same time. Three, two, one. Sola and Revan pushed as hard as they could, but it didn't take much pressure as the pieces quickly shuffled into the sides of the coffin. The entire room lifted upwards as Revan and Sola were thrown to the bottom of the room. The water and pressure, the weight pushing them upwards crushed their bodies. It hurt so badly until they were relieved when they were released into the city square. The troops, Coriel, Revan, and Sola all caught their breaths as they were launched upwards. Coriel went to Revan's side and helped him up, and then came over to Sola who was on her hands and knees, coughing up water that got stuck in her throat on the way up. As they caught their breath, they heard a ticking sound and assumed it was a bomb. They quickly got to their feet, Coral putting his hand on her Sola's arm and pulling her up as they all leapt away from the tomb. Revan was the only one who didn't move as he stood next to it and watched the latch on the side unlock and pop off. He leaned over and used his upper body to shove the topmost part of the coffin off and allowed it to crash to the ground. Revan looked in. There was a dead body in the coffin. The man was holding a staff of sorts and Revan reached down and grabbed it, pulling it away from the cold and dead corpse that had been preserved for so long. Revan looked at the staff and held it up to the air, but as he did, he could feel the weight of the staff get lighter. How odd. He pulled the staff back down and examined it as it began to disintegrate in his very hands. He told it to stop like that would help, and then the dust slowly fell to the floor. Coriel and Sola stood up and looked over at Revan. He was silent for a moment. He just watched as wind carried the dust of the staff off into the distance. All this work, all this conquest and slaughter just for the staff to fall into dust in his hand. He looked over it and anger filled his face. Sola stepped forward cautiously. She wanted to examine the coffin and he asked her what she was doing. She pointed at the coffin and he looked at her like she had lost her mind. Clearly there was nothing in the coffin that could be used to find the Starforge. They had to find another means to getting there. Sola looked down into the coffin and saw a necklace around the neck of the man. Though it wasn't just a necklace, it was a ring. Sola reached down into the coffin and pried the necklace away from the old rusted body. She pulled it up by the strings and examined it. The ring was thick, but it was just another piece of the puzzle. She looked at Revan and then he looked at her and walked over and reached his hand out for it and she gently placed it over into his hand. Quirrell told her that she did well and she smiled at him before turning back to the Sith Lord, who took the ring and placed it in the palm of his hand. He looked through the wreckage and kicked the dead body out of the way and pulled the triangular artifact from the ground and told everyone that they'd be returning to the fleet. It was time to head to Endor. Revan turned to Coral and Sola and told them to stay here. They wouldn't be going to the fleet with the troops, they'd accompany him. Truthfully, Revan was really taking a liking to both of them. Coral was a good commander of the troops, but Sola was extremely helpful in some of the less characteristic ways of the Sith. She had the smarts to pull off some things he needed done, which would be helpful in the long run. He did acknowledge that she wasn't exactly the traditional Sith, but to him, that didn't matter in all honesty. He told them that they did well today, and he would like to continue serving with them. 
though he explained that what they might find on Endor would challenge them. He turned and they followed him. Revan went into a tirade about the Ewoks and how they were cute and cuddly but they were truthfully monsters. They were at flesh from bone and they hunted like the best of them. Going the Endor would challenge them unlike Sarah and Bakura. He urged them to be prepared for what came next. They entered the dropship and got in. The bay doors were open and he watched as the troops mounted up and prepared to return to the fleet. When they returned to the flagship, Coral and Solo walked out of the dropship and watched Revan as he took the artifacts towards the bridge. Coral told her that he was very grateful to have her by his side. He enjoyed her, in general. Sola smiled and expressed happiness too. She told him that her time with Malgus wasn't exactly the most productive, and she appreciated being able to be appreciated. For her, it was a new take on being a Sith, and she felt that it could only allow her passion to blossom. Speaking of such passion, since the hangar bay was empty, a long but not too long kiss was shared between the two Sith. When it broke off, they looked at each other with nearly radiant smiles, and essentially saluted to the future of the Sith. As the troops returned from Bakura, they split off and prepared for whatever Revan was so concerned about on Endor. Sola by this point was able to enjoy her own small quarters. It wasn't much larger than a closet, but it was better than being in the barracks. Coral and Malik both had their own quarters as well, but this was saved for the last individual in the army to have their own. Sola went to sleep and relaxed for maybe the first time since being on this journey. The trip from Bist to Ciro was difficult. But she believed that if she trusted her journey, she'd be alright. Though in the middle of her trip from Bakura to Endor, she woke up in a cold sweat. Her dreams were so odd. She saw herself surrounded by Jedi in what seemed to be the ashes of the army she was currently serving with. In front of her, she could see Revan on his knees being gutted by the man they called Skywalker. She never saw what he looked like, so to her, he was just a brood of a Jedi wearing all dark Jedi robes, carrying the presence of a Jedi Grand Master, but the power of a Sith Lord. It was terrifying just to think about it, but seeing it was a different story. She looked into the eyes of death as he struck down Revan. In front of her was Coril. Skywalker turned to her as he walked forward. He flashed between Malgus and Skywalker. The moments were so quick that she could have missed it if she blinked. The terror she felt was indescribable. He raised his blade up and struck down, and that's when she woke up in a cold sweat. There was a shaking in the vessel. It sounded just like what would be typically heard when one was moving through hyperspace. It was such a bumpy ride to begin with. She laid her head back down on the bed and looked up at the ceiling. She thought of the kiss still present on her mind. She closed her eyes and pictured herself in that moment again. Then the rattling seemed more so from the interior of the vessel. Sola leaned over and stretched her arms out and looked to her left where the door was. She stood up and reached for her lightsaber. Did they arrive at Endor already? Was there a fleet battle taking place? She opened the door and walked out. The hallways were empty at the moment. How peculiar. Sola looked down and saw nothing. So she started walking. Her thoughts varied and she wondered if she was stuck inside a vision of sorts. Sola walked forward and then she could hear footsteps from behind her. One of the accolades was running in her direction. She turned back and looked at him as he got closer. His lightsaber ignited. Sola quickly pulled her blade from her belt and ignited it to defend herself. She blocked the strike immediately but she didn't have time or a stance to hold herself up and she was flung backwards. The running head start gave the accolade all the advantage she needed. He stood over her in a gloating demeanor and he lunged at her, driving his blade down, barely missing as she jumped back. The blade slammed between her legs, barely clipping her knee. She kicked forward, smacking him in the mask as she twisted around and cut against the blade, slamming into the wall. She got to her feet as fast as she could and got into a more aggressive position. His blade slammed forward and hit hers. She stumbled back, but with the element of surprise gone, she smiled with a bit of a menace behind her eyes. Her blade dragged forward and she demanded to know what a Jedi was doing aboard this ship. The acolyte scoffed at her, telling her there were no Jedi, only victors in this new era. She was surprised and slipped up. He cut across her wrist the blade not going deep enough to remove her forearm. She threw her arm back and brought her other hand down, cutting across the acolyte's bicep and dragging her blade up across his throat. Then it hit her. There was Coriol. She charged forward and the halls erupted with a firefight. Sith troopers were trying to ease the situation, but as she ran past the hangar bay, she looked in and saw the lack of humanity. It was acolytes versus marauders. They were no more than tribalistic clans trying to get a hold of a substance that was only built within their mind to have any semblance of value. She knew it wouldn't be worth her time trying to confront it. She continued running until she saw more duels taking place in the hallways. She worried if Coriol had been killed in combat. Revan and Malak were at the end of one hallway and they looked at her and told her she would die. Solo looked down at them with confusion as two cut down three acolytes to synchronization. Revan told Malik to fetch her head, and to do it quickly. He turned to the troopers behind him and expressed that they needed to find the commander of the troops and bring him to the bridge alive. Revan watched Malik barrel down the hallway after her. She turned and escaped into the hangar bay, where the massive clash was taking place. The blades of the Sith moved at extreme rates, and each attempt was one to completely destroy the other. Sola quickly ducked away from the fighting as an explosion sounded off on the side of the hangar bay. She could see a couple dozen troopers and Sith get thrown from their feet into the air. 
She escaped into a small crevice in the hangar and looked over her shoulder. She could see Coral and he was standing above his troops, and he was leading them on. He looked so prideful in what he had done. He saw Sola and smiled with a radiance as he leapt down and discreetly ran over to her side. He asked her if she was okay and she nodded her head. She asked what he was doing and he told her that he was becoming Revan's apprentice. She didn't understand and he continued telling her that he was just clearing a path for himself to rise to the top and in a way to try and get her approval asked if that was great. He said that he could eventually become a Sith Lord and he can make her his apprentice. Sola's jaw hung open. She was in utter disbelief. She asked if he was being serious and he smiled telling her that he was. He thought it would be the perfect step to ruling the galaxy together. Two Sith that had each other to rule the galaxy as one. She looked at him differently. But not just him, the entire Sith Empire. Was all this conquering really for nothing? Just an endless cycle of who would be the top dog only for one's apprentice to take over? Curl asked her why she was looking at him the way she was, and she told him that she didn't know who he was. This wasn't anything she wanted to be a part of. His lightsaber ignited, and he asked what that was supposed to mean, as he leaned the blade down and placed it right next to her throat. He told her that she would join him, or she'd be no better than the rest of the grunts here. Sola looked at the lightsaber that was close enough she could feel the pulling apart of her skin. She then looked into his eyes. The memories of the kiss haunted her. Sola put her hand up to his chest gently, and without even hesitating, he prepared to extinguish his blade. But he was launched from his feet and landed across the hangar bay, sliding across the ground. He looked over at Sola and she stood up, looking down to her side in shame as she ignited her lightsaber and spun it around in her hand. He gritted his teeth and got to his feet and launched himself forward, igniting his own blade once again. Sola had to meet his momentum, or she'd be hit the same way she was before. She ran forward and watched him leap into the air. Sola knew that he, with the high ground, would likely impair her if she continued to head on. Her legs dropped out from beneath her, and she slid across the slippery floors of the hangar bay. Their blades collided, ripping an echo through the already explosive halls. It caught the attention of a number of acolytes and marauders as they realized they had all been played for fools. Of course, a number of them continued fighting with each other, but there were those who turned their attention to what was happening right in front of them. Sola turned around and Coral had just landed his blade sweeping on the ground and raising it up. His face wore an extensive scowl on it. He launched himself back at her. She wore nothing but disappointment and betrayal on her face. Sola got up and charged him. Their feet carried them across the floors until they met their blades in the middle again. Their fight was sloppy, with neither of them true masters of the blade, but it was intense, trading blows with the other and soon realizing that all the eyes of the hangar bay were on them. Well, not all of them, but most of them. Sola knew that no matter what happened, Revan wanted her head. As for Coriel, she didn't know what was going to happen to him. She pulled back and blocked the strike, and then she spun forward, lobbing her blade backwards out towards his head. He blocked it but staggered from the blow. Coriel got anger and blasted his blade down, and she narrowly avoided it, knocking out of the way but exposing herself, which she took advantage of. His blade spun down and drove itself through the back of her thigh, and she cried in agony, slipping to the ground. He grinned and walked forward, standing over her in a commanding position. The battle was won. All he had to do was finish it and ignite the flame of this rebellion again. Sola crawled forward, having lost track of where her lightsaber went. She saw it rolling away, but she couldn't get to it in time. She leaned back and swung her uninjured leg forward, pushing herself up and hitting Coral in the throat, which threw his swing off. Unfortunately for her, the blade nestled itself gently between her collarbone and the shoulder of her blade. She let out a terrible scream and watched him stagger backwards, coughing as he did. He turned over and looked at her. One of her hands was on her shoulder and the other one was on her thigh. She was dead. He would finish this immediately. As he walked forward preparing to end her life, and clearing his throat, he heard the sound of Malik's voice. Coral turned over, his anger and pride changed into frustration and a bit of timidness. He looked at Malik, who crawled out of the crowd and stood before him, challenging him to a fight. This was by no means Malik trying to save Sola. He couldn't care less. This was him finishing what Coral started. As Malik assumed, Coral was trying to make a push for the role of apprentice to Revan, and while Malik saw this as a bit of disrespect to himself, he wasn't going to just let some brute or grunt take his role away from him. Malik didn't ignite his lightsaber. He stood waiting for Coral to make the first move. Sola looked over and winced in pain. The Sith would show her no mercy, no matter whose side she was on as she began scanning the hangar bay for an escape route. The Marauders and Acolytes fixated their attention on the Apprentice, each of them putting themselves into Coral's shoes, because even if Coral lost, they could see where Malik was weak and take advantage of his weakness. Of course, the same went for the situation in which Coral won. Coral saw his chance for victory, and he launched himself forward. Malik slid to the side, avoiding each strike the Sith made. He scoffed at him, grabbing his wrist, pulling him forward and throwing his elbow into his face. Coral dropped to the ground, and Malik kicked him in the side, telling him to get up. If Coral wanted the challenge, he had one. Oh, it's not easy fighting a Sith Lord? But it was easy turning the grunts against each other. Malik kicked Coral again and listened to the sound of the bone breaking the side. How ironic. Malik turned to the others and told them this is what delusions of grandeur got them. 
Malik ignited his lightsaber and thrusted it down towards Coral's face, and dragged the weapon across the top of his jaw and pulled the weapon down. The screeching of the lightsaber across the hangar bay floors mixed disgustingly with the sight of seeing Coral's face become disfigured. Malik grabbed Coral's blade and pulled it away from him as he knelt down and told him that the great deception came to an end here. Malik grabbed Coral by the throat and lugged him up. Malik was no Malgus, so it wasn't going to be easy holding a grown man with one of his hands, but he did it with all of his strength. Malik held Coral up to the ceiling and listened as a starfighter powered up and shot out of the hangar bay, throwing a number of acolytes and marauders to the side. Malik threw Coral to the side and contacted Revan, telling him that Solo was escaping. Revan told the deckhands to open fire on the starfighter, but as they did, the vessel jumped to hyperspace. Inside the hangar bay, Malik told all of them that if he were ever be deceived again by a fool, he would do this to each and every single one of them. Coral tried begging for mercy, but in the dark side, there is no mercy. Electricity rang out of Malik's fingertips, and he scorched the Sith Marauder into a charm. For minutes on end, the hangar bay would echo with the sounds of Coral crying out, but it wasn't incoherent screaming. It was two words, one name, Sola Grey. And that Our season continues outside of a gas giant in the Greater Jivin region of the Outer Rim Territories. A small fighter drifted out of fuel, nearing the planet's gravitational field. The ship had been sending out distress signals for days, trying to lure in assistance. Inside the Sith fighter was Sola Grey. She was nearly unconscious. She'd been conserving her breath, but if it wasn't for the air systems inside the fighter, she would have been dead. She was able to keep heat flowing through the ship while covering herself with her robes. The only benefit to her was that she carried a small Bacta with her ever since what happened to her on Biss with Malgus. She was trying to get in contact with anyone that could be considered an ally, which at this point was anyone who wasn't a Sith or a member of the Sith Empire. All she could think about is what happened in the previous days, but all of it seemed like a blur. She remembered everything from the Dream of Skywalker to the death of that traitor. Perhaps she was too brainwashed to see it before. Sola waited in silence, just pondering over the same thoughts again and again. She looked at the readers for life support system and the air systems. They were nearly depleted. Her hope had run its course. The Sith would get the Starforge and the galaxy would be lost. She prepared to send out one more transmission with the hope that someone would be able to take her knowledge and send it outwards. She hadn't told anyone where the Sith were going or what they had. She was hopeful that she could use that information to receive medical attention before going anywhere else. As she waited, she could hear a number of ships exit hyperspace from behind her. Sola's skin crawled, and she felt shivers scale her spine. She couldn't see out the back of the ship, and she held herself tighter, waiting to be blown away. Not that she could assume whoever had come was going to save her. Sola's only assumption is that she was dead, regardless what happened. A voice came over the communication device. It was a proper accent, though not one of the core worlds. It was an Iridu accent, but the man spoke with such force she could feel his icy voice as if it was crawling across her neck. Her worst fears had come true, until she heard the words, this is Captain Tarkin of the Galactic Republic Fleet. Please identify yourself. Sola jumped up, feeling the pain tearing through her shoulder as she reached for the communication device. She responded telling him that this was Sola Grey. She had information they needed, but she was in dire need of medical assistance. Tarkin was silent, and Sola could hear a voice come over the communication device. It was an elder man who was saying something about bringing her ship into theirs. Tarkin sounded disgusted when he told her to prepare for a docking. Sola listened and stayed quiet as her ship was pulled into the hangar bay of the Venator class Star Destroyer. Sola didn't realize that this was the same fleet she had seen over Sierra. There was no reason for her to believe it was anyways. Her ship slowly drifted into the hangar bay and it slammed down. Without much left in the ship, it was really just floating lifelessly. With the ship locked down the hangar bay, a number of clone troopers came to the ship with their weapons pointed at it. The pressure in the cockpit bubbled up and steam rolled out of the seat. As it did, Sola rolled forward unintentionally. She ended up falling out of the cockpit and her lightsaber rolled away from her. Master Even Peel looked down at her and told the medic to come quickly as he pulled her lightsaber with the force into his hands. The clones ran up to her and rolled her onto a stretcher and quickly pulled her away. Even Peel told the men to search the cockpit. He would go to the medical room with the clones to make sure she wasn't capable of hurting anyone in the crew. The lights flickered as Sola faded in and out of consciousness. The flickering of lights was painful to her malnourished head and the swelling only continued to grow until she woke up. She was so confused. There were a number of tubes attached to her, some of them just making sure she had enough nutrition and water to survive, as well as Bacta that covered the infections that grew on both of her wounds. She looked around. She of course was in a severe amount of pain, but she jumped when she turned over to see even Peel looking at her. He told her to relax her mind. She was not in any danger. The look of worry on her face told the Jedi Master that she didn't even believe that. Even told her that she would not have access to her lightsaber because she was a Sith. But being that she was so intent on asking for help, he was here to listen to what she had to say. He did express that he wanted the information she had to tell. 
Sola Grey acknowledged this, and then she ran through the events of the previous couple days, at least all of what she could remember. She then got to the important stuff, while leaving the breadcrumbs along the way. She didn't remember everything, but recounting most of the last couple days helped her get to an answer. She told Even that everything was likely on Endor. Chances are Revan found what he was looking for, but the rebellion aboard his ship probably slowed that down for him. Sola also told him about the ring from Bakura, the triangular artifact without a name from Sarah, and also the cave painting they were supposed to investigate on Endor. Even Peel then thanked her for her services to the galaxy. Despite where her allegiances may lay now, she did something that could potentially save billions of lives, if not trillions. He then explained that once he relayed the information to the Republic High Command, he would return and then they would have another conversation. For now, she was to remain here. Sola asked him to stop, and he turned, telling her that the information he had to tell to the Republic was urgent. She acknowledged that, but she had just one more question. He nodded his head, and she asked if she was safe. Even Peel told her that she was as safe as anyone aboard the ship was. He smiled at her and left the room. Sola put her head against the pillow on the bed and closed her eyes. On the bridge, Even Peel revealed all the information to the Jedi across the stars. The call was filled with individuals from an assortment of different locations. Anakin Skywalker was able to inform the Jedi about a Sith that he was calling the Ghost. Anakin twisted the truth and told the Jedi they encountered the Ghost on Malastare, but he escaped. Windu and Plo, on the other hand, were having no luck in finding any clues relating to the Star Forge, aside from the sword that Plo found on Mandalore, though the information on the sword was currently being analyzed on Octu by Jocasta Nu and the rest of our archivist. Tarkin pulled up a hollow map of what they believed was at Endor, based off the previous readings they had from the Battle of Sarah. The Jedi Council looked at the information and then suggested that instead of an all-out assault and the chances of losing the artifacts, they send a covert op team. Anakin asked if the Tython 4 were available, and Windu told him they were not. Currently, they were on BIS trying to do a rescue operation. They could not be disturbed, their entire purpose was to save as many people as they could and then get them off planet before the Sith Empire made a move for the other two worlds. Tarkin suggested that the Jedi use one of the more elite squads for this mission. And while Tarkin's comment did come off a bit backhanded, Considering the success of the Tython 4 had on their first mission, he was right. With Revan, Malak, and a number of angry Sith on Endor, it'd be better if the Jedi sent a more successful unit. Tarkin pulled up the records on a command table for Delta Squad. They just finished an assassination mission on one of the Sith leaders. It wasn't a Sith Lord, but a Master Sith, or something along the lines of that. Tarkin told the Jedi the squad could be on Endor within one rotation. The Council and the rest of the Republic High Command was in agreement with this. As the session was dismissed, Captain Tarkin called up upon Delta Squad, and the leader of the squad answered. His name was really simple and to the point, it was Boss. Tarkin called RC-1138 and told his squad what their mission was. They were to go onto a forested planet of Endor and search for these artifacts provided by the former Sith Solar Grey. Their mission was entirely reconnaissance. They were to not engage with the enemy. If they engaged, there would be reason to be court-martialed. There was a reason for this, and it was because Tarkin and the rest of the Republic could not afford to let the Sith know they were closing in on the Star Forge. As of right now, Tarkin and the rest of the Republic High Council believed that the Sith didn't know they were on their trail, which was correct. There were only a couple assumptions, but there was no legitimate confirmation that the Republic was actively chasing down the Star Forge. Tarkin told Delta to make sure that they knew that. Boss told him that it was perfectly understood and they would do their mission in accordance with what he laid out for them. The transmission ended and Tarkin looked down at the Jedi Master, even Peel, and told him that the Commander Squad would likely be able to accomplish their mission within two rotations. They hadn't failed a single mission yet. He even looked at the Republic Captain and asked what was on his mind. Tarkin expressed that there was nothing on his mind. He was just eager to get the artifacts so they could get to this war-ending weapon. Master Peel told the Captain that they had to be patient and trust the Commander Squad would be able to finish their mission. Tarkin nodded his head and turned to walk to the front of the bridge. He even looked at his captain, and then realized that he probably got one of the most difficult naval officers in the Republic Navy, but he would make do with it. Peel understood that Tarkin had a strong disdain for the Jedi, and because of that, he would likely be difficult for Jedi to get along with, but in a time like this, they needed more allies than competitors. Outside of Sullust, a small Republic shuttle jumped to hyperspace. Boss turned around and looked at each of the members of his squad, Fixer, Sev, and Scorch. They had just successfully killed a Sith. It wasn't an army, it was just an individual and a couple others that were traveling with her. Sev executed her from a distance and the rest of the squad quickly moved in and killed the rest of them. The Sith was on solace because she was trying to expose a weakness in the Republic lines. She found that the Republic wasn't on planet and she was establishing a forward command post that could be used as a listening post. That didn't happen though. Regardless, Boss informed the squad of everything they knew and he put up a map and showed the currently known and understood locations of everything on Endor. 
There wasn't much, but essentially all Boss was given by Tarkin was information revolving around Ewok migration patterns. They typically moved around the same areas, but changed where their tree fortresses were. It was simply to confuse their prey during migration season. Essentially, they kept all their structures, but moved into different ones to confuse the hunt. It worked efficiently, and so according to the Boss, they'd likely be in the middle of the quadrant where their cave systems were. He then continued and suggested that they'd be going into these caves first, unless they were able to find any sign of a temporary base of operations on the ground for the Sith. Fixer asked what they would do if there was a base on the ground, and Zeb told him that they'd get what they came for. Boss agreed, though they would be avoiding interacting with any of the Sith troopers and or warriors. This was an entirely covert operation, according to Captain Tarkin. Zeb expressed that he didn't like the idea of Tarkin having any control over this mission. Boss looked over and agreed, but they didn't have any choice at the moment. They continued to plan for the mission until they arrived at a hyperspace just outside of Endor's gravitational pull. Scorch and Fixer made their way to the pilot's seat, and Boss got behind the two of them and looked over to see what they were seeing. The Sith fleet was orbiting just outside the planet. They would luckily be able to get down to the surface undetected from this location. Boss gave them the clearance to begin the landing procedure onto the planet. The sun didn't rise on the surface yet, so they quickly found an open patch of grass and landed. Boss opened up the ramp and told the boys to pack light. Sev was getting his sniper configurations ready. Scorch, on the other hand, was looking for something. Fixer asked what he was looking for, and Scorch asked if they had an Ewok spray. Sev laughed in the background as he walked down the ramp with everything he needed and got down to the tall grass. Fixer laughed at Scorch too, but Scorch was serious. He didn't want to kill them. He heard they were cute, but he was also terrified of the idea that they would run into an Ewok and he might have to kill it. Boss patted Scorch on the shoulder and told him that they were specifically avoiding the Ewoks. Within minutes, the squad was on the ground. The clones quickly pulled some branches and other natural materials to shield the cover of the ship. Obviously, it wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. It was still relatively dark, but the sun was beginning to peek through the clouds and the tree line. A soft breeze crawled between the trees, and the squad got on their way as they moved quickly. Sev was already looking through the trees with his infrared scanner. There was nothing ahead of them. Fixer was looking through his energy scanners and said that there was a power source that was currently operating in front of them. He didn't know what it was, but it was pretty large. Boss told them that they would avoid it as best they could. He pointed to the left as the clones moved forward. It was a small rock formation, and he wanted them to climb it. If they could, perhaps he'd be able to get a good readout on what they were dealing with. As the clones began scaling the rocks, they were stuck. A number of Sith troopers were running by on patrol, and Boss stopped all of them as they looked down. The four commandos held onto the rocks as best they could, without moving, but it was getting difficult. Being that everything was still wet from the night, they'd have to grip harder than they would otherwise. Scorch looked down, and then the boss was scanning the Sith troopers as they stopped and looked around. The leader of the group told them to continue forward, suggesting that they get back to base before Malik woke up. They had a long day ahead of them. Boss made a hand signal at Fixer, and the clone commander gripped his zipline and used it to swing across the rock wall and latch onto a tree. Fixer wrapped his arms around the side of the tree and used his boots to ignite some dagger-like objects to hold him in place on the side of the tree. Fixer was able to gain his balance as he leaned over the side of the tree and lowered his wrist. He tapped the button on his wrist device and fired a small bug that flew through the air and slammed into the ground. Fixer cursed to himself as he reloaded it and had the other bug self-destruct. He rolled his wrist back and aimed a little higher, trying to account for the wind and distance to make the last trooper. He didn't want to overshoot his shot because if he did, he could expose their position to the Sith troopers if they were paying attention. While they could be dumber than rocks, he didn't want to risk that one trooper not being stupid. In his mind, it would be the one time the trooper wasn't stupid, and he couldn't risk this mission. He pulled his arm and fired again, and watched the small bug device glide through the air. It slammed into the backpack of the Sith trooper. Perfect shot. Fixer turned back towards his brother and grabbed the line and unlatched his boots from the tree and swung back. Boss spoke quietly, but he told them to ascend the rocks faster. They needed to see where the Sith troopers were going. There was clearly a reason they were scouting out the area, or at least checking the perimeters. Once they got to the top of the rocks, they started running along the banks. Sev had a sniper configuration open, and he was tracking the troops that just ran past them. The other commanders were running ahead of him. Sev put his rifle down when Boss told the squad to stop. This was going to be a big problem for them. The commanders dropped to the ground and hid behind a displaced log. Most of the tree line was up in flames. The Sith had obviously bombed the area. Scorch, Fixer, Sev, and Boss looked down at the wreckage of the mass. There were raging fires and the Sith troopers were running around. Their gates were already set up, but it was clear that there was a temporary setup. It was just a base to hide themselves in the night. The clones could also see dead Sith troopers and a number of dead Ewoks. The commanders looked to each other and then thought of what their next move would be. Sev used his configuration as he looked down and saw a cave. He suggested that perhaps the Sith were already in the caves. They might have to reduce their fighting style to hand-to-hand -hand combat. If they did, then perhaps they'd be able to make it appear that the Ewoks were in the caves with the troopers. Boss agreed and then suggested they set up their other weapons to stun and silence them. The entire operation was meant to be quiet. 
It just meant that if they stunned anyone, they'd have to kill them in their sleep. The clones got up and moved forward. They kept themselves in a crouch position as they quietly moved across the tree line and above the Sith base. The rock formation gave the perfect cover and Delta took advantage of it. They slid down at the edge of the rock formation and got a much better view of the Sith base layout. There were a couple massive tents or barrack-like setups in front. There were a couple other guard stations in the middle and at the back there was a command tent. It was rudimentary, but Seth with his configuration could see through a small peak in the tent. He was telling them that an individual they referred to as Malik seemed to be awake and he was talking with someone on a hologram. It may have been the Revan individual mentioned earlier in the debriefing. Bost asked if there was anything else they could get. Seth said there wasn't. The hologram ended and Malak turned around and stormed out of the base, telling the troops to prepare to move into the cave systems. They had to find the artifact they were looking for. They didn't even know what they were looking for at the moment, but they had to go into the caves. From what the clones could pick up, it seemed like the Sith hadn't gone deep enough into the cave system to find what they were looking for. Boss felt something behind him and turned around and was shocked when a spear was pointed towards his face. He sighed. Of course the ones who found him were the Ewoks. Boss spoke quietly and calmly to his boys and told them that they'd be very calm. Scorch asked why and he looked at Boss, who was holding his hands up. Scorch whipped around, which forced a number of Ewoks to jump back and then point their spears at his face. Fixer and Sev were a lot cooler about their moves as they turned back around and looked at the Ewoks standing before them. Boss told them to take off their helmets. Scorch asked why, but Fixer told him to just do it. Chances are the Ewoks assumed they were the same as the Sith troopers. Each of the clones, while keeping themselves hidden, raised their helmets above their heads and lowered them. Boss told Fixer to get some food out of his backpack. Fixer couldn't get his backpack because it was behind him, but luckily, Sev was just a little further back. He asked his brother to retrieve some rations for them. Boss said he didn't think it would work, but perhaps an offering would make the little furry monsters see them as equals or just allies. The Ewoks were very jumpy at the clones, but at least the clones removed their helmets. The Ewoks were sniffing the air. They could read the facial expressions. One of the Ewoks got a little testy and walked towards the clones, specifically Boss. He smiled at the Ewok but told Sev to get the food quickly, as if it was pulled from the backpack. Sev scooted forward a little, which got the Ewok's attention, as they turned over to see what he had in his hands. Sev smiled as he put his hands out in front of him. He told the little buggers to come and grab their feast. One of the Ewoks walked up to him, grabbed the food, and jumped back, afraid he might strike. Sev rolled his eyes, but Scorch exclaimed at how adorable they were. Boss told Sev to keep his cool. Fixer wanted to die. This was the worst thing ever, literally the worst. He didn't want to be around the Ewoks, and now he had to barter with them. Surely this couldn't get any worse. The other Ewoks came up to Sev and grabbed their food. The clones watched the Ewoks gnaw on the food and then eat it within seconds. They of course had to make sure it was safe to eat. The one Ewok, on the other hand, walked up the boss and put his hand on his face. He tried to keep his mouth shut, but the Ewok clearly was trying to become a biologist. Scorch thought it was a funny joke. Boss didn't. When the Ewok was done, it wobbled away and waved at the clones, as if to say, come hither. Boss told the clones to get up and follow them, quietly. Sev turned back and looked down. He could see the Sith troopers moving out and down for the caves. He reminded Fixer about the bug and the clone nodded his head as they slowly got up and followed the Ewoks. Within minutes, they went a completely different location in the forest. It was really bizarre, but the Ewoks were joyous as ever. Fixer was doing two things at once. He was using everything the Sith troopers were saying and depositing it into a communication relay so he could learn of everything the Sith were saying. This of course was also being transmitted back to the ship and then back to the fleet of her Bespin. The only reason this was happening is because the Sith were arrogant enough to believe the clones wouldn't sneak past their defenses. On the other hand, Fixer was using all the dialect the Ewoks were saying and trying to translate it. There were some protocol droids in the galaxy that had open databases and the cloners on Kamino outfitted clone commanders with translated devices in case they needed to use them. It searched that database for everything, including what would be considered rather primitive by galactic standards. It was hard to translate, but Fixer was able to use the translations and basically throw out the computer's response of what he wanted to say or whatever Boss wanted to say, though the Ewoks seemed adamant on bringing the clones back to their little home. When they got there, the clones were taken aback by the ingenuity of the little murder teddy bears. They were really quite the group of geniuses. The clones were welcomed into the tribe by the tribal leader, and through Fixer's shabby communication, he was able to make it clear that they were here to help. The tribal leader wanted nothing more than the Sith to be gone, so they agreed to help the clones. Boss gave some food rations to the Ewoks, believing that if they could find whatever they came here for, it wouldn't be that big of a deal of a trade. Plus, there were plenty more rations inside the ship they arrived on. The Ewoks took the commanders across the trees to the outer edge of their village. The clones were able to look down and see the entire Sith count without being detected. Though as they were admiring the advantageous position, a shuttle descended from the skies and the clones and Ewoks took cover. Boss leaned over and watched as the vessel landed and the shuttle doors opened. The steam rolled off and it was hard to see, especially from the angle they were looking down at. Though it became clear that they were looking at the head Hanjo. Boss asked Fixer if the bug was still active. It was. 
and luckily for them, Fixer got it right the second time. The bug was stuck to a bag that was inside of a command tent. The only reason Fixer knew this is because that's where the signal was coming from. Sev pulled his rifle out and scanned the area. Inside the camp, they listened in real time as Revan seemed really disenchanted with everything as of the last few days. Revan was pacing around the command tent, talking to a number of people. One of them was a commander from the operations here, or at least the one that had replaced the previous failure, Coriel Su. The particular commander couldn't use a force, wonder why Revan selected him. As Revan landed, he was preparing to go back down into the caves, but he received the call from the Sith. Malgus was expressing his failures to move past Biss. They were also officially confirming the death of Darth Xana, which left a bitter taste in the mouth of Darth Bane. His apprentice was killed by a Mandalorian, how depressing. They didn't realize that a Jedi Master from the High Council showed up during that battle. Regardless, they continued on with more pressing information, because Exar Kun was expecting results from Revan. He was extremely disappointed with the turnout lately, even though Revan made significant progress in the days leading up to this. As it was becoming more and more evident to the other Sith, most of everyone was getting tired of Exar. His nature was so disturbing, and they couldn't stand the way he put himself on a pedestal, acting as if he was better than anyone else. There was nothing coming out of his campaigns, so it was just him boasting about nothingness in all honesty. Revan told them that he would find the rest of their artifacts and then they'd be able to get to the Starforge. In the meantime, why don't they think about hunting down and destroying or even killing some of the Jedi Masters on that hit list of theirs? Exar turned to the other Sith and asked if there was any progress. Kray expressed that Nihilus had success against Skywalker. It was time for the others to pull their own weight. The Jedi Council was the most dangerous set in the galaxy, because a continuation in their kind meant that Skywalker's training could become complete, and he could wipe them all out. Vitiate, the hidden shadow who never spoke during these meetings, decided to finally speak out, and told them that they shouldn't fear the might of Anakin Skywalker. He was nothing but a bug to the power of Vitiate. Revan rolled his eyes under his mask. Nothing was more infuriating than Exar and Vitiate having a measurement contest. They didn't do it all the time, but it was frequent enough for it to become really annoying. Plus, why was Vishit even talking in the third person? Revan told the Sith that if they weren't pulling their own weight, then he didn't want to hear it. There were apparently thousands of these artifacts hidden across the galaxy, and yet the only one to get a hold of not just one, but two, was Revan. Not to mention that Malgus nearly lost one of those artifacts because of the Sith he nearly killed. He was confused, but he explained that Malgus' actions likely caused a betrayal on his ship. Malak walked into the room and listened. He knew that his master wasn't being truthful, but... He was trying to make a point about the failures of the Sith since their initial victory. Their overconfidence was hurting them more and more. If they kept allowing such overconfidence to riddle their ranks, then the Jedi would find the Starforge before them. Exar reminded the Sith of who they should be hunting, and he spouted off the known names of the Jedi Council members, though at the top of that list was Mace Windu and Plo Koon. The other X-Factor was Skywalker, Morden, and their students. The Sith nodded their heads and bowed, leaving the call. One didn't, but Malak didn't notice as he started out of the room. Revan followed Malak out and told him to go deeper into the caves and continued looking for the third side of the painting. Sev got a holo readout of the side of the triangular artifact that was passed to Malak and watched the Sith Apprentice walk away. Revan turned back and made his way into the tent. Sev and Fixer continued to maintain their office Scorch and Boss, took the readout and showed it to the Ewoks to see if they could show them where it was. The Ewoks were a little taken back by the colors of the hollow map, having never seen one before, but then they looked closer and then realized what it was they were looking at and started to get excited. Inside the tent, Fixer and Sev listened in as Revan asked if the channel was secured. Bane nodded his head, and so, Revan asked if there was any luck on having found Skywalker. Bane shook his head. He told Revan that it seemed the mission statement provided by Exar was enough to keep the troops in line. Despite their disliking of Exar, they collectively knew Skywalker was deadly, aside from the ever-so-confident Vitiate, obviously. Bane did express that what he last knew of Skywalker was his retreat from Thyfera. Chances are he's still either on Malastare or he was moved from front lines, for such a daring action. Revan expressed that it was incredibly important for them to find Skywalker at all costs. If they didn't, then they would perhaps have to face the likes of the rest of the Sith by themselves. And while there was no reason to doubt themselves, Skywalker could make it much easier. The call was ended and Revan opened up one last call, demanding that more supplies come down. They were going to make a temporary stay, just a little bit more permanent. As he said that, he departed from the planet, in hopes that Malak would just finish the job for him. Fixer took all the information and relayed it back to the fleet over Bespin, before shutting down the comm link on the ship to make sure it didn't receive anything going back and forth, or just to make sure the Sith didn't accidentally discover it. The clones got up and followed the Ewoks. There was a back way into the caves. The Sith were just using the more accessible location. By this point, it was around midday on the planet. The sun was beaming down, and the clones ascended to the floor of the planet with their allies. The Ewoks were so stubby so the clones had to walk slower, but it was alright, it didn't matter, as long as they got to where they were trying to go. 
The forest was getting much more lush and beautiful as they continued their walk with the Ewoks. Something the clones hadn't realized up until this point is that the Ewoks were actively acting as sentries for them. The small murder mittens had a keen sense of smell, and anything that was not familiar to them was hostile, aside from the clones. That was done because of their armor and the distinct difference in smell from them to the Sith. So, as they tracked their way through the forest, the Ewoks were able to keep the clones at a safe distance from any enemies, as they got them down to the cave system. The sound of the troopers could be heard moving around, and the clone commanders really didn't want to do it, but the time came. The commanders put their night vision on, as it was pitch black in the caves. The Sith troopers really tried their best, and that had to count for something, but logistically, it didn't. Delta moved in silence, and the Ewoks did too. As Delta traveled through the cave systems, they found a number of troops separated from the pack. The Ewoks were going to avoid them, but the clones were not. Sev ran forward and pulled out a vibro blade, ripping into one of the troopers' necks before snapping the neck of another. The commandos kept quiet as they slowly lowered their bodies to the ground. The Ewoks got a sense of what they were doing. They were playing the murderous version of Hide and Go Seek, except the Ewoks were the Seekers, and the Hiders didn't know they were hiding. The commandos continued to ravage through the Sith ranks, ducking under rocks and pulling people under, killing them quietly, or hiding behind barriers and doing them dirty. It was truthfully disrespectful, but Delta operated on an unworldly level. They didn't have time to mess around. There was one mission, and it was to get the artifact. The clones continued to maneuver through the caves for hours, taking periodic breaks but making sure the dead bodies weren't found. They kept their rations and they followed their little allies to the caves. Near the time of evening, the next layer of the Sith base had been set up on the top side and the clone commandos got to the cave painting they were looking for. There were dozens of dead Sith troopers scoured throughout the entire cave system. Delta began to analyze the cave painting, but the Ewoks quickly went up to it and pointed at it. What were they supposed to see? It's not like the Ewoks knew what the Star Forge was. Fixer traced his finger across the top of the painting, and he thought he understood what was happening, but in reality he had no clue. The Ewok kept pointing at something. It was hanging from the ceiling. It wasn't attached to the cave painting. Fixer leapt up and pulled it down. The Ewok jumped with joy, and as it did, a lightsaber ignited and cut through the small Ewok. Malak lunged forward and the Delta members fell back, avoiding a strike made by the Sith Lord. The Sith knew how these clones worked. He would draw them out and execute them on his own terms. He used a force to sedate the clone holding the bone that he pulled from the ceiling. Malak had to assume that the clones had found the right artifact. If not, then this would be pointless. Malak reached up and crushed the cave support and watched it crumble in front of him onto the other clones behind him, as he picked up the one clone commando who was knocked out and lugged him over his shoulder. Malak laughed to himself. He'd been watching the clones do their little game of hide and seek for hours. He knew his men would never catch on to it, but the cynical side of him wanted to play the game too. If they didn't play his game, then they'd leave with a failed infiltration and a dead brother, something the Republic surely wouldn't be fond of. Our season continues in the dimly lit caves of the Endor Forest. Malak was looking at clone commando with green armor up to the top of the cave. His men were all trying to find the artifact that Malak had in possession. He dropped the clone and told them to return to the base, lock the clone up, and prepare to evacuate the planet. Malak had no means of making the clones play a game with him. He was going to get out of Dodge, take his artifact back to his master, and leave Endor. The clone commando was just a distraction. As he prepared to inform the fleet that he was ready to return with the artifact in stow, he realized the communication systems were down. Seems as if the clones were smarter than he initially realized. The only way the clones could shut down his communication system is if they had a vessel on planet. With nighttime fully taking effect on the forest moon, Malak ordered his men to fan out, find their vessel, and destroy it. At the same time, he had a number of troopers hit the clone commando and tie him to a tree. Malak wasn't concerned with the commando. His main concern was getting away from the planet. He just hoped his men could find the commander's ship and destroy it soon. In the cave system, Scorch told Boss that he was able to block their communications, though he warned that the Surge could likely inform the Sith flagship that there was something going on on the ground. Boss asked how much time they had, and he said they probably had around two hours at most. Anything past that would be miraculous. Sev lifted a couple rocks off of Boss and he climbed to his feet. His leg was injured. Sev told Boss that he should stay back or get to the ship while he and Scorch go and find Fixer and the artifact. The lead commando looked up and adjusted his helmet's visor. It was knocked loose from the rocks falling down onto them. Boss didn't say a word. He grabbed a couple of rocks and pulled some fabric from under his suit and wrapped it around his name. It would work as a stint for the time being. That's all that mattered. He was light on his one leg, but he turned to the group and told them to prepare to move out. There were a couple of Ewoks with them. It's a shame Fixer had been taken. He had all the communication information, so they'd have to use rudimentary communication with the Ewoks. But because the other Ewoks were with them, they would be able to hopefully inform the tribe of what happened. Because not for nothing, for the surviving Ewoks, they were not a fan of seeing their friend cut in half. They pulled at Boss's hand, and the three commanders gathered everything they had up and moved out. 
the Ewoks, despite not having a conception of galactic time, were pressed to get to the top side and begin their hunt. Boss, Scorch, and Sev followed closely behind, their brutes clambering across the hard floors of the cave until they reached the dirt. The air around them became more open. The clones with their night vision could see the cave around them vanish as they exited through the mouth of the cave. The Ewoks turned back and pointed up. By this point, they pretty much assumed that the commandos could see what they were doing. Despite being such primal animals with sticks and bows, they were incredibly smart. The Ewoks were able to drive the clones back around to the tree line they were initially in and get the clones up to the top of their base. Boss told Sev to work his way around the edge of the trees and see if he could find a good readout of the enemy base. They would need everything they could if they wanted to get a chance of rescuing their friend and stopping the artifact from returning to enemy hands. Boss listened to the Ewoks they were with explain everything to their tribal leader. Of course, he didn't know what was being said, but he waited eagerly. It was hard to be patient. There was a ticking clock and they had to get on the move quickly. But he also needed help from the Ewoks. It wasn't that Delta wasn't able to excel in a challenge even with two and a half members, it was more so that the Ewoks knew the land much better, and despite having scouted it out earlier in the day, they didn't memorize it. While the commandos were some of the best there were, when a planet went from day to night, the scenery could feel a lot different, and for clones on a mission like this, that difference could be life and death. The Ewoks would be able to get them help, and get them through their challenges that sat before them. Minutes passed by and Sev was in position, his visor was lit up, analyzing everything on the ground with his rifle. Night vision was such an advantage for the clones, and Sev was constantly reporting the boss where the Sith troopers were, but he didn't know how many were out there. He then remembered the bug that was planted on one of the troopers, and called over to Scorch and asked if he could get a readout on it. Scorch ran over to Sev and got down next to him. He told his brother that he didn't have the device to tap into it, but he might be able to gather a signal from Fixer's device, if it was still activated, and then they could transmit everything back up here. Sev continued to monitor the position as Scorch quickly moved through his backpack, finding the device he needed to try and patch in the Fixer's bug transplant. Sev still hadn't found Fixer yet, and he was genuinely nervous if he wouldn't be able to find him or if he'd been killed. Those words were put to rest when a ringing sounded from a lower tree line. Scorch panicked and tried to stop the signal, but he was able to pick up a couple snippets of conversation between Malik and the Operation Commander. Malik was getting impatient. He wanted to know if the troops found the commando vessel. Then he heard the ringing. Malik grabbed his lightsaber and started forward towards the sound of the ringing. Sev told Scorch to cut the signal. They had the information they needed. Scorch said he was trying, but it wasn't working. Fixer, who was tied to the tree, got super nervous as one of the Sith troopers came up to him and whacked him in the head, knocking him out completely. Fixer being knocked out again, slumped over. Sev muttered some expletives under his breath and got up. He told Scorch to come along with him. Malik extinguished his weapon and returned to the camp. When they got to Boss, they informed him of everything going on, and that the Sith were looking for the vessel. Boss told Scorch to return to the ship, and have the engines ready to go. Scorch shook his head. He told Boss that he should do it. Scorch could go with the Ewoks and help them from the ground, and Sev could help from above. Boss thought for a moment. He didn't want to admit it, but Scorch was right. He couldn't be slowing them down. He nodded his head, and knelt down to the chief of the tribe, and pointed to himself, and then gestured to Scorch and Sev, as if he was trying to say that the chain of command was being passed on. The Ewoks didn't really understand, but once Boss got up and started away as fast as he could, they kind of got the picture. The chief let out a couple Ooga Boogas, and a number of Ewoks jumped up and got on the move. They grabbed spears, rocks, bows, and anything else they could get their hands on. The Ewok leader grabbed Scorch's knee piece and waved it forward. Seb nodded his head at Scorch and ran back to his lookout position. The Ewoks descended the trees and made their way down to the rock structure above the Sith camp. Scorch watched as a number of the little man-eating monsters spread out. This was without direction or even without a word spoken. Not for nothing, Scorch was a little freaked out. While the Ewoks were cute and cuddly, something about them at night made them nightmarish. As Scorch and the Chieftain got into position, he raided over to Boss to ask if he was there. The lead commando sounded like he was in pain, wincing over the comms and telling Scorch and Sev that he was just outside the ship. He didn't want to enter until it was entirely necessary. Everything became quiet. The Chieftain tugged on Scorch's hand and pulled him down a little. Scorch looked over and knelt down. The Ewok pointed out and gave some more hand signals back. Scorch nodded his head like he knew what was going on, but he had no clue. Out in the trees, he could hear the Sith troopers running around. They were fanning out into the forest to find the clone vessel. Malak was furious, but he knew that it would be a matter of time until he got off this rock. He turned to the table inside the command room and looked at the bone. He began to analyze it, but he didn't know what he was looking at. There were weird carvings on the side of the bone, but none of it made any sense. His hope was that Revan might be able to figure out what it was once he returned to the flagship. Malik's men were still running through the brush. The sounds of the forest had been lively every single night they had been here. 
but as the men traversed into the brush, it was eerily silent. One of the leads of a pack of troops stopped. He told his group to fan out, look around and see if they could find the ship the clones arrived on. Their boots were walking along the hard ground, and they were snapping branches and tripping on rocks. Despite their technology, they didn't have anything more than flashlights. They scanned the area, nothing to be seen. One of the men stopped and looked around the tree, and moments later, he disappeared. Though none of the Sith troopers noticed, they could hardly see a foot in front of them. All of their movements were unsteady, and they didn't know where they were going. While the men were walking around, one of them stepped on a branch, and it matched the sound of a neck snapping in the distance. The group came out with ten troops, just as most of the units had. They didn't realize they were down two men, and then from the distance, out towards the base, they heard a horn sound. Despite the Sith having burnt some of the forest down, they hadn't had any interactions with the Ewoks on a battle level. It's not that the Ewoks wouldn't fight back, it's that the incidents were so isolated that most of the troops hadn't even seen the Ewoks during their duration on Endor. The men all turned back and looked around. They realized that someone was missing from their group. One of the others called out saying that it's more than just a someone, before the sound of a man losing his breath caught their attention. It was all so quick. All the troopers turned over and instinctively opened fire. One of the other men dropped to the ground in the middle of them. The rest of them turned around to see a vibra blade stuck in his neck. From behind the men, Boss leapt out and swept under one of them, lifting him off their feet by grabbing a hold of their feet and thrusting upwards. Boss sent the trooper on his head, killing him instantly. He moved quickly, sliding his pistol into one of their side and pulling the trigger once, twice, thrice, and then he vanished. Boss hid in the brush as they all turned around. He limped up to the tree and got behind cover as one of the men of the group, scared beyond belief, opened fire into the emptiness of the night and clipped one of his teammates. With the chaos, the elite clone commando slid around the tree using his hands to kill one more. And before they could react, his vibra blade was attached to his wrist again and he took down the remaining members and vanished into the night like a ghost. On the other side of the forest, Sev watched from up above as a group of men walked into an Ewok trap. The sound of the battle horn pushed this group of men into a circle. They backpedaled and stood at each other's backs, their weapons their flashlights facing outwards. Out from the trees, a couple wisty pouches landed in their faces and they were blinded. A trap meant to capture animals, clutch their legs, and drag them up into a massive net. The men cried out and their screams could be heard across the forest. The Ewoks descended onto them, launching spears and arrows into the nets. One of the men lived, but faking his death would only provide an even more traumatic outcome for when this assault was over with. Boss raided over the communications and told them that it had been 45 minutes, they needed to be wary. He then ordered them to get Fixer immediately. They could then go for the artifact and bounce. Sev acknowledged this and so did Scourge, but they probably still had a good 100 to 150 troopers in the area. They couldn't risk a head-on assault. Scourge was prepared for anything, but he didn't want to burn the Ewoks home down. That wouldn't be kind of him to do, especially not after they were so helpful to them. Out from the forest, another horn whistled, and a boulder dropped down and the men inside the caves cried out as they were all crushed by the boulder rolling down on them. Those who were injured or not killed were hunted down by the vicious pack of Ewoks. The chieftain and Scorch moved down the hill and into the area outside the camp. Troopers across the trees were being hunted down by the Ewoks and they were getting spread out. It was a terrifying experience, especially for those who got separated from their groups. They ran into the forest, avoiding any extra noise they heard. Again, being that the forest was deathly silent, Every noise was extremely audible. The animals of Endor feared the Ewoks. They were the dominant apex hunter on the planet. Those troops who got separated were either killed on the spot or hit with a bundle of rope and rocks that tied their legs and dropped them to the ground. Then they were killed. The Ewoks were preparing a feast for themselves. As everything was seemingly going perfect, Sev picked up on something on his radar. A shuttle descended into the forest near the base. He didn't know if it would be a good idea, but he told Scorch that if he could get outside their little base, he might be able to retrieve the artifact. The Ewoks were currently working to fix her, but he was still knocked out and he was surrounded by a guard of troops. The shuttle that landed opened up and a couple of acolytes exited. Their survival was surprising despite the battle that took place on the flagship a couple days beforehand, but they exited and looked into the forest line. Sev knew this would put them into a severely disadvantageous spot. He told Scorch to brace for impact. Scorch asked what that meant, but before he could question it, Sev pulled the trigger and a blast slid right into the camp next to where the ship landed. The blaster bolt clipped the collection of explosives the Sith had been using to dig out the cave and a ripped an explosion into the side of the shuttle, destroying it. Sev told Scorch to get the artifact. When the explosion sounded off, Malik was thrown into the side of the little barricade and a number of debris fell onto him. Lost asked what was happening, but Sev didn't say a word. He targeted one of the acolytes who had survived and clipped him in the head before scanning the area to make sure everything else was all clear. Boss told the crew that he would return, and as the words left his mouth, horn sounded, and the sound of the Ewoks from around the trees echoed out in one massive chorus. Scorch told Boss that he might want to hang back a little bit, though this chorus was not the beginning of an all-out assault. It was a fear tactic, 
with the Sith base in ruins, the Sith had to flee into the forest. The troopers who were guarding Fixer unlatched him from the tree and dragged him into the forest, his feet leaving a trail in the dirt as the Sith troopers looked for a safe place to stay. At the Sith base, a number of Sith troopers reorganized the search for the artifact and the Sith apprentice who was here. Scorch knew he needed to get the artifact and he ran up to the wreckage of the wall. It was in shambles, but it provided cover for him. The only issue is, the fire made his position more visible. It gave the Sith troopers a sense of lighting. Sev radioed down the Scorch and told him it was clear to move in. At the same time, a couple of Ewoks could be heard getting shot. The fires outside the base were providing a sense of visibility for the inept troopers of the Sith. Sev tried to keep an eye out for the Ewoks, but it was incredibly difficult, mostly because he was trying to find Fixer and keep Scorch safe. The Ewoks were on the hunt of Fixer, but the Sith troopers were finally starting to get a grip on themselves. But the Ewoks were always prepared by launching Wisty Pouches at their foes, though due to the magnitude of their numbers, only a couple of them were hit by a loose arrow. For the most part, some of the Sith were lodging down in cover, some of them were hiding in rock formations and others were in the caves. Most of them were still out in the open, but it wasn't easy. Sev told Scorch that the artifact was in the rubble, or at least he thought it was. He gave a precise location of what he believed was the artifact they came here for. Scorch rolled around the corner and kept his rifle primed. He could see the Sith, but they didn't suspect him coming despite the raging fires next to him. Scorch reached down and pulled the shiny object out. It wasn't it. As he stood back up, he was blasted in the shoulder piece and fell back. Sev opened fire from the tree line. It was someone who was out of Sev's view, hidden by the wreckage of the barracks. Scorch stumbled back and Sev blasted away at the Sith troopers, who began to notice the intruder in their wreckage of the camp. They knew what the clones were looking for. Scorch ran back to the ramparts he was behind as he held his shoulder and looked over and saw a couple dozen troopers running his way. Sev ducked out of the way as Blaster Fire aimlessly made his way to his location. He tried killing all the troopers but it was increasingly difficult now that they noticed him, somewhere in the tree line. Sev grabbed the rope and looked for a safe dismount location. At the same time, the Ewoks from the brush ambushed the troopers that were charging at Scorch. Scorch rolled back over and opened fire on the troops inside the camp. He was able to lay down heavy ordnance, which sadly, was not laced with explosives. They needed that bone. The men who were in the forest charging Scorch let out screams of terror. The Ewoks hunted them down and left them running for their lives, but the Ewoks were not merciful to intruders. Sev took the sniper configuration off his blaster and grabbed a rope in front of him and told himself, here goes nothing, as he jumped down. The rope didn't catch. He panicked as he felt the floor of the forest come to him at a faster rate than he could have ever imagined. The air flung past him and he held his breath, bracing for impact, and then it caught, launching him forward. Sev let out a woohoo and then leaned his rifle to his side and opened fire. He called the Sith troopers some expletives as he sped to the forest floor in a blaze of glory. Sev hit the ground and rolled. He moved between the Ewoks who were hunting down the Sith in the forest. His blade clipped a couple of the troopers before he blasted one in the head. He didn't want to shoot all these individuals while he was coming down. He didn't want to risk the Ewoks. He then turned his attention towards the burning base and told Scorch he was moving in, asking him to provide cover fire. The Ewoks dispersed back into the brush. The glistening crimson colors on Sev's uniform shined as he moved forward. Scorch watched with awe as Clone Wick did what he did best. He committed acts of war crimes against his enemies. He ran through the fire like a man possessed and blasted away at the Sith troopers. The cover fire from Scorch helped as well. The troopers started to drop, and Sev leapt down and rolled through a patch where there was no fire. The Sith troopers didn't know that. All they saw was a clone commando dip into the fire and rise. The markings of what appeared to be blood across his mask and armor petrified them. This was a terrifying sight. Sev threw his blade out into one of them and lifted his right arm blasting his rifle and with his left he pulled out his pistol and fired away at them. Most clones were more practiced with ambidextrous skills than a regular trooper and Sev proved it in this moment. The Sith dropped to the ground and Sev put his weapons away and quickly grabbed the blade and put it away too. He looked quickly and called over to Scorch. The other commando followed closely behind and they searched for the artifacts. They lifted up pieces of debris, hoping that it hadn't been destroyed. They scoured the commander's tent for minutes until they found them. Scorch picked them up and Sev covered his back making sure he was clear as they ran through the wreckage. Scorch attached the bone to his belt and let it dangle as the other ones were tossed to his backpack. Sev told Boss they needed to find Fixer and he acknowledged. He was currently leaning against the ship, but was getting increasingly hard for him to stand. Sev and Scorch looked for the Ewoks, but aside from the burning trees and gear, the force was silent again. The two commandos moved forward, keeping their eyes and their weapons prepared. They were grabbed by a couple of Ewoks and brought down into the brush. The Ewok leader of the group spoke quietly to the two of them, but they didn't retain anything. They just followed the hand movement. Sev looked over, and so did Scorch. They could see a bundle of Sith troopers hiding behind a couple of rocks. Scorch asked if he could see Fixer, and he shook his head. There was no sign of him. Sev turned to Scorch, who was already doing the Force's work. Sev waved the Ewoks back. As Sev did, he crushed a tree branch and fell over. The Sith troopers opened fire into the brush. It was chaotic. 
but there was a massive log protecting them. Scorch called out to the Sith and told them to think fast before he launched a rocket into their laps. The explosion launched the two dozen men into the air as the Ewoks let out what sounded like cheers. In the distance, another one of the troopers was clearly found by the Ewoks as the scream echoed out and vanished like a whisper. Seven Scorch got to their feet and looked around. The Ewoks were sniffing the air. They were hunting. The Ewoks collected up and moved forward. They were on the trail. Seven Scorch knew that wherever they were going next would likely be the last of the troops. The screams in the forest had been silenced again, and all that was left was a congregation of Ewoks and commandos moving to save their friend and recapture their home. The movements were quick, and then the Ewoks stopped at the mouth of the cave. Scorch looked in, and they could see the Sith troopers. They went in together and lit some torches to keep the inside of the cave lit. The Ewoks looked in, and the commandos shook their head. They pointed at themselves. They knew it would be useless to go in there with the Ewoks. They would get slaughtered. They didn't want that. The Ewoks had been kind enough to the clones, and if it wasn't for their help, they wouldn't have been able to get this much done in this short period of time. Sev and Scorch looked to each other, and then looked back at the Ewoks. Sev cupped his hand and pretended to throw dust. The Ewoks twisted their heads and grabbed some dirt into the same motion. The Ewoks looked at each other, and then they held up their little pouches of demon lights, Sev nodded his head, and asked if they could borrow them. Scorch shook his head. Sev completely forgot they didn't speak Galactic Common. He gestured to the pouch and then to his hand. The chieftain said something, and the collection of Ewoks came up to him, depositing their pouches. Sev grinned under his helmet, and asked Scorch if he had anything in his arsenal that wouldn't be explosive. Fixer was likely down there, and they didn't have time to risk. That Sith apprentice would likely be back up and mobile in the coming minutes. He didn't know, but he didn't want to find out. Scorch looked through and found some concussion bombs. It'd be a real headache. Sev just looked at Scorch. Scorch thought it was funny, and then Sev told him to prepare the weapons. They collectively turned around and looked at the mouth of the cave. Sev told Scorch to throw the concussions. They could use the pouches once they got into the cave. Though they had to be careful of friendly fire. Scorch agreed, and the two of them were prepared. The Ewoks lined the exterior. If any troops tried to escape, it would be a death trap. The only reason the clones couldn't go the back way is it would take way too long, and the boulder that crashed a number of troops was blocking the entrance from the other side. If they blew it up, it could hurt Fixer, which again, is something they didn't want. The commandos loaded up and launched the concussions into the cave. The Sith were thrown for a loop, but they turned around and opened fire at the mouth of the cave. The commandos had already gotten down there and were hiding behind the rock walls. Sev and Scorch called out to each other. They couldn't identify where Fixer was. Sev told Scorch to aim high and fire away. They reached their blasters over their shoulders and opened up. The Sith troopers started dropping and once the smoke from the concussions slipped away, which there wasn't much to begin with, Seven Scorch launched some of their pouches. The Sith troopers cried out, and Scorch rounded the corner and found Fixer as he ducked behind another rock. Though it was smaller than he initially thought, so he had to lay down, basically to stay hidden. Sev was given Fixer's whereabouts as he slid around the corner and blasted away, before putting a blade to Fixer's restraints and allowing the clone commando to take action. He grabbed his rifle and opened fire. The Sith were being pushed back and they had no means to escape. Sev told Fixer to run. As he did, he ran up to the mouth of the cave and panicked. The Ewoks had vacated, and he looked at the man from across the tree line, standing in front of the fires. He was holding a lightsaber. Malik looked unsteady, and he wavered just a little bit by standing. Scorch and Sev were still in the cave, and Fixer raised his blaster. Sev used his blade to cut down a couple of Sith troopers after telling Scorch to get out of the cave. Scorch got up and ran. Sev used the body of one of the victims as a human meat shield as he ascended the cave backwards. Scorch stood next to his brother as they looked at the Sith who approached them. Scorch told Fixer to watch this as he launched a rocket at Malak, but the Sith used the force and threw it away. Fixer looked over at Scorch. Even without seeing his face, Scorch knew exactly the face that Fixer was using. Scorch shrugged his shoulders and aimed his weapon. Sev exited the cave, and he dropped the body and turned to see his brothers facing off with the Sith. Malak yelled out at them. He told them that they would pay for what they did here. Fixer told the Sith that they would only be so lucky. Let a second pass before Boss flew the Republic shuttle by and blasted the ground in front of Malak, sending him through the air and crashing into a dream. Boss opened up the ramp and the three clones quickly entered. They had each other and their artifacts as Boss lifted up and launched away. They weren't done yet. A wing of fighters was coming down to investigate the lack of response in the shuttle. The shuttle was sent down blindly with no understanding of anything going on on the ground. Fixer ran up to the co-pilot seat and he helped take control of the vessel as he piloted through the trees, avoiding the fighters. As they approached a massive tree, they pulled back, lobbing the shuttle upwards and allowing a fighter to slam into the tree behind them. Fixer spun the shuttle around. Thankfully, Scorch and Sev were strapped in. They piloted the ship forward with all the rear shields and engines active. It was full power to those different parts of the ship as they piloted it out of the atmosphere while constantly dodging attacks made by the fighters behind them. Fixer told Boss to make the jump, and Boss grabbed the controls and shoved them forward as their shuttle departed from the Endor system, back to the Republic fleet over Bespin. 
Malak looked up into the sky, and his skin trembled. He looked at Revan's shuttle slipped down between the trees and over the fire. A number of the survivors ran out of the cave, and the Ewoks watched from a distance. Revan stormed down the ramp of his ship and called out Malak's name with a yell as a number of the men from the cave came running out and got to the knees before Revan. Despite being a Sith Lord, Revan wasn't wasteful. These survivors would be more than motivated the next time a battle came. The trauma of this battle and their loss would motivate them to not fail again. The same did not go for a student. The arrogant fool who lost to a bundle of teddy bears and whoever was inside that Republic shuttle that just lifted from the system would pay the price. Malik crawled out from the brush, his robes covered in char and his face covered in burnt scars. Revan told the troopers to get inside his vessel and wait for him. Malik told Revan that the clones used the Ewoks in the darkness against them. Revan kicked Malik and told him that he didn't want excuses, he wanted results. The fact that Malik was bested by clones made this all the more insufferable for him. Doesn't matter if they were the best unit in the Grand Army of the Republic, he was bested by beings created inside of test tubes, and that was a crime he would pay for. Revan electrocuted his student, and his agonies only reflected what filled the night air on Endor for countless moments beforehand. In space, Delta Squad got in contact with even Peel and Captain Tarkin. They informed them that they were successful in their mission. However, the Sith were now alerted to their presence, due to circumstances unrelated to their operation. This was a half-lie, but they didn't want to get in trouble with Tarkin. The captain spoke up, preparing to rip into the clones, but even Peel spoke over him and told the clones that they did well. He told them to return to the fleet, and once they docked into Hangar Bay, they would be relocating. The war was this much closer to a resolution, thanks to them. And that might Our season continues instead of Admiral Coburn's flagship. Anakin and Atabri were watching their students train again. Since their first encounter with the Ghost, there was a bit of tension in the air. Despite the agreed-upon agreement between Skywalker and Coburn, there was still something that hadn't yet been addressed between him and his other general. They were leaders, and they were co-leading this group of soldiers. The erratic act on Thyfera cost lives, and it almost cost all of their own lives. Anakin knew he messed up, but he didn't really know how to address it. Despite the connection they had developed with each other, this was different. It was an action that almost cost all their lives. The two of them hadn't had a clear line of communication since the incident. Today was the first full day of training for Ahsoka and Zala. Due to their age and their size, the effects of the Force trade had a much more significant effect on them. Anakin stood next to Natabre as they watched their students practicing below in the training room. Anakin reached forward and turned off the microphone. He tilted his head towards Natabre and told her that they needed to talk. She looked over with her eyes only and crossed her arms, agreeing that they did need to talk. He expressed that his actions were faulty and that the chase after victory wasn't exactly the Jedi thing to do. But more importantly, it wasn't the most appropriate thing for a leader to do, and he apologized. The Tabra looked at him silently for a couple of moments. Truthfully, this apology should have come days beforehand. Anakin knew it, and he could see it on her face. She turned and faced him fully, and she closed her eyes and let out a deep breath. She called him by his name and told him that they were to work as a team. To be generals in a war, they had to be as one. It wouldn't be something they could do all the time because that was impossible but they needed to work with each other. Latabre said that she accepted the apology, but said that it would mean more if he apologized to Zala and Ahsoka rather than herself. They could communicate in a different way than the students could to them. Anakin agreed, and he told her that he would. He stepped back and silence filled the air again. Everything felt like there was a bit of peace, but a slight awkwardness. Latabre was focused on her student's performance, but Anakin wasn't. He asked if everything was okay between them, and she said it was. Anakin felt like something was off, and she looked at him and told him that nothing was wrong, reminding him to calm his nerves. She placed her hand on the back of his shoulder and reminded him of the seas of Octu. Listen to them inside of his head, and then he could find his peace. She wasn't angry at him. She just wanted him to remember that his actions had consequences, not just for himself. This was no longer Tython. They weren't on a secret mission anymore. They were leading an army, and they had students to take care of too. Anakin thanked her, and she smiled before telling him, it was time for the Padawans to finish. There was another briefing coming in. Anakin told the Nabra to head to the bridge. He'd finish up the session for the students. He could also leave his apology for them. The Tabra looked at him for a short moment and with a quick nod, walked out the room towards the bridge. Anakin would go down to the bottom of the training arena, congratulate the students on their project, and then apologize to them. They were both accepting of the apology, and then they were told to come to the bridge or do whatever they wanted. Ahsoka and Zal looked at each other and started giggling. Anakin asked what was so funny. They shook their heads and said nothing. He rolled his eyes and walked away. They prepared for a counterattack on Master Sky Guy. They used the force and taped a piece of paper to his back. On it said the words kick me. It was even funnier to them when he turned around and started walking away. 
Sure, the Force can be used for serenity and all, but it could also be good for joking every so often. As Anakin walked through the halls, Commander Cody came up to him and asked him if he was walking around with a sign on his back. Anakin turned with confusion and he couldn't reach it, so Cody grabbed it for him. Anakin found it amusing and told Cody that he'd have to get them back. Cody kind of just nodded his head. To the books, Cody didn't really get all the horsing around and joking around that Skywalker and Tano did. Commander Issaka, who was still really quiet when she first came around on board, seemed to be influenced by Ahsoka and Anakin. The Tybre wasn't as much, but her student definitely fell into the trap. It was hard not to. Ahsoka and Anakin had extremely contagious personalities. So for someone as young as Zala, she just fell in line. The Tybre didn't mind. She was happy to see Zala was coming out of her shell, though part of Natabre feared for her student. Aside from the massacre at the temple, that shell was protecting something that she hadn't explained to anyone, not since arriving on Octu or having been assigned to Morden. Regardless, Skywalker and Cody walked into the room and Anakin stood next to Natabre. As the Admiral told them, the communication was coming in. The first hologram that popped up was Captain Tarkin, then Windu, Plo Koon, Kit Fisto, Shakti, Oparensesis, and next to him was Jocasta Nu. The session began as others who weren't displayed on the forefront of the hologram were able to listen in and watch. Everyone got to listen, not everyone got to speak. It was a simple hierarchy. Captain Tarkin plugged in a chip identifying what had been located on the Endor system, along with the information collected by former Sith Sola Gray. She was currently being transported back to an inner world for the Republic War effort. Nowhere close to Octu, but somewhere where they could keep a close eye on her. According to the information she displayed, and the correct artifacts that had been collected by Delta Squad on the Forest Moon, the information they had was laid out before them as such. The information from this went to Sira, Bakura, and Endor. All three artifacts led to each other, and from there they went outwards. It was a path through Lewek, where they believed the Star Forge was located. As Tarkin pointed out the analysis of the three items collected from the three planets on the outer edge of the galaxy, they each had one piece of the puzzle. The triangular device was the location of all three. When they were all collected, it shined a beacon that led to Lewek. The ring on the other hand could be plugged into the bottom of the triangle, which allowed it to show the beacon, which was more or less a small star map of this side of the galaxy, showing off planets like Cordia, Rat Attack, and so forth. Though as Revan likely knew, the ring didn't work without the third artifact. Malik likely didn't want to tamper with it until his master got access to the artifact. The bone, on the other hand, had a transcribing on it that was really primitive, but that was intentional. Whoever inscribed it on the bone was able to communicate with the Ewoks, which is why it was in their language. Anyways, the bone had a star map inscribed on the side of it, which pointed at the same location as the others. It was just, as it seems, a means to get to the Star Forge if everything else failed. Obviously, the people who did it didn't want someone unworthy to go to the Star Forge, and if someone could be trusted enough for the Ewoks, then perhaps they would be trustworthy enough to access the weapon. Also, it was as if one needed all three artifacts to use the Wayfinder, or they needed to befriend the Ewoks. How peculiar. Mace asked if they would be rerouting all fleets to the area of Lowak. Tarkin thought it'd be a good idea. However, due to the mission on Ender turning into an attack, he believed the Sith Empire was fully aware of the discoveries, though if they knew how to get there, that was a different story. Plo Koon suggested that all three major fleets relocate out there to create a diversion. Skywalker's fleet wasn't massive, but it was one of the larger ones in the area. Due to no one knowing about the failure at Thyfera, Windu was dispatching Skywalker's fleet to Lewek. His mission was to locate the Star Forge and capture it. Windu told him that he and his forces were currently en route to Cordia, so if they could successfully route the enemy there, they'd be one step closer to making a push for Lowek. Anakin reaffirmed his directive, and it was confirmed. Plo told him that he would be moving his fleet out there soon, though one thing that they had to worry about was plugging in holes where these fleets were leaving, especially the Malastare one. Even Peel came over Tarkin's end and told the Council that his fleet would reroute from Bespin and make his way to Malastare. Shakti told the council that there were several units of clone troopers coming off of Kamino. They'd very easily be able to plug in those holes. Kit Fisto spoke up, and he told Skywalker that he'd be taking a small fleet out towards the exterior of the known galaxy, and he could likely link up with either him or Master Windu in the area. Jocasta knew was rather disappointed as she came over the communications device and told the council that despite the artifacts that were found by Delta Squad on the forest moon, her and her team finally uncovered the secrets in the weapon Duchess Satine gave to Master Blow. She expressed that it was written in two different dialects of the Mandalorian ancient languages, mixed with some other things that no one had spoken since before the Age of the Old Republic. She continued and said that on the back there was a map to the apparent weapon that could be located on Malachor. The feed for a split second caught off the hologram and then it restarted. Jocasta didn't even notice as she was twisting the sword around in her hands when it happened. 
She said that while Tarkin's descriptions of the map heading to Loek were correct, there was another planet called Lanera. Windu cut her off and told her to not speak anymore. She was taken aback. Windu told them to cut all communications off immediately, and so the council quickly did, though Windu was the last one to leave the call. He spoke to what seemed to be himself, and he told the Sith that they were listening, that he and his allies would be the architects of their destruction. If it was a war they wanted, then it was a war they would lose, just as they had every single war beforehand. He ended the transmission and turned to his fleet admiral and told them they needed to prepare for anything. Anakin turned into Tabre, and she said that Sith may have been listening. She told Anakin they needed to make an action. He asked what she was thinking, and she smiled, telling him that he already knew before she said it. He agreed. He knew. The Tabre turned around and told Admiral Coburn to reroute the fleet for the Lewak and prepare for what would likely be their greatest test of the war. He concurred, and turned around immediately giving the fleet orders. They could all feel the ship twist as the fleet turned the direction they needed to be in and launched into hyperspace. Outside the Endor system, Lord Revan looked at the Council of Sith, and expressed despite his setbacks, he didn't have any failure to show for him. Exar Kun told him to silence himself. His insolence was nothing but a perpetual state of annoyance. Revan looked with anger in his eyes at Exar over the hologram, though it was probably for the best that he had a mask on, because Exar would have really hated the expression on his face. The Sith were given the directives to launch their fleets away from the Core Worlds, and they could move to the Unknown Regions, though Exar made it extremely clear where he would be going. When the call ended, Revan looked at Malak with disdain, and he asked if they were going to be able to use the tracker to find where Windu's fleet was heading. Malak nodded his head. Despite the belief that the commandos were able to get off the forest moon free, the fighters that chased them through the forest weren't trying to damage them, they were just trying to set the trap. Revan had his chance to blindside Tarkin's fleet, but he knew that wouldn't get him any results that he wanted. Revan could easily destroy a fleet, but destroying a fleet and securing artifacts was a different story. His expertise in strategy allowed him to concoct the perfect plan, one that would destroy the Republic war effort, though he truthfully couldn't be too boastful about it because his plan almost didn't work. The tracker attached to the Republic shuttle had a communication interception device on it. It was a prototype, so there was no guarantee that it would work. It's why they entered the call at such a late time, and it's exactly why the Republic was able to see that they entered the call. It just surprised the Jedi, and in the time they were reacting to it, Jocasta knew happened to not notice. It was also how Revan was able to track the longest communication device, which was from Windu. They didn't have time to track the other fleets aside from the one previously mentioned, so thanks to the tracker, Revan and the Sith knew where the Jedi were potentially going. Obviously the prize was at Lewek, apparently, but if all else failed then perhaps they'd find more luck with the Malachor plan. Revan ordered Malak to prepare the fleet to jump to hyperspace. The fleet didn't. And then Malak turned to Revan and asked what was on his mind. The Sith Lord turned to his apprentice and told him that it was the beginning of the end. He wasn't sure what it was, but something was at play. He snapped out of his melodramatic spiel about what he was feeling through the Force, or whatever trickery this was, and asked Malak if he knew which star system Windu would be going to. Malak pointed to the three that were potential targets, but they were making their way for the most likely. There was a 72.4% chance that he would end up there, or at least according to the algorithm. Instead of Admiral Coburn's fleet and flagship, Anakin was sitting inside of his room. He was reflecting and attempting a meditation. The words Natabre said to him inside of the training facility sat inside of his mind and he figured that he needed to have a clear conscience before they got to the planet. He had no reason to assume they would come across any enemy forces. While the transmission was cut, he truthfully believed Mace was being paranoid. This wasn't the first time a communication was interrupted. Typically, one assumed it was a pack of Pergo migrating or some other space anomaly happening. Anakin was focused and he was sitting on his mat with his legs crossed under him. His back was curved until he straightened up his posture. He took a deep breath and as he breathed out, his arms fell flat into his legs. He closed his eyes and tightened them, thinking back on the past and coming to terms with it so he could be prepared in the present. He learned these lessons but he wanted to make sure there was nothing that would flare up. He didn't want to make a mistake and he believed as a general, it was especially important for him to have a clear mind. Just as he cleared his mind, a knock came at the door. Anakin opened his eyes and let out a begrudgingly heavy sigh, and told whoever it was to come in as he turned his head to see Natabre. He laughed a little and he thought it was Ahsoka. The Tabri looked down at him on the mat and her eyebrows shot into her hairline. She let a quick oops and told him that she didn't mean to interrupt him. She started back out of the room and he told her it was fine, she could stay. The Tabri nodded her head and slid into the room as the door behind her closed. She asked if he was taking up her advice on a meditation, and he with a smirk told her that he was trying to until she decided to knock on his door. Obviously the tone was sarcastic so there's no hostility or animosity between them. 
He asked her about what was the matter, and she said nothing. She just wanted to see if he wanted to meditate together before they got to the planet of Lewak. He said it was weird that they were both thinking the same things, and she shoved his shoulder as she walked by, thanking him for inviting her in. Anakin threw his arms up and told her that he didn't know what she was doing. She mocked him by mimicking the mouth movement with a roll of her eyes. Anakin straightened his face with a sarcastic grin, and asked if he could be so honored to have her accompany him through another meditation. She repeated the word honored back to him in a playful way and nodded her head as she got down on the opposite side of the mat and looked at him. She told him to lead on and he shook his head, repeating no more than once and insisting that she lead this meditation. The Dabre again rolled her eyes and laid her hands out on her legs and straightened her posture and took a deep breath. The two of them reached out their hands and laid them in each other's, Anakin's right hand in her left and her left hand in his right hand. They had done this exercise a number of times in Octoom. They were super close, and the trust to share this type of moment with each other was imperative for their relationship as co-generals or co-leaders. This would help them firm the relationship with the other student. Matabra and Anakin focused on their connection to each other. The two of them were transported into the Force itself, using their bond with the other to face the Force in a sense of direction. They both could feel and see everything the other was feeling. Matabra was able to see something that had been unmentioned or dragging on him, or maybe he did mention it, but it wasn't something that she could really conceptualize in the moment. It was a woman, but Natabre knew her. Anakin seemingly wasn't able to remove this memory or this pain from his heart. Despite him not talking about it or mentioning it to anyone, it sat within him. He was able to obtain some type of closure with the death of Obi-Wan, a lot of that in part due to Satine and her kind words. Natabre recognized the senator and the frolicking in the fields of Naboo. At the end of it all, there was Anakin with the senator, promising her that they'd be married when the conflict was all over, a conflict that since hadn't come to an end yet. On the other hand, Anakin was watching someone who held themselves to such a high standard delve into the darkness the way he would've when she was a youngling. The Tabra was almost kicked from the Jedi Order when she was seven years old. It was before Anakin was ever brought to the Order, and she had a massive spurt of power in the Force, accompanied by a growth in the darkness. The Tabra didn't know what she was doing. But knowing how critical the Jedi Council could be, she was almost forced in the Order. The only saving grace was how apologetic she was for it. She narrowly survived the will of the Council, being allowed to stay in the Order thanks to one vote. Obviously, had Anakin been a member of the Order, she likely would have been removed from the Jedi Order itself. Skywalker could see her latch onto that darkness subconsciously and allow it to control her every move going forward. It wasn't that she used it but she allowed the fear of darkness manipulate her heart and throw her through constant turmoil. She felt like no matter where she was, she was under a constant microscope and no matter how much she cared for her master, that pressure built over the years. The first time she felt a sense of freedom from it all is when they went to Tython, but it still sat within her, an untouched trauma. As they continued learning about each other through their journey, through the Force and meditation, Skywalker's memories provided one last tidbit of inspiration or information which pertained to something said by Obi-Wan. Though the weirdest thing about this little quote is that it felt like it was being said for the first time. As they both heard, there are alternatives to fighting. The two of them fell out of the meditation. Despite the meditation bringing up memories for the two of them, it caused their bond to only flourish. They felt a sense of peace at the same time, knowing that someone else knew everything about them. Natabre now knew that Anakin was invested in some sort of relationship before the fall of the Republic, and Anakin now knew that Natabre was not so different from him. The secrets of the past are often quite revealing about those one cares about. When they came from the vision, they didn't remove their hands from the other's grip. Truthfully, they held onto the other with a little more firmness. They looked at each other and they started to speak to each other. The tension of their hands loosening, but their hold of the other not. They still held on and they continued talking, getting to know the other and understand the mysteries of each other's lives that had not been shared. While one could assume they would know, not everyone knows everything about someone they've known for only a couple months, no matter how close they might be. This was something that several meditations hadn't revealed thus far, and at least in Tabre's mind, she believed that these pieces of information were incredibly important for whatever came next in their lives and in this war. Anakin agreed, though he was most concerned about the quote from his former master, the one about alternatives to fighting. Neither of them could come up with an answer, and so perhaps the message was from a past era. That was entirely possible, but Anakin suggested that if these Jedi teachings were indeed correct about the Force always being in motion, maybe it was a lesson for the future. The Tabri agreed, but they stayed in the room for a couple more hours, simply talking. When it was clear they were approaching the target, Anakin and the Tabri got themselves ready. They were going to capture the Star Forge, and the war would be theirs. 
a very simple transaction. Anakin and Tabre told their students to be ready in the hangar bays. They'd be in the bridge preparing to get an idea of where the weapon was and go after it. The two of them got up next to Admiral Coburn as they watched the fleet arrive out of hyperspace. The support ships got there first, before they were followed by the ships of the line. Admiral Coburn turned to the deckhands and told them to open up scanners for any potential objects orbiting the system. The deckhands responded saying they weren't picking up on anything. Anakin looked into Tatabre and asked her if they should let the Padawans lead a group of V-19s out and see if they could find the object. Tatabre looked at Anakin and then at Admiral Coburn, who shrugged his shoulders. Perhaps it wouldn't be a terrible idea. They could get some experience in the field without an active battle going on. Admiral Coburn called down to the hangar bay and informed Commanders Tano and Isaka that they'd be going and leading squadrons 4 and 7 into the field to search for the Star Forge. If they could find it, then they could direct the fleet into the right direction. The two Padawans looked to each other, and they were both giggling about something and then their faces turned white. One of the clone pilots told them that they would be fine. They had the clones to back them up. Ahsoka smiled and told Zala they would be alright. Zala nodded her head. She knew the day would come, but she was dreading it more than ever before. Of course, every day up until this day, she feared being a commander, but they always had Natabra or Anakin or Ahsoka or Cody that could go first. Of course, they would throw her into a leading position after Thyphera. Zala knew that no one was here. She was just nervous. She got out of her head and made her way to her ship and jumped in. The two Padawans lifted up and flew out of the hangar bays as their squadrons lined up behind them. Admiral Coburn told them to fan out. One of them could take the ground expedition and the other could investigate the far side of the planet. They acknowledged and moved out. Natabre and Anakin watched with pride as their students moved out into the space around Loek. Natabre asked Anakin if he believed they would find the weapon here, and he turned and suggested that he believed they would. It wasn't unreasonable to assume that they would. At the very least, they'd be a step closer than the Sith Empire, so that's all that really mattered, as long as the Sith didn't get to the weapon first. An hour would pass by, and Admiral Coburn would bring a request for the squadrons to return to base. There was no sign of this magnificent space station. Perhaps the artifacts had it all wrong. A deckhand called out the Admiral's name and told him that there were a number of objects coming out of hyperspace. He asked if they were allies or not. The deckhand didn't know. He was unsure. The frequency wasn't normal. The Admiral asked if it was space whales, and then the fleet dropped out of hyperspace. Coburn turned to the crew and told them to raise the shields. He then requested that the two squadrons get back to the fleet. Natabre told Anakin to come with her. He told her he'd be right there. Coburn told the Padawans that General Morden would be taking over the battle. There was no need to worry. Turns out there was a need to worry. Zala, who was in control of the squadron in space, was caught off guard. Her squadron was right next to the flagship of the Sith Lord, who was in control of the operation. Anakin was analyzing the fleet. While he wasn't super into reading in the sort, he liked to have an idea of what he was going up against. He counted the ships and looked at the flagship. He told the Admiral that that was one of the older Sith. Anakin then turned and ran out of the room. Coburn kind of threw his hands up. What good does that knowledge do him? As Anakin was making it to the hangar bay, Natabre told Skywalker from the air that Zala's squadron had been ripped apart and her ship was caught in a tractor beam at the back of their fleet. She didn't engage. She tried to reroute the troops as she was ordered, but that didn't work quite as well as the Admiral believed it would. While Natabre was bringing her squad around to counter the Sith, Ahsoka and her squad were able to group up behind her. The battle was finally getting started, and one of the Jedi was already missing. Skywalker flew his yellow starfighter out of the hangar bay, and spun it through a number of incoming missiles as he looked for the command ship. This particular Sith did it weird. His command ship was hidden on the far right of the flank, which wasn't too common for a Sith to do. They didn't like to risk themselves, but this particular Sith clearly didn't subscribe to that strategy. Skywalker told Natabre that he could make a beeline for the flagship, she wanted to argue because it was her Padawan, but he didn't have a squad behind him. He was the last to exit the hangar bay. She told him that she could provide cover fire. Before she could provide that cover, Ahsoka told her that she would do it. Ahsoka's squadron rolled over and followed Anakin as he blasted by, avoiding wings of fighters trying to cut him off. His resilience in the heat of battle was something to be admired, as he spun the ship through a hole in one of the flagships, which helped him avoid the fighters behind him. As Anakin pulled through, he saw the hangar bay, and the ship was clipped by a turbo laser. The blast almost obliterated his ship, but he was able to guide the vessel into the hangar bay where it slammed down, rocking him with a whiplash force. Anakin held onto the cockpit as the ship slid across the ground. He raided out and told them that he would need an LAAT pickup whenever they had a chance. He was stuck. Anakin popped R2 out of the vessel and unlatched himself, kicking the broken cockpit window out as he climbed from the ship. He turned around the hangar bay was lined with soldiers. Anakin raided in and told them that if they came, make sure they were prepared for the amount of troopers in the hangar bay. Anakin stepped forward with a bit of cockiness in his step. 
His adversary was holding the Padawan Zala by the back of her neck. It wasn't too forceful, but just enough that Anakin could see it. He grabbed his lightsaber and the man stepped out from behind the Padawan and waved his fingers. He told Skywalker that he'd been waiting for this encounter for a long time. Anakin looked to his sides and then back to the man, asking, Who are you? Skywalker's peculiar grin only aggravated Exar Gun. He told Anakin to stop where he was, so Anakin did, throwing his hands up into the air, kind of smiling. He asked what the Sith wanted, and this only continued to offend the Sith Lord. He told him that he was Lord Exar Gun, the leader of the Sith Empire. Anakin looked at the troops surrounding him. Whether it was a Sith Acolyte or a Grunt Trooper, they didn't seem too interested in his little spiel. Anakin turned back towards Exar with a grin on his face, and the Sith Lord told Anakin that he wanted to gut him with his own blade. Skywalker, despite his recent loss, was feeling all the more arrogant. Not in a bad way, but in a hyped up way. Exar just hyped him up by telling him he was actively hunting him for the entire war, or at least since Tython. How adorable. Exar ignited his lightsaber and raised it above his head. Anakin quickly pulled Zala with the force and caught her. She looked at him with shock on her face, but he turned her back and set her down, telling her to stay with R2. Zala slowly moved over to the droid as Skywalker ignited his lightsaber. Outside the ship, the fleet battle was intensifying. The Republic was outnumbered significantly, but Admiral Coburn and Natabre were working closely in tandem as they were communicating fluently with each other. Their efficiency allowed them to divide and conquer pieces of the Sith fleet, though a number of Republic support ships were starting to crumble. Due to Coburn's desire to save the fleet for as long as he could, not knowing when they would be able to get reinforcements, he moved support ships to the edge of their firing range. This left the fleet in a subtle disadvantage, but he was willing to do it to protect his sailors. Anakin and Exar slammed their blades together. Exar was genuinely impressed with the strength that Skywalker was able to distribute through one swing. But the Sith Lord had one advantage, experience. He knew a lot more than a 19-year-old Anakin did, and he would take advantage of that. They were spinning their blades slowly, nothing too quick, just a means to get a feel for the other. Anakin turned Exar around so he could keep an eye on Zala, as his back faced the Sith. Anakin kept remembering the alternative to this funny message, but it wasn't sticking in his mind. Where could he use it? They looked at each other and stammered back as Anakin blasted Exar backwards. The strike genuinely surprised the Sith Lord and it aggravated a sense of anger within him. Exar launched himself back at Skywalker and their blades toyed with each other, matching strike for strike, not avoiding what could become of a deadly encounter for either of them. Anakin was fighting up, just due to the skill set Exar had. The fighting only continued to intensify, as Anakin batted every attempt away from him until a strike from the Sith Lord cut upwards across Anakin's face and he fell to the ground holding his hand over his eye. Did he lose his sight? Anakin couldn't tell. Behind the cupped hand, he couldn't tell if he was blind or if it was just the darkness. Skywalker used one eye to look over at Exar who stood over him. Anakin scooted away trying to find his lightsaber as he pulled away his hand from his eye to see what felt like a blinding whiteness. Though every time he blinked he could see more and more of the surroundings form in front of his eyes. He wasn't blind, he was just temporarily blind from the extreme light that raided off the blade. He put his hand over his eye and felt the cut's heat and he pulled his hand back. Skywalker looked up at Exar who raised his hand over his head to strike down Anakin. As he prepared to lower his weapon, another lightsaber ignited. Exar turned around, picking the Padawan off the ground by grabbing a hold of her Jedi tunic. Anakin yelled out and used the force to launch Exar. His lightsaber dropped to the ground and he slammed into the side of the hangar bay. Sala fell to the ground and she looked over at Anakin. He nodded to her, grabbing his lightsaber and igniting, stammering back to where Zala was. All the Sith warriors refused to move. They just watched. Anakin told R2 and Zala to get behind him. Rescue was coming, hopefully. She needed to be the first one on the ship, though. She nodded her head and backed off with the droid behind her. Exar rose from the side of the hangar bay as he shook his shoulders as if he were preparing the square up. Anakin could feel the radiant darkness coming off of him. He thought of alternatives to fighting, but he wasn't seeing anything in the moment. Exar ran forward and shot lightning from both of his hands as Anakin blocked it with all of his strength and then watched the Sith Lord launch into the air and drag his blade into his hands with the force and ignite it, slamming down against Anakin's. The combo was very deadly, and Skywalker barely held his own. Outside the hangar bay, it was clear the Republic was being pushed from the WEC, and the Tabre was adamant on recovering Skywalker and her Padawan. Coburn was not thrilled with it, but he understood the desire. Thanks to Exar's decision to put his flagship on the edge of the flank, he could take advantage of it, so he did. not The fleet moved forward and broadsided the hell out of Exar's flagship. Inside the hangar, Anakin and Zala shook, but they held on. Skywalker was able to throw his blade against Exar, but the Sith Lord used an old cheat code that most Sith and Jedi pretty much agreed was illegal. He extinguished and then ignited his lightsaber, dropping the blade and swinging up. It was extremely lucky that Anakin mistimed the strike because if he hadn't, 
he would need another hand. The hangar was then filled with a firepower from every direction. Three LAATs entered, with two Jedi starfighters speeding through and laying waste to the Sith lines. The LAATs came in and started firing away, as the bay doors opened and suppressing fire was laid upon the Sith. Cody, Waxer, Boyle, and Lucky hopped out of the gunship and grabbed Zala's arm and brought her back into the ship. R2 got himself up into the ship, and Cody called out the Skywalker and told him he was clear. He told the gunships to go. They started lifting up, and the first two began to fail. XR charged Anakin, and they met again, spinning, swinging, and digging at each other. Anakin spun back and launched XR with the Force. He used his strength to block it, though the power still slid him across the bay floors. The Sith troopers tried to return fire, but it was far too late. Anakin extinguished his lightsaber, turned, and two fingers saluted the Sith Lord, telling him he'd see him at the finish line. He leapt up into the ship and the doors closed as it sped out of the hangar bay into space. The Republic was able to get most of his forces back into the vessels and retreat. Despite the Republic losing the battle, they only lost a number of starfighters and two support ships. Coburn's strategy melded really well with the timid Sith fleet, which is what allowed them to conserve their forces before they made the jump to hyperspace. When Zala got out of her LAAT, she reunited with her master and was in a bundle of tears. She was very skittish to lead, but there was something else going on. Anakin could feel it, but Natabre took her Padawan and took her somewhere private so she could talk with her alone. Commander Cody came up to Anakin before he could say anything to Ahsoka, telling him that he was needed on the bridge. Anakin nodded his head and turned over to Ahsoka and told her to come with. As she did, he told her that she did well, and he was very proud of her. Ahsoka thanked him, but she admitted that if it wasn't for Master Morden, she wouldn't have known what to do. Anakin smiled and told her while patting her shoulder, that the time would come when she would be proud of herself for her own accomplishments. She did well, with the assistance of the general. When they entered the bridge of the vessel, Admiral Coburn was looking at a clone trip with scuffed up armor. Shells were landing around him. The commands were all as simple as it could get. Retreat! The troops were moving quickly, and Rex picked up Master Windu, who was apparently knocked out by a blast that exploded right next to him after engaging with another Sith Lord. Rex, using his communication device while carrying Windu, told the Jedi General that the Sith knew. They were coming. They were out here, and they were ready to fight. Anakin turned to Coburn, who told them they were on Cordia, just a couple systems away. Anakin put his hand to his face, similar to the fashion of what his master would have done. He told Rex to get out of there as soon as they could. They needed to regroup. Admiral Coburn told Rex that they'd be going to Zaja. If they could regroup there, then perhaps there was a chance of getting to the Star Forge and holding it down. Anakin continued to look at the communication until the transmission ended. Commander Cody asked the Jedi General what it was. Anakin turned to him and Ahsoka, who were flanking his left side. He told them that perhaps the key to winning this war, or even finding the Star Forge, required an alternative means to fighting. Our season continues instead of Admiral Coburn's flagship. He was currently communicating with one of the other Venators in the fleet. They had already informed Jedi General Kit Fisto of where they'd be regrouping with General Windu's forces after they retreated from Godia. Anakin was pacing around the command bridge. Ahsoka was sitting next to Commander Cody, and they were watching Anakin seemingly lose his mind. There was so much going on, and Skywalker was worried about a number of things. Firstly, Zala's response from the previous encounter was something to worry about. The Battle of Wek was a terrible failure for the Republic, but at least they didn't lose any capital ships during the battle. So that's where the next issue began. One of the Venators was critically damaged during the fight, but it wasn't visible. The vessel didn't realize their issue until they got into hyperspace. A bomber happened to clip the engines of the ship, which had a precise lock into the hyperdrive room. The ship was nearly critical, and they were communicating with the Admiral to inform him that they didn't believe their ship would make it out of hyperspace, or in other words, explode upon arrival. They were ordered to slow their current trajectory. The main objective was to save the crew, but also get the rest of the fleet out of the way just in case it exploded. Admiral Goburn was at the front of the bridge, talking with his deckhand as he prepared a number of strategies. The biggest fear is that they would exit hyperspace and the shock of the hyperdrive would ignite a flame and rip through the entire system in the ship. The worst possible outcome of this happening would have the entire fleet getting damaged by this, which would be the worst thing for them to deal with at the moment. They were so close to the end of the line, so close to the weapon. On top of that, Anakin was pretty much in charge at the moment. He didn't know if Fisto's fleet would get out to their location soon enough, and with Windu at the moment injured by the blast on Kodia, there was an entirely realistic possibility that Anakin needed to be acting general alongside the Tabre, which in concept was fine due to their success on Tython, but this operation was much more imperative to the war effort. Anakin's focus, of course, fell back on the last thing that was revolving around the system of chaos plaguing his mind. What did the Sith want with him, and why did he know about Skywalker? At this point, no one in the Republic had any reason to believe that Scion had survived the Battle of Tython. 
so Skywalker didn't know why Exar would be interested in him, not to mention the fact that aside from Thyfera, he didn't interact with any Sith Lords. Tarkin never mentioned this in the previous debriefing, with what the Commandos uncovered on Endor about Sith activity hunting down certain Jedi Masters. So for Anakin, this was especially blindsided. As he got back to the end of his loop, he started openly asking why the Sith Lord would be looking for him. It made him even more worried, because Windu was such an incredible warrior too. Anakin knew he had a long way before he was going to be anywhere close to Windu's level, and the stress of all of this was starting to get to him. He stopped and turned to Ahsoka and Cody, and asked them if they knew anything about being on Zaja that could be related to their quest. Perhaps he should have asked earlier, but his mind was rambling on after their escape from the Wek. Cody pulled up a hollow map and told him that they didn't believe anything on Zaja was as important as what the maps were likely pointing to on the Wek. The hope is that the Sith Empire hadn't found what they were looking for. Anakin turned back and said that if the Starforge wasn't there, then perhaps it was on another planet in the range of this planet. Cody popped back up and showed the galaxy in that specific quadrant. He told General Skywalker that based on the schematics of the previously found items on Sira, Endo, and Bakura, as well as Biss and Mandalore, Cody didn't believe it was all connected, but the three planets out by wild space or the unknown regions would likely be close to or around the Starforge. He then showed off a number of planets where the Sith Empire could be potentially redirected, being that they could not find the Starforge on Lawak. Cody specifically highlighted Inaria, Ferriri, Lanera, and Tupla. Anakin walked up to the table and examined the planets. He noted that two of them were in between where they were going to, and Endor, so the chances are that it couldn't be there. He then asked where Lanera was, and Cody pointed it out on the map. Skywalker suggested that they reroute themselves to the location when they got set up on Zaja. It was imperative they got to the Star Force before the Sith Empire did. At this point, they were ahead of the curve, and the Republic needed to catch up. Cody acknowledged, and then Anakin told him that he would be right back. He was going to see if he could find General Morden and inform her of their potential plans, as well as the fears regarding the damaged Venator. The Dabra was unaware of most of it because she hadn't been to the bridge since they entered hyperspace. Anakin left the bridge and searched through the entire ship looking for his co-general. He could not find her, and he began to stress about it even more than he probably should have. He knew she was probably still inside the ship, but where was the bigger question? He then came across her in the hallways. She looked so distraught, as if she had run a decathlon and seen the death of an entire generation of a singular family. There was sadness on her face, and Anakin asked her how she was doing. The tiebreak kind of put her hand up and shook her head with sorrow in her eyes. Anakin asked if he could help her, and she tilted her head away. She opened her mouth to speak, but nothing came out. She stopped, then looked to the ground. The Tybra stepped forward and put her hand on Anakin's shoulder and said that she didn't believe she was cut out to be an instructor. Anakin turned to her in a rush and asked what she meant. The Tybra just looked at him and told him that she wanted to be everything her student needed, but she just didn't feel like she was able to be that. Anakin put his hand over top of hers and asked her to tell him. He would support her through this, just as she had him. The Tybra held onto his hand for a short moment and then released it. She told Anakin that there was something haunting Zala a past memory that she couldn't escape. She hadn't said anything about it and it sat idly in her heart since the temple fell. She continued and said that Zala struggled with making connections on Ankh too, and she was so apprehensive about leadership that she blamed herself for what happened at Loak. The Dabre told Zala that it wasn't her fault, but she shut down. She was, to an extent, inconsolable. She didn't want to listen and she just requested to be alone. Anakin told her that she wasn't a failure for that, she was just learning. There was no reason to be so hard on herself, for something that wasn't under her knowledge. Natabri agreed with the sentiment, but she told Anakin that Zala should have never been sent out there. Anakin reminded her that it was an ambush. There was no way for preparing for that type of attack. Zala was strong. She just needed to remember what the war would cost them. Natabri waved her hand towards Anakin, gesturing for him to come closer so she could whisper something to him. Anakin did, and she told him that she could feel the darkness within her student. It had been there since the first time they met but it was really hidden. The Tiber believed that the death experience in their last battle made everything real for Zala again, because it was under her leadership that it happened. Anakin started to realize it, and he told the Tiber that something had to have happened inside the Jedi Temple when the Sith Empire returned. The Tiber stepped back, and then she changed the subject. She knew that something else was going on, and she wanted to know what Anakin knew. He told her everything and even informed her of what happened inside the Sith Lord's flagship, Natabre then realized how troubling this entire scenario was becoming. She asked if he knew when Fisto's fleet would arrive, and he said that there was only hope, but truthfully, Anakin believed they'd be operating on their own. He asked her if he could do anything for her or Zal at the moment. 
Latabra thanked him and told him that there was nothing that could be done at the moment for either of them. She told Anakin that Zella needed time for herself. According to her, so she was willing to give her student time to reflect on what was upsetting her at the moment. The sirens inside the ship's hallway started to ring out, and the two generals looked to each other and darted for the bridge of the ship. When they got to the bridge, they were currently exiting from hyperspace. They looked at the Admiral, who was standing out in the bridge, before issuing out orders to the other ships in the fleet. It split up, as quickly as it could. The engines were turned on, and they had to go. Coburn ordered all the ships to raise their shields and go into evasive maneuvers. The fleet quickly listened as it broke off and moved away from the coordinates where the other Venator was supposed to arrive. The crew was able to slow down the ship just enough through hyperspace. It wasn't much, but it was enough to give the rest of the fleet a chance to split up and get away from a potentially dangerous explosion. When the damaged Venator arrived out of hyperspace, nothing happened. The crew on board the ship was communicating with everyone in the fleet, requesting for their bay doors and tractor beams to be open and ready. The moment the ship exited, the bay doors opened and the ship was mass evacuated. Every single escape pod was launched, all the fighters in the hangar bay, all the gunships were filled with troops and they evacuated. The engineers inside the bridge and the reactor room were quick at work trying to maintain the stability of the hyperdrive before it began slipping on them. The troops were still evacuating the vessel when it exploded, ripping through not just the Venator but the few unlucky troops who were still trying to get away. Anakin called out to the other vessels, telling them to get search crews out there immediately and try and find as many survivors as they could. The troops quickly got to work, but Tybri told Anakin that she would go out there and help them in the search. Anakin watched her as she ran out of the bridge and then turned back. He asked the Admiral if there were any other vessels damaged by the explosion. He shook his head. It seemed as if everything was under control. About an hour into the search and rescue, Coburn was alerted to vessels coming out of hyperspace. The fleet had since regrouped and he was worried it was a Sith, but their frequencies were fuzzy so they didn't realize it was Mace Windu's fleet. With the new fleet having arrived, Skywalker told Admiral Coburn that he would go over to their flagship to see if Master Windu was alright. Coburn nodded his head and he suggested that he hurry. With the fleets having regrouped, it would be optimal time to reroute themselves to another location so they could find the hidden weapon. He agreed. Anakin moved down to the hangar bays and departed for Windu's flagship. Upon his arrival, he was greeted by Captain Rex, who introduced himself once again. Skywalker was very warm to Rex and the feeling between the two of them is that they probably had known each other in another lifetime. There was this instant understanding of the other the moment they started talking. While Rex took Skywalker to Windu, the fleet regrouped into a larger fleet. Despite Admiral Yularen's rank as an admiral, he went by Admiral Coburn's lead. The fleet needed one solitary leader, and due to the successes of Coburn's fleet at Malastare, they were more inclined to follow his lead. This wasn't anything against Yularen. Most of his battles had just been maintaining a defensive presence. His last offense was at Kodia, and that obviously hadn't turned out so well. Coburn was grateful for the respect that was levied onto him by his peers. He and Cody had already decided that they would make their move for Lunara, once Skywalker returned to the ship. The search and rescue was finishing up at the same time. Out of the 7,400 troops that frequented most Venators, there were only around 340 men that were unaccounted for, likely killed in the blast. It was a shame, but the numbers were significantly better than losing 7,400 men to that blast. The Tabre had returned to Coburn's flagship and she was trying to get time to talk with her student. She was worried about Zala, and while Zala was really put off to the whole Lewek situation, she was finally allowing her master time to talk with her. Anakin entered Mace's room and saw him attached to a couple of wires. Medical droids surrounded him, but he was breathing, which was all that mattered. Mace wasn't awake and Anakin was simply hoping that he would be. Without Mace awake, he would likely have to take full command over the fleet alongside the Tabre. If the stresses of being a military leader hadn't gotten to him before, they were now. Instead of just leading one army alongside Natabre, the two of them would be leading the two most elite units in the Grand Army of the Republic. Anakin sat down and could see Mace opening his eyes. He turned over ever so slightly to Skywalker. He was genuinely happy to see him. He turned his body over ever so slightly and told Skywalker that he would be taking command. Natabre would be by his side. He took a deep breath, reeling from the pain he was in. Anakin got up and tried to get the Jedi Master the rest. Mace reached his hand up and grabbed Skywalker's arm as he was trying to gently push him back to the bed. Anakin's eyes darted down to Mace's arm, which was covered in burned scars. His robes had been shredded and there were small bandages across his arm. Anakin could only imagine what lay under the bandages, especially since the bruises and burn scars that weren't covered up were already bad enough as they were. Mace grabbed Anakin's arm with force and he told Skywalker that they were the key to all this. The two of them were at the front of this push to find the weapon. They could do it. Mace's skin started to tremble, and the medical droids came up to sedate him. As a vial was stuck into his arm, he looked at Skywalker and told him, Trust the Force. Anakin gently lowered Mace's arm down to his side and looked down. He didn't know what to do. 
What was he supposed to do? He turned to Captain Rex, who was standing behind him, and he could see the lack of confidence in Anakin's eyes, so he asked the general what their next orders were. All the men were ready. Anakin looked up at Rex and told him that he would return to his flagship and they would find this weapon, wherever it may be. On the Wek, the Sith mounted up around Exar Kun. Most of the fleets weren't present, but the respected Sith Lords were. Exar called upon his subordinates, as he believed they were, and began telling them that this was their moment of triumph. He informed them that their route to the Star Forge was directly upon them. He wanted all Sith Empire fleets to mount up and make them move for the Lanara system. Revan asked if this was a bright idea to move all fleets to this location. Exar asked Revan why he was questioning him. Revan simply said that if the Star Forge was indeed on Lanara, why don't they blockade every system that leads to the planet? Yodazaja, Kodia, Lawek, Endor, and so forth. There was no reason to build up their forces where the weapon was. One fleet would suffice. Exar did see this point, and he told Revan that they would be following that particular model. All their vessels would relocate to various sectors to keep the Republic away from the most important prize in the galaxy. Exar was so confident that they would reach this finish line first. He immediately dispatched his fleet for the Lanera system. Outside of Zaja, Skywalker and Morden told Admiral Coburn that it was time to move the fleet out. The fleet, which had completely doubled in size for the jump to hyperspace, moved towards the star system. Moments after they began the jump in the hyperspace, a call began. It was Plo Koon. Instead of various admirals and so forth, it was exclusively Jedi. Anakin and Chabra stood side by side. Neither other students were in the room. Plo spoke before the group and told the collective that in the absence of Master Windu, he would take the mantle so that there was direction. The key to their victory was ending the war and finding the weapon. The Tiber told the Jedi that their fleet was en route to the Lanera system. When asked why they were going there, Anakin told him that it was the place they needed to go. Plo was rather silent, and then disappointed when neither general could provide concrete evidence for why they were going there. Just based on how everything had gone thus far, they believed it all led to Lanera. Plo just wished that the Force be with them, and that they had their success. Once their little topic was finished, Master Even Peel apologized to the Council and informed them that Captain Tarkin left out some imperative information during their last debriefing. He told them that the Sith had a hit list of every Jedi they were actively targeting. Delta Squad picked up some radio transmissions from the Forest Moon of Endor, reporting that the Sith were looking for specific Jedi. He told them that Windu was one of them, which was likely why he was in critical condition. His injuries were getting worse and there was a fear for his survival at this point. On the other hand, Anakin had confirmed this and told them that a Sith Lord, Exar Kun, said he was actively waiting for their encounter. He was able to get away from the fight. Anakin did admit that he struggled against the likes of Exar. He did also confirm that he believed he was the Lord of all the Sith, but the men he served didn't seem to care for his sentiment regarding being such an individual. Anakin then suggested that maybe the Jedi should be more careful in active battlefronts to avoid being killed off by the Sith. Even did apologize on behalf of his captain. At the moment, Even wasn't sure if this action was intentional or not. Tarkin did openly seem disenchanted with the Jedi and their type of strategy, though there was no way for them to confirm that Tarkin deliberately didn't inform the Jedi of this information. Regardless, the consensus was to be careful. The Sith were openly headhunting Jedi before trying to engage with the clones. They figured that if they take out the Jedi personnel, then the war would get easier. After this small piece of discussion concluded, Master Fisto informed them that his fleet would be in the Zaja sector soon. He'd be ready to reinforce Skywalker when he arrived. Plo then gave a speech to the Jedi, and most specifically a speech directed to those who were putting the galaxy onto their shoulders and doing everything in their collective power to save the people they cared about. Plo turned to Anakin and Atabre, the youngest of this call. They were only 18 and 19. It was truthfully by coincidence they were out this far in the galaxy, but it was their moment to stand up to these monsters, the ones who could rip the galaxy down, shred it to pieces, and enslave every corner of the known galaxy. It was up to them, but they were not alone. Every Jedi who had ever come before them was with them on this endeavor. He told them to trust the Force, it would guide them to victory. The call ended and the two Jedi looked to each other. The pressure was now on them to do what seemed to be impossible. Everyone on the bridge turned their attention towards them. Anakin and Atabre looked to each other and met their gaze for a short moment before turning back and looking back out to all the people on their bridge. They told them to not be worried. They would be victorious. They would take this weapon and they would win this war. Their combined leadership would assist them in defeating their enemies, as well as a fire that sat within each soldier in their collective army. Anakin and Atabre then dismissed themselves from the bridge and made their way to the elevator at the back. They both had a silent confidence but there was a weight, one so much greater than ever before. The two of them shuffled it into the elevator and looked at each other. It was their fight. 
the weight of what sat before them crept over their shoulders, and the two of them lowered their heads and placed them against each other. A much simpler embrace, but one to just let the other know that they were to be as one through this. As long as they had each other by their side, then they'd proved to be victorious. They held their heads against each other's for a short moment before pulling back. The force was strong between them, and the bond that sat between the two of them was stronger than ever before. Next to them, the doors shot open, and they ferried themselves out. The Tabre told Anakin that she would go to her student and prepare her for their approach. While it wasn't clear or not that a battle may sit ahead of them, Zala needed to be ready. Skywalker watched the Tabre walk down the hallway. He had a number of words that he would like to share with her, but perhaps they could wait. Maybe they would have more time before they arrived. There was a looming worry throughout the fleet that they would encounter the Sith and be forced into a tense standoff. Without total knowledge that they would be there or not, it left the anticipation and anxiety within the ship very high. Skywalker turned and made his way to where Ahsoka likely was, either torturing Cody by annoying him with constant questioning or in the training room. She was in the latter. The Tybre knocked on Zala's door, and she was told that she could enter. Similarly to how Anakin was meditating, Zala was too. But she was in the back of her room with her hood over her head, and she was sitting next to a small light. She looked up at her master, and a tear slid down her face. The Tybre walked forward and let the door close behind her. She asked what was bothering her. Zala was again, lacking the transparency she lacked before. The Tybre told her student that if their bond was to be fully fleshed out, they needed to trust each other. She continued, telling her student that she wanted to help her, but she couldn't do everything. She wasn't a mind reader. She would help her, but it required her help. Zala took a deep breath. She told her master that her fear, her pain, her languish, all of it came from the temple. It wasn't an excuse, as Zala was putting herself down, listening to the power of the Jedi Code, rather than her own emotions. She told her master that when the temple fell, she was a part of the last group out of the temple. She was with her peers and her best friend, who was running right behind her, and she was clipped in the back of the leg. Her friend dropped, and Zala stopped. The Tabri looked forward, inching closer to her student, to try and offer some sort of comfort. Another tear fell from her face, and she turned away, hiding it in her arm. Under a broken and distorted voice, one so muffled by her sleeve, the Tabri could make out a few words, but the one she did retain involved the clones, and the temple, and her friend. The Tabri began to realize that whatever happened in the temple was something she felt responsible for. It led all the way back to who she was on the Garden Island, why she was always breaking up fights and trying to help people. All of it was mounting up, and she just couldn't see it, but she could feel it. There was a certain darkness about her student, and she was uncovering the secrets of what it was. Natabri reached her hand out towards her student, and laid it gently across Zala's shoulder and told her that it would be okay. She wasn't responsible for what had happened. Zala's eyes opened, and there was blood in them. Twisted and vile, like she was cursed by the witches of Dathmir or worse. She told her master that her friend died because of her. Just as her squadron died because of her, Zala twisted her eyes down towards her master's hand and then back into her beautiful amber eyes. She told her master that her friend fell. She turned around and one of the ancient pillars inside the temple was clipped by a rocket. Zala reached out with a force. The battle continued to intensify around her. Zala's instructors didn't realize it was happening and Zala went to save her friend. Both of her hands lifting up into the air and she caught it at the final second. Her friend started to try and get up, but instead of getting up, she couldn't move. Zala dropped the pillar on her back, and she looked at her best friend, someone she had known for a decade inside the temple, slain by her own actions. The Tabre gently brushed her hand across her student's shoulder and told her that it didn't mean it was her fault. Zala continued and told her master that it was. As her friend tried to get up and run away, Zala accidentally pulled the pillar back instead of forward. It was the worst mistake of her life. As she watched her friend get crushed, though nothing was more painful than the look of betrayal on her friend's face when she looked up to her best friend, the one whose face was filled with terror for what she had done to her. The Tabri could feel all of her students' pain in the moment. Everything made sense. Her desire to break up fights, her silence for her punishment, her fear of leadership, the blame she shifted onto herself for what happened at Lowak. The Tabri told her student that her friend wouldn't ever blame her for what happened. It wasn't her burden to bear. The Order should have been more prepared for what happened, and they weren't. She couldn't blame herself for it. It was a collective failure, and while the look may have been betrayal, there was no reason for Zala to blame herself for what she could not control. To hold a pillar of such size wasn't an easy feat for someone so young, let alone an adult. Her friend would have been proud of her. Zala looked at her master and bit her lip, trying to refrain from showing any sort of emotion, but she couldn't hold on to it forever. The Tabra slid a little bit closer, leaning her back against the side of the bed, and she told her student that it would be alright. She asked Zala what her friend's name was, and she told her master that it was Algi. The Tabra opened her arms up and brought her student in and told her that no matter what, 
she would always have her back. To Zala, Natabre was home. About 30 minutes later, Natabre found Anakin who was inside the hangar bit with Ahsoka. The two of them were working with their vessels when Natabre came in and found them. She walked over to Anakin's ship and knelt down and asked if she could talk to him. He rolled out from under the ship and called over to Ahsoka and asked her to put the plate back on the bottom of his ship whenever she was finished with hers. She kind of sighed but told him that she wouldn't. Anakin got up and followed Natabre out of the room. She told him about what happened with her and her student and told him that she was worried about Zala. Anakin reminded her to take a look at him. His master was always close to the code and so he often stressed about whether or not his student would become a Jedi, the Jedi Qui-Gon would have wanted him to become. While Anakin wasn't ever going to be Qui-Gon's student without Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan was a good master. He just insisted that she persist through it. This challenge would likely make her bond with her master stronger. She did agree, but part of her was still concerned that no matter what she did, she would never be enough to save her student from her own mind. Anakin noticed this and he told her that she just had to continue believing herself. Skywalker didn't really know what else to say here. He was kind of out of his league. He didn't have the proper words to say it, like a true Jedi Master would. But that wasn't the point. The top and Anakin didn't confide in each other because they expected to get the right or the best or even most Jedi-like answer. It was because they needed the other. They had the other, and that was everything to them, especially in a war like this. Within the coming hour, the fleet would prepare to drop out of hyperspace. Admiral Coburn watched over the scanners. He noticed that something odd was coming up, and then he realized there was an entire enemy fleet present in Lanera. It seemed as if Cody was right about potential targets. The alarms began to sound throughout the entire ship as the Admiral reached out to the other ships in the fleet to inform them. They collectively noticed everything at the same time. They all went to high alert as they quickly prepared for everything and for battle. Anakin and the Tabre were in the hangar with their students when the alarms began to sound, and they immediately prepared their vessels. The Tabre went to her student and told her to keep close. Everything would be alright. Her smile was so reassuring and it sent a wave of comfort through Zala. They quickly made their way to the Starfighters. The hangar bays across all the Venators filled with echoes of Starfighter engines shooting on and preparing to lift off. For all the pilots, whether they be clones or Jedi, the anticipation was eating away at them. They didn't know what to expect here, but whatever came next would decide the fate of the galaxy. The Republic fleet exited hyperspace, and it left the Sith Lord in charge of the fleet in a state of terror. Exar Khan had no clue how the Jedi got here, but he rerouted his fleet to face back towards the Republic. The reason the Republic hadn't noticed the Sith fleet over the scanners is because the Sith had just arrived as well. The timing was perfect, and both fleets were thrusted into an engagement. The most terrifying piece of this encounter for the Sith is despite their previous victory against the Republic, what they were looking at was a fleet double the size it was before. While Exar learned from his previous encounter with the Republic and placed a ship at the center of the fleet behind some support vessels, he was left unsure of how he could handle this massive Republic force. Admiral Coburn had the fleet ready and already grouped up, so when they exited hyperspace, they were ready for the engagement, which obviously wasn't intentional, it was just how Coburn approached entering unknown systems. The Sith Empire's fleet was looking in the wrong direction, they were facing the planet, and the Republic exited hyperspace to the starboard side of their flank. Exar left it up to his fleet commander to redirect the fleet into a counter for the Republic. The Sith could see early on that the only way they'd be able to come out of this alive is through the use of superior strategy. Exar began searching the scanners for the legendary weapon they came here for. Inside the hangar bay of the Venators, fighters launched out. Skywalker and Morden using the same strategy they used on Malister and Lewek, though this time they were going to go for the throat. The Sith fleet launched its fighters to counter the attack on the Republic. Coburn got into range of the heavy cannons and they opened fire on their mark. Zala and Ahsoka kept close to their masters as the Republic fighters moved forward for their assault on the Sith. The wings sped up and they collided. The fighter assault was massive. But with four Jedi leading the charge, the Sith very quickly realized they were outmatched by their opponents. Coburn continued his pursuit forward. He didn't typically play so aggressively, but he had the forces to fight the way he would have preferred to fight, and with someone like Admiral Yularen in his arsenal, he couldn't help but use him. Coburn raided across the fleet and told Yularen to move his half of the fleet into the preemptive countering position. While neither of them went to the same academies, Yularen and Coburn, before the war, had undergone basic fleet movements with each other. The purpose of this move was to position the Republic fleet in a place where they could counterattack anything the Sith used as a counterattack against them. Yularen took three ships of the line, including his capital ship, as they moved to the side of the flank. By this point, Coburn was no longer concerned about what they had here. His main objective was destroying this fleet. The Sith capital ships pulled themselves around so they could perfectly begin their engagement with the Republic. 
Coburn could see this, so he contacted the Jedi and told them that it was time for them to open up a hole in the Sith lines. Skywalker and Morden were at the front of the lines. Zala and Ahsoka were pulling up behind them, using all their knowledge to help the clones they were serving with. Because of Skywalker and Morden, the Republic fighters were making an aggressive push that couldn't really be slowed down. Coburn noticed a hole in their lines and the Y-Wings were launched. It would be a difficult task, but thanks to the turrets and the bombers, it would be a successful mission. The Y-Wings pulled out and pressed forward. Coburn told Skywalker about it, and he called over to Ahsoka and Zala and told them that they would join up with the bombers. He expressed over the communications that he believed in them, reminding them to stick together so that they could get to the bombers and get to their target destination. The Tybra called over to Anakin and told him that the flagship was seemingly making a run. She noticed it due to the hole in the side of the hangar bay from the previous encounter, not to mention that it was out of position in comparison to the rest of the fleet. Anakin knew they wouldn't be able to strike the flagship, simply due to the fact that his positioning was behind the rest of the Sith lines. Anakin and Atabre could certainly make it, but they needed a squad to support them, and endangering a group of non-bombing fighters wouldn't make it worth the risk. If the V-19s could bomb the flagship, then it would be worth it, because there'd be a chance at shutting down the shield generator, or more importantly the engine so they couldn't escape. Coburn noticed this, which is exactly why Yularen was moved out of position. Due to the movements, the Sith made a counter move, which completely divided their fleet, leaving them too vulnerable. Coburn watched the center of the Sith lines completely shatter as they tried to make a counter. Yularen's directive was simply to prepare for a counterattack. He was out of range, and being that the Sith had to try and stop him before he attacked Exar's flagship, they chased him. Yularen could see it, and then with the Sith moving in, he used an unorthodox strategy that Skywalker suggested last second, seeing it through the fighter fight. He called over it and told Yularen his idea, and the Admiral liked it. The top brain, three groups of V-19s broke off from the main fighter fight as they chased the other half of the fleet. At the same time, Zala and Ahsoka led their bombers up the side of the hulls of the two capital ships. The vessels they were targeting were ships of the line, and once they were getting damaged, the two Padawans pulled away. The ship lost their shields. Zala went portside, and Ahsoka broke off starboard. The bombers followed each commander and continued their assault. As the Tybra and her forces were catching up with the Sith that split their fleet in two, she watched several wings of Sith fighters get deployed. She couldn't believe it. They were genuinely prepared for legitimate counterattack. But that's why Yularen was here. From his hangar bays, the remainder of his fighter force exited, along with additional allies. Despite LAATs being gunships, their lasers and rockets would be great assistance to providing flak cover for the bombers to make their way up the Sith vessels. The strength of the mines inside the Republic fleet were working, and due to Natabra breaking off, she had a great counter to the Sith forces. They wouldn't see it coming simply due to the fact that they weren't hyper-fixated on the Republic fighters. The ships that moved away from the bulk were still under the impression that the rest of the fleet was holding its own, but it most certainly was not. When the counter Sith fleet entered its range of the heavy cannons, Yularen poured all this firepower out, and with the fighters, gunships, and bombers, they stood no chance. Skywalker, on the other hand, continued breaking in and across the Sith lines until he saw the flagship breaking away from the conflict. He called out to his lead pilot and requested for him to cover him. Anakin sped out, avoiding a number of potentially dangerous encounters, before cutting down a couple fighters in the way and speeding forward. He could see the Sith flagship right in front of him, and he turned on his afterburners. Skywalker focused and pressed the ship as hard as he could. As he got closer, he could feel the presence of the same Sith he met over Loek, and he pushed the ship over the breaking limit as he buzzed the bridge to the flagship. Exer looked on in disgust and told the deckhand to prepare to jump to hyperspace. The crew was in an outrage. They could not believe him. But what could they do? He turned back and told them that they were dead anyways. There was no point in saving those who were already lost. Truthfully, due to Exar having the flagship, he could have likely saved a couple of ships, and he definitely could have saved thousands of his own troops. But he turned to the crew and scowled. Since the weapon wasn't here, it was time to regroup elsewhere. This particular fleet was such a waste of resources anyways. The several Sith on the bridge just stood in silence. These warriors of the dark side were repulsed by his decision to leave their own men behind, but they listened. As a flagship, began its retreat. The deckhands did as they were asked, and XR flagship jumped into hyperspace. Anakin called to Coburn and told him that the flagship was gone. Their battle would be over soon. There were still a number of Sith fighters and ships to worry about. This wouldn't be an issue for the Republic, still not having realized that the Starforge wasn't here at Lanera. Skywalker moved back towards the rest of the fleet. When his ship fully turned around, he could see the students finishing their jobs, leading the bombers across remaining star cruisers and capital ships. Coburn delected the fleet forward, and the heavy cannon shredded what little remained. For the Sith, they knew their fight was over the moment Exar left. All their motivation to fight vanished, and aside from the already badly crippled vessels, they began moving in the different directions and jumping in the hyperspace. 
The Sith fleet, once under the helm of Exar Kun, was shredded and the Republic claimed their victory. As the fighters redirected themselves to the fleet, Anakin got in communication with Coburn and asked what the weapon was, and he simply responded that there was no sign of the weapon here in Lanera. Anakin felt a wave of shock wash over his body. He then asked if he had checked the scanners again, and he confirmed that they had. The Jedi slowly descended into the hangar bays after all the fighters had landed. Skywalker sat in his cockpit once he finally landed and settled on the ground. He took a deep breath. What were they going to do now? As Skywalker got out of his ship and looked over, he saw Natabra congratulating her student. Zala was proud of herself for her resilience. While it wasn't necessarily leading, she was guiding, and despite a few casualties, she wasn't a total wreck this time around. He smiled and found Ahsoka, who was kind of reeling from the loss. Anakin asked her to come along with him. They talked about the battle and he told her that everything would be alright. The losses would come, it was war, and that was leadership. It was hard for Ahsoka, just as it was for Zala. In the previous battle, she hadn't encountered any loss under her leadership, so it was her turn to learn the cost of war. When they got to the bridge, Skywalker asked for Admiral Coburn to open up the long-range scanners. He informed him that he already had. Commander Cody stood at the hollow map, trying to figure out any number of places the weapon could be located at. Coburn informed Skywalker that General Fisser's fleet arrived in the Zaja system. Anakin turned his head to Cody and Ahsoka, who stood close to his side, shadowing him. Skywalker told the crew around him that they were doing well. They were that much closer to victory. With the Sith fleet dispersed, victory was within their grasp. There was fire in his eyes. He hated the idea of having to inform the Sith that he lost his fleet over Lanera, losing just another fleet. That loss would be a costly one simply due to losing the entire fleet this far away from their production planets. Exar gritted his teeth, and one of his deckhands turned around and told him that they were picking up something on their scanners. He turned back and asked what it was. The deckhand told him that it was a massive object, something that was much larger than any vessel they'd ever seen. Exar told him to pull the ship towards it. As they started getting close to the object, they could see it through the windows on the bridge. As it turned out, Exar read the name of the system wrong. He read the Lanera system instead of the Lehan system. The Sith fleet was supposed to head towards the planet Tupla, which was the planet they were currently outside of. His mistake had only cost them time, but it did not matter. They had won the race. The Star Forge would be under Sith control. Our season continues inside the Republic fleet on the bridge of Admiral Coburn's flying ship. Cody, Coburn, Ahsoka, Hazala, Anakin, and Tabre were trying to figure out where they needed to go. The same planets that they had analyzed on Zaja kept coming up as they tried to figure out where the Star Forge could be. It was clear the Sith came here to find the weapon, so if it wasn't here, then where could it be? The planets they were still looking at were Ganaria, Ferreri, Ratatak, and Dupla. All of them were a short jump away, and there was a fear of sending out a smaller group to those planets. It was even more apparent than ever before that the Sith were hot in the trail of Starforge. If they were out here, then someone knew something. With Kisphisso's fleet so close, they needed to regroup and form up. What would likely be the largest fleet in the Republic Navy, aside from those that defended the key worlds like Kamino? Skywalker pointed to the map and suggested that they find their planet and move out. Coburn was very quick to deny that. There'd be no point in relocating the entire fleet if they didn't know where they were going. There was still the potential that what they were looking for could be on this planet. The Tybre refuted that. If the weapon was still here, their search for it was pointless, because if it was on the planet, then the chances are it had already been destroyed over the years probably crashing down on the surface. That was a fair point, but there was no readings of anything on the ground. Coburn had groups of scouts scouring the planet ever since their victory, and yet there were no signs of it. Though not for nothing, it didn't help that they didn't have a genuine idea of what they were looking for. The weapon was massive according to the ancients, but what else was there? The Republic had no clue if it was actually massive, or if it was just fake, or if the people just made it up and it didn't actually exist. The air in the room felt so stale. Their eagerness to bring the war to an end felt so tangible, but now it was just slipping away like the myth of the Star Forge itself. Not far away from Lanera, Lord Exar exited his starship, with the shuttle full of his best troops. The weapon stood right before their very eyes. With a damaged flagship, the potential for true power and complete intergalactic domination stood at his fingertips. He was so lucky that Revan was all the wiser to suggest keeping the Sith fleet separated. Exar knew Revan would fall for the trap. Not for nothing, Exar had been picking up on the alliance between Revan and Bane, and keeping them separated was the key to making this work. He believed highly in himself. Despite his early failures as a military leader, he knew he would find the weapon first. The perfect way to keep all the other Sith Wards away from him was having someone else suggest the fleets not all meet up at the location of the Starforge, rather keep the space around it safe from the Republic 
and or potential threats from the Separatists. It was a brilliant maneuver, and while if his reading comprehension skills were better, he would have gotten here sooner, it didn't matter. The Republic had no clue where he was. All they had was a few potential surrounding planets that they could go to, the Lunera. XR shuttle slowly cruised towards the massive structure. It was magnificent. He couldn't help but think of the Sith Empire fully under his control. The shuttle got closer and closer, and they realized all the bay doors had been locked down. XR made his way to the bridge of the shuttle and used the force to pry open the doors long enough for the shuttle to land. He noted that it hadn't been turned on in likely over a millennia, so it was freezing on the inside of the structure. Not to mention the air quality, while intact, was terrible. It wasn't quite dead air, but it was as close as it could get to being dead air. Exer told his men to fan out and find the on switch for the station. They looked at him and all in sequence nodded their heads as they exited the shuttle. The cold and eeriness of the structure only left their imaginations to wonder what the hell awaited them on the inside of it. They started forward, splitting up into two groups to scour the structure. Exer walked down the ramp last. He felt the chill the moment he exited the shuttle. He knew it would take time for him to find the switch to turn it on. So, he lifted his wrist and told the captain of the flagship to prepare the boarding sequence so they could have all their troops situated. The flagship no longer mattered to him. All that mattered was what he could create. Once the orders were issued, he turned and started down the hallway. The interior of the ship was slightly decayed. It wasn't terrible, being that one could still breathe inside the facility. In the hallways were broken panels, wires sitting on the ground, holes in the floor and walls. Though the most important thing is that the exterior of the Star Forge was undamaged. Exar got to an elevator shaft and used a force to fling the doors open. He looked at the elevator, which was sitting on the floor below him. He gently trotted across it and used it to push himself upwards. He ignited his lightsaber and slammed it into the wall as he left from side to side inside the elevator shaft before reaching a point he believed to have what he was looking for. Exar blasted the doors open with the force and rolled into the room. When he got out of his roll, he climbed off of his knees to his feet and looked around the room. He could see the planet Tupla, and then he realized that he was on the bridge. His smile widened and he looked around. This was an older device, which meant that all of its controls, or at least the gears to get it jump started, would be physical rather than computer operated, which was great for him, because all of his engineers and deckhands were collectively stupid. He walked around the bridge and looked for a lever. He found one, but it wasn't just one lever. There was a couple of them in a row. The dialects above the levers wasn't exactly legible, mostly because it was all decayed, but also it was in a completely different language. XR just treaded lightly. He grabbed the first lever and pulled it down. He could feel the engines on the weapon churning. He continued to pull the next one down. A couple moments later, he had all the levers pulled down, and a violent sounding horn raged over the entire facility. It caused the captain of the flagship to put the shields up, and every single accolade inside the facility to drop to the ground. The lights inside the facility flickered, and then it came back to life. Though some of the electrical wires had been misplaced and began sparking which would be problematic for people who like to play with electricity. XR looked at the panels on the bridge as they lit up with data and schematics for tons of things he couldn't even understand. He called back to the captain and requested that every single engineer and deckhand came to his location, tapping on a button on his wrist that activated a signal for them to follow. It would take several minutes, but the individuals would usher themselves to the broken frame door and get to work. XR, while they were doing this, started looking elsewhere in the facility. He wanted a throne room, and luckily enough, he found one at the top of the structure. It was a little difficult to get to, but he'd rather it be difficult to get to rather than not be here. What was even better is that it was outfitted with a control center, so he could have his engineers working for him inside of his throne as he watched his fleet grow. Hours would pass by on Tupla until everything was set up the way he wanted it. Everything was translated into galactic common so we could understand it, and the instructions for the weapon were given over to him. All he had to do was kill a star. Exar got up from his throne and walked to the front of the room and looked down at the planet. He turned to his deckhands and told them to begin the ignition of the Star Forge. Destroy the sun of the land system. Every single sentient being in this part of the galaxy would die. But he didn't care. It would fuel his super weapon and his aspirations for galactic dominance. The power surge started and the massive weapon began to shift on its axis, directing itself outwards towards the sun which was in the center of the star system. And within moments, a grinding could be heard. The power of the sun was being sucked into the structure. Exar stood on the bridge, laughing as he watched the sun die before his very eyes. The Sith acolytes from his flagship stood in his throne room idly waiting for the next directive, but all they could do was listen to his insidious snarl as he stood overlooking the death of a star. Orbiting Lanera was a Republic, and one of the deckhands on Coburn's flagship indicated that they were picking up a massive surge from deep within a system or two over. 
Coburn asked what it was, and the deckhand admitted that he was unsure, but the readings were off the charts. Everything was out of place with this. He noticed that the energy was similar to that of what came from a star, but instead of it releasing that energy, it was being sucked up. He didn't know what it was, but it seemed like the energy of a star was being transferred to another location within the system. Skywalker turned over to Coburn and asked if it was a planet or a structure. The deckhand didn't know. It could be either. It looked like it was a structure by the readouts, but it was too close to a planet, if it was a structure, to be identified. Coburn turned to the group and told them that it was time to relocate. Natabre called out, asking about Fisto's fleet, and Coburn, while not known for his aggressive strategy and style, told her they didn't have time to waste. General Fisto would have to meet them there. The fate of the galaxy would be decided in this contest. The Tybrain Anakin knew it, but with Coburn ready for action, he called back the recon groups who were still searching for the weapon on the ground and gave out a fleet layout. He didn't know what to expect upon their arrival, but if this weapon was as deadly as it was rumored to be, they needed something quick. So he delved into the usage of a pincer movement. The fleet quickly turned on their afterburners and began piecing itself together. By the time the fleet was ready, the recon fighters had returned back to the hangar bays, and the fleet jumped into hyperspace. Once the fleet was in hyperspace, Coburn personally contacted General Fisto and told him of the unfolding situation and expressed that they couldn't have waited. Plus, he believed the element of survives from their fleet would be all the more helpful for their attack on the weapon. With General Fisto arriving late, they had that element of surprise. Skywalker and Morden had gotten out most of their grievances and emotions before the previous battle, believing it was the end. So, instead of doing that again, they just stood by each other's side on the bridge, sitting over a hollow map as a couple deckhands on the consoles tried to piece together what they believed the battlefield to look like. They didn't know who or what was there, so they were basing their fleet layout of their opponent off of previously recorded battles from the war. Cody did assume that the Sith fleet was just the flagship from the previous battle, but to be cautious or at least prepared, they had a makeshift fleet set up prepared for their arrival. Anakin and Natabra were standing so close that their shoulders were touching, but no one noticed it. Ahsoka and Zala were in the youngling training room, getting each other hyped up. They knew how important this mission was, and if they weren't prepared, then they would fail. They could not do that, which is why they were together. It was that they understood each other being the same age, so they having each other through this encounter would be incredibly important for their own sanity. They both had a lot of nerves, and while they had no intention of wearing themselves out, they needed to get those nerves out of their system. If they didn't, then they'd be way too tense for the battle that they were going into. Over Tupla, Exar watched the rest of the star die, and the Leon system went dark. He could see the planet below go cold. It would take time for everything down there to die, but he got up from his throne and walked over to the control panel. While the star was being destroyed by the Star Forge, Exar had his engineers design some vessels that could be built. At the same time, he also requested for a number of droids to be built. They obviously didn't have the crew to fill up those vessels that they are about to build, so they needed to come up with some designs. Luckily, the Sith had a couple assassin droids that they could use as baselines, like HK units, though the programming would have to be a little bit different which wasn't a big deal to them anyways. The engineers just took everything inside the HK programming and redesigned it. There were different variations. There were basic troop variants, but the main was just the operational droids, with the sole purpose of operating all the vessels that had been designed by the engineers. Ever since they learned about the Star Forge and its capabilities, they had been designing and redesigning everything they planned on using and building. Obviously, this was shared between the Sith, though Exar had something else. He had planned his own design, which had been worked on for forever, and while the star was being destroyed, it was being updated and completed. It was the most perfect vessel he had ever seen. It was a vessel that made the massive Separatist warship that was defeated over Coruscant look small. While the Malevolence was a massive cruiser, Exar wanted a starship that in of itself would make up an entire fleet, one that could rip through anything the Republic threw at it, though he knew it would take time for the Star Forge to pump out a vessel of such magnitude. So instead of focusing on it first, he would have the support fleet created. He knew that the shields on the older vessel was already weak, so there's no need for him to damn himself with a half-completed super ship for the potential arrival of an enemy fleet. Exar had no reason to believe the Republic would track him here, but his ignorance wasn't so overbearing that he wouldn't prepare himself for such an encounter, especially being a Sith. The support fleet would be larger than the previous fleet he had over Lanera. There was also another benefit that the Sith would have. Being that they were using blueprints of the HK units they had used throughout the duration of this war, the new druids would be outfitted with the memory chips possessed by every member of the Sith military. They knew every strategy, every success, every defeat, anything the Sith needed to achieve victory would be obtained before they were built. This too included how Lord Nihilus was able to lure Skywalker into a trap on Thyphera and take advantage of his youthfulness. Exar told the operators to fire up the forge, and the engines began cranking. 
A hole opened up in the side of it, and XR walked over to the viewport on his bridge and looked out at the massive vessel as it was pumping out weapons of mass destruction. He prided himself on these accomplishments. He turned to the Sith and told them that their Sith Empire would be the greatest the galaxy had ever seen. No one would stop them. The reactions from the various Sith were different. While no one could choose which Sith they were assigned to, these Sith had varying degrees of loyalty to Lord Exar. He was a bit of a nuisance to work for, though nothing could be as bad as what it was for Revan, considering the little uprising that was slowly going around the Sith lines in gossip and rumor. These Sith all looked at their Lord and acknowledged him, with the chant that they were forced to say whenever Exar wanted a response. His ego needed it, and so they ripped out a chant in his name and in his honor as he stood there with a twisted grin on his face. He turned back as they continued the chant and watched two more ships come out. As the Star Forge got acquainted with being turned on again, the Forge was able to produce more vessels at a higher volume. The captain of the flagship, as per his orders, from the Sith Lord began to issue out fleet commands to each of the new ships and to a defense line. He knew that if the Republic fleet would come, then they would likely try a strategy that worked against the previous fleet. He hadn't had much success as of late, and the captain had every intention of changing that. The new fleet would also be much larger than anything he ever had to work with and in mere minutes, he was already at the helm of an impressive fleet. As hours crept by, his fleet was triple the size of what he lost on the Nera. The benefit of a fleet like this is he could also sacrifice any ships he needed to. Not that he didn't already do the same thing when the ships were helmed by sentient beings. Regardless, with the fleet finally finished, Exor was able to begin the construction on his Sith Super Destroyer. He was also excited for a ship like this because no one, not even within the ranks of the Sith, would be able to stop it, and Nihilus, would be very ineffective against it, considering every operator on the ship was robotic. There was nothing anyone would be able to do to stop him. It may have been the constant curse for the Sith, the continuous lust for power. Exar, like any Sith in the Sith Empire, wanted power, but his curse, just as it was for the others around him, was how he would throw anyone under a Star Cruiser to get what he wanted. The Star Forge was his means to total victory. His adversaries, of course, were the Republic and the CIS, but nothing was greater of a threat to him than the other Sith. The ones who were constantly around him and had the power to upend his reign as Sith Emperor or Sith Lord, or whatever it is that he liked to refer to himself as. His lust for greater power led him to the weapon that would grant him such powers. All it took was to complete a fleet, and then he could blindside each Sith fleet surrounding him. In all actuality, Revan's little diagnosis of the star map gave Exar two advantages. Firstly, the advantage to build his fleet. Secondly, the ability to ambush each and every Sith Lord who ever dared challenge him or his rule. No matter his mess-ups, they were all calculations to Exar. Because he could not lose, he would not lose. He was the one and only true Sith Lord, and that's all that mattered to him. Exar looked down from his throne as the tip of the Sith Super Destroyer started to peek out of the forge itself. His smile widened. In due time, his super weapon would be complete. The best part about the forge is that every single one of the vessels could be completed and outfitted with the proper crew at the same time, so he never had to worry about taking his time to move droids into the vessels that they would be commanding. It was all going to perfection for Lord Exar. Inside the hangar bay of Coburn's Venator, the Jedi were preparing to get into their vessels so they could exit once they arrived at a hyperspace. Skywalker was simply waiting to go ahead from the Admiral. Commander Cody was in the area. He was talking to Skywalker and Morden about some more unorthodox ideas he had. After all, he figured that one should be able to adapt, and considering Skywalker was so, well, different, he figured he might as well try and meet him where he was. Maybe not on the same level of insanity, but a risk here or there wouldn't be too terrible in Cody's eyes. As they were talking, the fleet dropped out of hyperspace. Anakin got up and walked over to a wall and pressed on the control module, and an image of the frontal perspective of the flagship popped up. Natabri looked at it from over his shoulder as he stepped back and the two Jedi Masters and Cody looked at it with a bit of shock and a lot of worry. This fleet was huge. Anakin turned back and told Cody that they would need those unorthodox ideas right now. Cody looked at the two Jedi Generals and his eyes started over to the droids. The Tybre asked what that was supposed to mean. He kind of shrugged his shoulders. He told them that their astromechs were kind of the best in the fleet. Anakin kind of saw where he was going with this and then asked Cody what the plan of attack was. Cody grinned and walked over to the screen on the wall and pointed to the far starboard side of the flank. He told them that a wing of gunships would be all they needed. It would allow more troops to actively get involved in the battle. He didn't know how many troops their ships manned, but considering that their flagship was the only one here, he couldn't imagine that their fleet was highly manned by troops. 
Anakin asked how he noticed, and Cody's analytical mind went into overdrive. The ships that were produced by the Starforge didn't have the same design as the same ships from Lanera. He wasn't saying that no one was crewing the ships, but he was suggesting that the clones could sneak aboard a couple of their destroyers on the far side of their flank. They could get to the bridge and not only open up a broadside, but they could turn their engines on full blast and evacuate the ships. Anakin didn't love the idea, but if they could do it effectively, which he believed Cody could, then he was all for it. Anakin turned into Tabre, but she had already turned over and whistled to her astromech. R2-D2 and R-483 rolled over. The Jedi told them that they'd be with the commander for the duration of the battle. They whistled at their Jedi, but they had to go. The battle was about to begin. Anakin and Tabre got to their cockpits and hopped in. They asked their Padawans if they were ready, and both Ahsoka and Zala showed relative calmness in their voices, which was just another motivation boost for the generals. Though something took all that motivation away. Skywalker called up to Admiral Coburn and asked for the all clear. The Admiral was genuinely frozen on the bridge. All of his confidence leading up to this moment had been thwarted. How were they supposed to fight this fleet? It typically wasn't a game of numbers, but this was an overbearing force. All the captains along with Admiral Yularn were standing on their decks with the same frozen expressions. Natabre called Coburn's name and got nothing from him. They were looking at the vast fleet of Sith vessels just sitting across the battlefield from them. Anakin asked Natabre what they should do, and she turned her head towards him and threw her arms up. Coburn came back to his mind and told them that they'd be retreating from this battle. They could not do this. Without missing a beat, fire came from Natabre, and she told him that they didn't have time to retreat. If the Sith were capable of constructing this in the time it took for them to get here, imagine how much they could create with extra time. Anakin chimed in behind her and expressed how all they needed to do was hold on until Fisto's fleet arrived at a hyperspace. Coburn snapped back into reality. He looked in front of him. Waves of Sith fighters were abandoning their hangar bays and making their way for the pursuit of Propellic Lions. He called over the communications and ordered every single ship in the fleet to launch. They needed to counter assault. He handed the reins over to the Jedi generals. At the same time, Cody informed him that he began working on the plan he devised. Coburn was a little iffy on the idea. At the moment, the Admiral was considering using the Republic gunships as a means to support the Republic fleet. Anakin and Atabre did a very quick check-in as they got out of the Venators and took a look at the approaching fighters. Coburn had a couple of anti-fighter corvettes at the ready and told the generals that when they were ready, he would deploy them, though he made it clear that they were currently out of range of the Sith fleet. When they moved in, they'd be stuck in battle. The Jedi understood this, and the Tabre called out, asking all the troops to get in formation. Ahsoka and Zala formed up on the exterior flanks to their respective masters, as the V-19s and the other Republic vessels got into formation behind their Jedi generals. Inside the Venators, Cody rounded up a number of men and got them prepared for what they were going to be doing. R2 and R4 were sitting next to him. He gave out his orders and quickly ushered the men into position. Inside of Yolaren's flagship, Rex was doing the exact same thing. Everything was going to plan at the moment, as the troops were gathered up and the Republic fleet launched their gunships and pushed them to the back of their lines, as a means to get them around the side of the flank. The main hope being that the Sith fleet wasn't monitoring for gunships once the fleet battle began, though time would tell once the actual combat started. Coburn lined up all the heavy hitters and then positioned each of the light cruisers behind them to be exactly what they were, support ships. He watched the Sith fleet hold steady and allowed the fighters to get into range. Despite the Y-Wings being bombers, they'd be joining the fighter assault. Every single cannon would be necessary, and considering the Republic Y-Wing was a two-man crewed vessel with a gunner's position, it'd be absolutely necessary if the Republic wanted to achieve victory. The calm before the storm wasn't long-lasting, and the Republic fighters were quickly ushered into combat with the Sith Empire. The droid fighters produced by the Star Forge were effective fighters, but clone pilots were trained to be the best in the galaxy. Clones and Jedi matched up extremely well as they continued to rip apart the Sith fighters as the battle began. It wasn't even at all. Despite the effectiveness of the clones and Jedi, they were incredibly outnumbered. Admiral Coburn knew this, and he had already begun the advancement of the fleet, which allowed the fleet battle to begin. But it also allowed the anti-fighter Republic Corvettes to boost their engines and enter the fray. On the back side of the flank, Waves of LAAT gunships pushed hard to the starboard side of the fleet. Anakin and Natabra were cutting through in tandem, and they, as they were fighting, were able to get different times during the fight to catch a glimpse of their students. It was calming to know that they were handling themselves adequately. With the Republic heavy cannons in range, the battle was in full throttle. The Sith fleet was unwavering. While they were actively firing, their ranks didn't change. The captain of the Sith flagship designed the battle to go this way. The middle of the line was heavily defended. This in turn allowed the flagship to remain defended while also keeping the Starforge 
at a distance from the action. This bulk would allow the Sith to actively defend the super weapon until the Sith Super Destroyer was completed. With the battle continuing to intensify with fighters having to avoid being clipped by turbo lasers, Zala flew her vessel a little too close to the Sith lines. The worst part for her wasn't the consequences of being this close to the Sith fleet. It was what she was able to see from the corner of her eye. She could see a massive hole inching out of the Star Forge, and the sight of it nearly forced her to crash into a Sith cruiser. Thankfully, her astromech was paying more attention. Zala called out over the transmission and told her allies that the Sith forces had a massive cruiser crusher coming out of the weapon. The fear radiated throughout her voice and got the attention of every single member inside the comm chatter. Skywalker told Zala to return to combat. He and Natabre would make their way over to investigate. As the two generals tried to make their way over towards the Star Forge, the Admiral acknowledged the massive energy reading that they were getting. Truthfully, no one had noticed due to the sheer size of the fleet already present in front of them. When they realized what was being constructed, they knew they needed to act quicker. Coburn couldn't panic in the moment. Instead of panicking, he asked where Cody and his troopers were. The clone trooper expressed that they were preparing their boarding procedure. Luckily, as of yet, the far side of the Sith flank hadn't actually picked up the number of smaller vessels moving towards their bow. All their sensors were reading for larger ships and targeting larger ships. Skywalker radioed over to Natabre and told her that perhaps they could go that way and shut down the Star Forge from the inside. If the fleet couldn't get into range, it'd be a security blanket. Natabre expressed that he was reading her mind. Coburn obviously heard this, but he didn't disagree with the notion. The Sith forces were holding a strong defense against the Republic, and in reality, these ships produced by the Star Forge were up to the standard of Venators, or the base ship for the Separatist lines. Without any previous schematics for these vessels, the clones were forced into fighting it out on the go. Skywalker and Morden cut through the Sith lines. Ironically, because the droids hadn't had any experience with combat firsthand, when the Jedi Starfighters passed by them, they opened fire on the ships. Due to their close proximity to each other, the heavy cannons ended up firing into the ships next to them. At the same time, wings of LAATs began entering a line of heavy flak. The vessels that weren't carrying any troops to the landing procedures broke down the middle of the flank. The pilots knew how important this mission was, and their only goal was to defend the troop carriers. This inevitably led to a number of clone pilots getting clipped and shot down by the heavy cannons of the Sith flagships. But this was to be expected. LAATs were much larger than regular fighter craft. Once the LAATs got close to the hangar bays, they were able to begin a landing procedure on three of the ships. The reason they were able to get into three is that they were back to back to back. It was an angle defense, which meant that if a ship fell on the front lines, then they could simply turn on their engines and replace said destroyed ship. Clones exited out of their LAATs and quickly ran through the hallways. Their guns were drawn as Cody and Rex, for the first time in their careers, met up on the battlefront. On one of the ships, Clone Trooper Nell of Rex's division led a collection of troopers forward. On the third ship, Waxer, Boyle, and Lucky were the leaders of that assault. The clones were effective, and the few active droids inside each of these vessels were mostly manning the bridge operations, though there were a few patrols to deal with. As each of the clone units quickly moved through the vessels, they encountered little resistance. Their troops were not regular troops. Exar had planned for sentry-type droids to be installed in each ship. He really liked the Droidica model and decided to replicate it on a larger scale. He wanted the ships to be defendable without needing actual infantry, unless of course said infantry was being transported for a land battle. The clones had to hide away in the hallways as firefights began. Cody and Rex, just as their brothers were doing inside the other ships, held their backs to the walls and began firing over. They tried using droid poppers, but considering they hardly worked against droidicas, the clones had to have the perfect role, which was not possible in such a long hallway. Rex and Cody were at the edge of each hallway and they looked to each other, laying down fire, but seeing the shields not getting destroyed meant the clones had to get creative. Rex called forward one of his men with a rocket and jumped into the hallway blasting forward. The rocket didn't fully damage the droid, it was still firing away at the clones. Cody noticed a hole made in the wall from the explosion and he told the men to cover him as he darted out into the hallway. One of the legs of the battle droid was damaged, so his firing wasn't perfect, simply due to a slight tilt. Cody ran forward into the hall and jumped forward, avoiding a couple blaster shots. He slammed into the ground and climbed to his feet. As he did, Rex opened fire on the droid, giving it another target. The super droid turned his attention towards Rex, clipping him in the pauldron, and he shot back. He was uninjured, but the distraction gave Cody enough time to get up to the droid and drop a droid popper under its shields and duck away. Throughout the ship, the clones had to continue this process. Just outside the ship, the spare LAATs joined the fighter assault using their rockets and blasters to help clear up a path for fighters. The V-19s were doing a solid job, but the Y-Wings were the fragile ship of the group. They were large and slow. With the assistance of the LA-18s, 
and the Republic anti-fighter corvettes, the bombers were able to not just get through the fray and assist the fighter fight, but also able to lay down some heat onto the heavy hitters of the Sith fleet. All the while, the Tabra and Anakin were able to slide past enemy lines, as they made their way towards the hangar bay of the Star Forge. They got a good look at the hull of the Sith Super Destroyer. It was massive, and it would be able to rip through the Republic fleet with no issue. Anakin and Tabre sped into an empty hangar bay on the front side of the Star Forge. With the space battle intensifying around them, they had one mission, shut down the weapon. They escaped their vessels and encountered several of the battle droids stationed to maintain sentry in the hangar. Exar studied these Jedi strategies, and despite how little he expected of the Jedi, he still wanted to be prepared for them if they made a daring move such as this. The heavy droids with shields were allowed to handle, but with a technique of force and lightsaber throw, the two of them were able to make their way out of the hangar bay. In essence, one of them would use all their force power to lob the droid backwards, and then the other one would launch their lightsaber into the droid, destroying it because their shields would be shot down by the force. The two Jedi worked in tandem, as they moved from hangar bay into the hallways and came across a number of individual droids built like HK units. Anakin and Atabra rushed forward. Truthfully, the hallway was their ally. They just used it to their advantage. They moved forward in unison, without missing a beat. Where the other missed a block, the other caught it. The two of them at such a young age worked like masters, slowly getting their way to the droid lines and cutting through them. As they began working their way through the droid forces, they got to a point where they thought they were clear. The hallways dimmed with a red glow, and a voice called over the intercoms of the super weapon. It was the same voice that taunted Skywalker when he saved Zala. The man told Skywalker and Atabre that they would die and their deaths would mark the beginning of the end for the Jedi, for the Republic, and for the galaxy without a rule of Sith. He expressed the joy he would feel in watching their excruciating deaths come at the hands of his troopers. The sound of lightsabers igniting got Anakin and Tabra's attention, as they both looked down opposite ends of the hallways and saw singular Sith at the end of each of them. As the Sith stepped forward, droids rounded the corners from each side, and as they came around the corner, they got together in formation of two by two, similar to what the Jedi had just cut down. The two Jedi turned to each other, their eyes met for a solitary moment, and they both reached out towards the other and grabbed the other's forearm before looking into the other's eyes again. Not a word needed to be said. The sound of marching in the hallway became an echo chamber of terror. The Tabri turned her back first, and Anakin followed suit not more than a moment afterwards, putting his back against hers. They at the same exact time said the word, ready. They moved forward, the warmth of each other's back fading the moment they separated. Skywalker spun his blade around in his hand and looked at the Acolyte preparing to challenge him. The Acolyte grinned under his mask as he ran forward. Skywalker rose to the challenge, keeping a steady pace, allowing the Sith to gain some speed and momentum. Anakin ducked down, avoiding a strike before spinning back and swinging forward. His blade slammed against the Acolytes before pulling back. His heavy parry allowed him to turn back and launch the force at the droids marching down the hallway towards him. He smiled with a devious but cocky grin before swinging forward towards the Acolyte, going as hard and aggressive as he possibly could. Morden, on the other hand, waited for the Acolyte to come to her. She was dainty in her usage of form too, and she allowed the swordsman to engage her. The first two steps she made were backwards, two perfect blocks before she spun forward, her hair moving with a solitary motion behind her as she flipped her blade into a reverse grip. She parried another strike, pushing back. The droids behind her opened fire, and she was caught between an Acolyte and the battle droids. The Tabra reached out and pulled two panels off the wall and slammed him into the ground before blocking a strike that nearly removed her head. Her brows firmed, and she thrusted her blade forward. The echoes of the lightsabers at the end of each hallway made the fighting even more intense. The battle droid Skywalker knocked over, were moving forward again, but he got a hold of the battle versus his Acolyte. He swung under their blade and blasted upwards, throwing the Sith blade into the air. He then shoulder checked the Sith before dragging his blade across the ground, slashing sparks into the Sith's face, blinding him even behind the mask before he ripped through his chest with the blade. Anakin turned towards the droids coming for him and blocked the shots being fired. And the Tabra got into a quick but light engagement with the Sith again. Their blades moved with quickness and precision. She blocked a strike that threw her hand to the side, which she used her other hand to grab the weapon and spin it forward. She was able to get the Acolyte to face the two panels she placed down, using the force to throw the Acolyte backwards, and she ran forward herself, slashing quickly. Her blade landed true against the Sith Acolyte before she raised the two panels and launched them forward. The red lighting in the hallways made everything all the more dramatic, but the two Jedi were able to quickly cut their way through the halls and reunite with each other, so they could continue their push for the control room. Outside the Star Forge, the battle was heating up. The capital ships were really starting to feel the pressure of an elongated battle. The Venators were struggling due to the sheer amount of firepower their shields were taking in. Admiral Coburn tried to get into contact with Cody, but nothing was coming through. He feared for the worst, and then one of his deckhands said that the Sith starboard flank 
had a couple of their ship's engines engaging. Coburn turned back, seeing one of the Venators explode next to him. He asked what the deckhand said, and he repeated it. Coburn turned his attention outwards, and watched three of the capital ships engage their engines and turn hard into the Sith flank. R2, R4, and Mace Windu's droid, R8, who was with the Nalm, had done their jobs. The ship's engines began cooking up and speeding forward. At the same time, the clones quickly evacuated the ships they were in. The LAATs could be seen escaping from the wreckage as the ships they were just in began speeding into the fray. Luckily for the LAATs, most of the fighter fight wasn't on their side of the flank. Though just to ensure the protection, Republic anti-fighter corvettes were sent over to provide cover fire. Admiral Yularen called over and reported the damage to Admiral Coburn, as another deckhand informed him that there were a number of vessels approaching from hyperspace. Coburn's heart sank, and then he heard a voice come over the transmission. General Fisto apologized for being so late to the party, as he informed the Admiral that all he needed were some directions for his fleet, and they would provide the adequate reinforcements needed. This was just to replenish what they needed. With most of the shields damaged on the ships helming the front line, Fisto's large fleet from Kamino would be the perfect assistance to claim victory. Coburn turned back towards the starboard side of the flank, as he watched the three Sith capital ships begin wreaking havoc through their far side of the line. The droid forces didn't know how to counter this. Their programming hadn't prepared them for friendly fire, so their lines were quickly disrupted. Coburn implemented his strategy, and the Republic began their push forward towards the Star Forge. Fisto led a group of fighters from his ships and began to reinforce the Republic side of the fight. Inside the legendary weapon, Anakin and Atabri made their way up to the bridge and started cutting down the droids and crew. They were so ecstatic about their efforts, believing they had shut down the machine. Truthfully, they were both trying to save the weapon from imminent destruction, because if the Republic could use it, then they'd be able to flip the tide of the war. There'd be no worry for the loss of troopers or anything. When the bridge was completely cleared out, the Tabri ran over to the window of the control room and saw a nearly completed Sith Super Destroyer. She called back to Anakin and told him they might want to destroy the control panels. He responded that he didn't believe that destroying them would solve their issue. Anakin suggested they try and shut down the weapon from here. She ran back over and started messing with the panels in the control room. Exar was watching them frolic over the panels with urgency. He of course could monologue over them, but he didn't feel the need to. His weapon was nearly complete, and there was absolutely no reason for him to draw them to his location. As they quickly worked their way through the control room, they found the levers to the station and turned it off, flipping them down. The bridge went silent for a moment, and they quickly ushered themselves to the window. The light was still beaming. Natabri turned to Anakin, and they both knew without saying a word. Somewhere else in the station was operating this weapon. The Republic fleet was inching closer to the weapon too. By this point, the Sith fleet had to actually abandon their post because the Sith Super Destroyer was too large for them to stay in one place. This did assist the Republic in some ways, but in reality, it just made them more vulnerable to a large-scale attack from the Sith forces. With the Sith fleet spreading out, the Republic fleet had to try and quickly counter the Sith forces, but that was simply becoming impossible. They didn't have enough ships to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these forces, despite the success of the fighter assault and the ability of the bombers, the Republic was far too outnumbered to win this battle. Kid Fisto took the helm away from Ahsoka and Zala, who were, not for nothing, frightened in command but holding their own. The two Padawans lined up behind Fisto as they tried to look for a weak spot in the Sith flanks. The clones couldn't pull the same trick they did before, so what could they feasibly do against the Sith forces? Anakin and Natabre had a short panic, but then he remembered, there are always alternatives to fighting. The Sith were doing that. The two Jedi were then able to quickly get themselves up to the location of the throne room and upon their entry, they were faced with the greatest threat of their lives. Exar sat on his throne, with his legs sitting up close to his chest. He smiled and laughed at the Jedi as they entered the room. There were 18 acolytes standing in front of the throne, nine on each side. Anakin and Natabre walked forward, standing side by side. Their unity with each other was now more important than ever before. Exar didn't move. He just told them that despite his hate for the Jedi, they did well. There were true adversaries in the field of combat, and truthfully, they would have made better Sith. He rose up to his feet and told them that he would have offered them a chance to be Sith, but they had already been too impossibly annoying. He was going to win this battle, and this war, and all they had done was simply prolong an experience that he didn't care to elongate. He told his acolytes to slaughter the Jedi. Eighteen lightsabers ignited and they moved forward. Anakin and Natabri backed up. The lightsabers ignited. The face what stood before them. Anakin looked around and thought of what could be done. Exar stepped forward as his accolades closed in slowly. Exar's smile was shaky, like each step his troops made put him one step closer to insanity. The darkness was swelling in the room. Skywalker put his hand up and told Exar that he'd like to challenge him to a duel. The Sith accolades stopped their slow pursuit and turned towards the Sith Lord. This was perhaps the only thing that could be done in the moment. Exar looked at his accolades. 
He knew that if he neglected this fight, he would have at least one traitor, something he didn't care to deal with. His eyes drifted from Skywalker to the viewport. He could see a couple of Republic Venators explode. The battle was coming to an end. While he knew that there was a secondary fleet that arrived, they simply didn't have the time or the numbers to compete with the Sith here. Exar could feel the pressure in the room mounting up on him. The tension between him and the Jedi sat right here. Of course, it would be simple to just have the Jedi executed, but sure, he ignited his lightsaber and told the boy that he would die in a more honorable death than most Jedi. He pointed a lightsaber forward and told Natabra that this fight was between them. She didn't really care for it, but she stepped back. Her eyes drifted around the room, looking for a way to help Anakin in the situation, which is exactly what he was hoping she would do. The Sith all raised their lightsabers to the chest and idly stood. It created a crimson glow similar to what was seen in the hallways earlier when Anakin and Natabra cut through the droid forces and the two acolytes. Anakin held his blade and moved into his form. But instead of his traditional pose, he lowered his shoulders and placed his weapon in front of his face. He was giving the Sith Lord a different look. Exar loved it. For a Jedi to be so different made the thought of gutting Skywalker all the more enjoyable, the death of their order. Exar launched himself forward and Anakin doubled back, going into Obi-Wan's form and protecting himself from the offensive. It was a really awkward transition, and it was clear from the start to Exar that Anakin wasn't fighting in his natural element. He found this to be rather peculiar, but it didn't matter. The Jedi would be killed. Their blades connected again. Anakin was quick on his feet, rather than heavy. This allowed him to present differently than how he did before. Despite everything he had seen from Anakin, this wasn't enough to convince him that Anakin was dainty on his feet. Skywalker took this brief stint using an alternative method to fighting to confuse Exar. He threw his blade forward and then blasted Exar back. The Sith Lord stumbled and then regathered his footing. This only made him angrier, and so he let it feed him. His blade drove forward and Skywalker blocked and parried, spinning his blade behind his back and driving forward. Anakin forced his blade and it gave Exar a quick disadvantage. After all of his failures since Tython, Anakin was dedicated to not losing. He threw himself forward harder and more aggressive than ever before. Exar only played off of it. As a former Jedi, he was able to see Anakin's weakness in the moment and turn it into his own advantage. He stepped back, allowing Skywalker to feel control over the moment. Anakin's ferocity was something that the Sith Lord admired, until he slid under a strike made by Anakin and cut up across his ribs outwards. The blade didn't go deep enough to cut through the bone, but it did hurt. Anakin stumbled over and looked back up. Exar taunted him by gloating over him and looking down at his wounded prey. Anakin didn't like this at all, and he allowed his anger to take the best of him in this moment. He rose to his feet and slashed forward, striking Exar when he didn't expect to be struck. His unbalance caught the attention of each of the acolytes watching. Exar didn't like looking weak, so as Anakin was striking forward, taking every advantage he had and beating Exar fair and square, the Sith Lord deignited his weapon and sidestepped Anakin, igniting the blade and swiping up from the back of Anakin's right hip up across his back, releasing just under the left shoulder of the blade. Anakin cried out in agony as he slammed down to the ground. The Tadri was outraged, but surprisingly, not nearly as outraged as the Sith accolades were. To both the Jedi and the Sith, there were unspoken rules about lightsaber combat, and Exar, after nearly beating Anakin fair and square, gave up his advantage and almost paid for it. The Sith accolades moved forward. The Tadri looked at Anakin as the accolades approached him, but as Exar championed himself, he turned to see his allies moving in. He assumed they were going to kill Skywalker, but their attention wasn't anywhere remotely close to Anakin. He was defeated, they could deal with him later. Natabre caught attention of it and used what she saw earlier to her advantage. She used the force to crush a support beam, and a number of massive objects dropped from the ceiling onto the control panels. The moment the panels obliterated, the entire complex began to shake. As the accolades engaged Exar, they were all collectively thrown from their feet. Natabre looked over. Exar seized the moment and gathered an accolade's lightsaber and ignited his own, cutting through a number of them while they were all downed. Natabre got up and ran to Anakin's side. He grabbed the hold of her wrist and she helped him up. He asked what happened, and they very quickly moved to the edge of the throne room and looked down. When the Star Forge stopped production through force rather than a lack of energy or any other natural stoppage, the forge combusted and the massive ship that was being constructed was blasted out from the center of the forge. They couldn't see the damage done to the forge, but the ship that could be the size of a fleet found some soft cushioning in the fleet that was stationed to protect the Star Forge. Initially, this seemed like nothing but positive, though a number of clone pilots were crushed by the explosion. On the brighter side of the destruction, Republic Fleet, which was in shambles, was able to survive said explosion. Inside the throne room, Anakin and Atabre turned back and looked at Exar. 
He was magnificent with the blade, but no matter how many number of acolytes he killed, they seemed to never stop coming. He moved his weapons quickly, but he was clipped by one of them, before creating through his rage a small surge of a forced storm, and it blasted out from around him, throwing a third of the surviving acolytes from their feet. They continued their assault on him, and they continued going to work, then being cut across the thigh by an acolyte, and then having his forearm completely removed. Exar was in pure suffering. He watched his weapon become destroyed, and now, he was being gutted by grunts. He used all of his strength to try and get himself out of it. The acolytes kept dropping until an emerald lightsaber netted in front of him, and cut down an acolyte about to strike him, before spinning around and thrusting the blade into his stomach. He reeled in pain, before a blue lightsaber netted and blocked his counter-strike. Exar scowled. The Tabre drove her blade further into his body, as he tried to stop the blade from killing him, but she ripped it upwards. Anakin pulled his blade back and decapitated another acolyte before tumbling over him. His injuries were creeping through the pure adrenaline running through his body. Exar had done a fine job. Skywalker tossed Matabre his blade, and she skipped between the three remaining acolytes who threw themselves at her. Anakin watched, waiting for her to pull it off. He believed in her. Matabre's belief in herself was at an all-time high. She spun through the vicious attackers, blocking and elegantly putting on a show of dedication. She clipped an acolyte in the jaw, which dropped them, before she used another acolyte to kill that one, two more remaining one of them already on the ground. She threw her hands up in an X formation to block one of the attackers before spinning back and kicking her foot out to kick the other one back down again. She drove her blades forward, killing the one in front of her. The last one scrambled to his feet and launched himself forward. She reverse gripped her own blade and blocked downwards and used Anakin's blade to slash up. In one moment, the Sith was dropped to the ground. She put the blades away and dropped her knees amongst the carnage. Her breath was shaky. She looked over at Anakin who was smiling at her. He was so proud of her. She grinned at him and got to her feet, quickly getting to his side and helping him up. He felt terrible pain as he got up, but she gave him a couple of back to tablets to take that would at the very least act as a numbing substitute until they could get him back to a capital ship. Admiral Coburn called over the communications and asked if they were alright. Anakin responded to the call, considering he was much heavier than the Tabre and it was a bit of an effort to help lug him back down to the ships. He told the Admiral that they had shut down the weapon. They believed it was too damaged to be operable. Coburn responded telling Skywalker that General Fisto and some medics were being dispatched to the location. They would further investigate the state of the Star Forge. Coburn continued to inform them all that the battle had almost been completely won. For the most part, the Sith fleet was destroyed. With the rout taking place, the Republic fleet was able to obliterate any few ships that hadn't made the jump to hyperspace. Ironically, because Exar planned on using his fleet against his allies, the fleet was already fully programmed to attack any Sith, Republic, and or Separatist fleet they came in contact with so they were pretty much doomed wherever they exited hyperspace from. Anakin and the tiebreak got to the hangar bay, and she set him down gently on a ship, where she sat down next to him. She had him leaning against her, simply due to the injury he sustained. In this moment, the two of them were able to talk to each other. They both were extremely thankful for the other, for having been there for them in that moment. The tiebreak told Anakin that she wasn't quite sure how she felt about his alternative means to fighting, being challenging a Sith Lord, but she expressed that Obi-Wan certainly would have been proud of him, and she was too. The two of them felt closer than ever before. Surviving this encounter was more than any of them could have ever imagined. The odds were stacked against them, but perhaps with a little challenge to the Orthodox, they were able to take those odds and make them favorable for themselves. An LAAT arrived in the hangar bay, and a couple clone medics rushed out and grabbed General Skywalker and ushered him into the LAAT so they could get him medical attention immediately. While the cut in his ribs wasn't terrible, the strike from his hip to his shoulder blade was much worse. Not fully deep, but some of his bones had been scraped and a number of his muscles were damaged by it. When Master Fisto arrived, he came with Commander Cody, who had rerouted the LAAT to the Star Forge once the battle was over. With Cody were a handful of clone engineers who would investigate the status of the weapon. Master Fisto told Natabre that she and Skywalker should be proud of themselves. He walked up to her and told her that no other Jedi had won against two Sith Lords, let alone one. The duo was one of the finer things to come out of this travesty. She smiled and nodded her head. She expressed that without each other, they'd be nothing. Both of them needed the other, and without that other, they'd be incomplete. Fisto just smiled as he asked her to come along with him. On the way to the control room, she asked about the damage from space, and she was informed about the casualties. Six of the Venators from the original fleet had been destroyed. Admiral Yularen's flagship, which still held Master Windu, was very badly damaged, and if it wasn't for her and Anakin, Yularen and Windu would have been killed. Admiral Coburn's efforts were quite remarkable, and Fisto expressed that he would likely become a fleet admiral when everything was said and done. In the control room, they restarted the forge and then went through the schematics of the machine. Fisto was repulsed. He didn't realize that the Star Forge had to eat 
a star to function. In hindsight, maybe the Jedi should have seen it coming. Star and Forge. Yeah, that checks out. Regardless, as it turns out, the Jedi could operate this weapon. The Tabre asked Master Fisto if it would at all be responsible with the Jedi to kill stars and destroy planets full of so much life as a means to power the war effort. Master Fisto looked at her and told her that he truthfully didn't know anymore. But he did know that what the Jedi did with the weapon would be a telltale of what the effects of the war were on the Order itself. Hours later, instead of Admiral Coburn's Venator, Skywalker would be sleeping off some Bacta that he'd been given the numbest pain. He had some time to himself inside the Bacta tank, but now he was lying on a medical bed. As he was lying here, his eyes started open. He could feel something, or maybe it was hear something. A student and Zala had been in and out of the room, but all there was at the moment was Natabre by his side. She was sleeping at the moment. Anakin looked over at her and felt peace wash over him. He lowered himself back down and his eyes felt a looming shadow sitting next to him, and he turned over to see a tall figure with a massive hood over their head. In a flash, he was gone. His hand jolted out and grabbed Natabre's arm, which woke her up in a startle. She looked at him, and all he could do is look towards the doorway and repeat the words that had just been said to him, Come to me, boy. And that, my friends, is Season 2 of The Sith Clone Wars. Special thanks to all of our patrons, all of you for making this series happen. This is one of the most fun series I think I've ever done in my life. I'm having so much fun with this, and I hope you guys are as well. That is the entire purpose of this. I will be honest with you guys, I have an outline, a 10 episode outline for Season 3 already finished. If you guys want to see it, let me know down below. And tomorrow there will be a poll, so make sure you vote on that poll for the continuation of The Sith Clone Wars. Otherwise, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.